Preface of Russian Realities and Problems. Lectures delivered at Cambridge in August 1916. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface These lectures were delivered at Cambridge in August 1916 during the summer meeting arranged by the local examinations and lectures syndicate. The main subject of study at this meeting was Russia and Poland, and out of the many lectures that were then delivered, these have been chosen for publication because each of the speakers is, in his own department, an unsurpassed authority. Paul Milyakov, a scholar and a statesman, was formerly a professor at Sofia University, and has been one of the most prominent figures in the Duma ever since it was called into existence in October 1905 he was leader of the constitutional democrat party he organized and now leads the progressive bloc with equal courage and sagacity no man living knows more of recent political history in russia and few men have had better opportunities of following the tortuous course of balkan politics peter struve is one of the most eminent of russian economists and has written valuable works on prices and labor he is now editor of an important periodical Russian thought, and occupies the chair of political economy in the Polytechnic Institute of Petrograd. He also has had practical experience of politics. He sat formerly in the Duma as member for Petrograd. Alexander Lapodanilevsky, who here gives a general survey of the progress of learning in Russia, is a distinguished historian and a fellow of the Imperial Academy of Sciences, the famous institution founded in 1725 by Peter the Great. The transactions of the Academy contain many important historical monographs from his pen. Roman Dmowski is a Pole and was for some years leader of the Polish party in the Duma. No one represents with more authority and greater ability the view that Poland's hopes for the future are most likely to be realized by coming to terms with the great Slav Empire. Harold Williams, an Englishman who has resided for fifteen years in Russia, is considered by Russian scholars to have no rival, even among natives, in his special department of knowledge, the ethnography of the Russian Empire. Here he has given in a few pages a summary of his comprehensive knowledge of this vast subject. These eminent men made the journey, at great inconvenience to themselves, from Russia to England, on purpose to deliver these lectures. The lectures were given in English, and the speakers entrusted their manuscripts to me for publication. And some of them, modestly distrusting their own skill in writing a foreign language, gave me authority to make such changes in the form of expression as I thought necessary. I trust that none of these distinguished scholars and courteous gentlemen will feel that I have abused this authority. Where I have made changes in the wording, it has been with the sole object of making the writer's meaning clearer to the English reader. J. D. Duff, Trinity College, Cambridge, January 22, 1917. Contents The War and Balkan Politics by P. N. Milyakov. The Representative System in Russia by P. N. Milyakov. Past and Present of Russian Economics by Peter Struve. Poland, Old and New by Roman Dmowski. The Nationalities of Russia by Harold Williams. The Development of Science and Learning in Russia by A. S. Lapodanilevsky. End of Preface. Lecture number one The War and Balkan Politics by P. N. Milyakov. From Russian Realities and Problems. Lectures delivered at Cambridge in August 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ladies and gentlemen, the great struggle we are now carrying on as allies can be looked at, and its meaning explained, from two points of view which are sometimes considered to be entirely different and even opposite to one another. On the one hand, it is a world struggle originating in a clash, foreseen but unavoidable, between the growing imperialism of a newcomer and the existing state of things on the other hand it is a local struggle in the southeast of europe originating in balkan relations from the first point of view this is chiefly a war between germany and england from the second point of view it is a war between austria-hungary and russia 
to keep these two views disconnected as if they had no concern with each other is extremely profitable to our enemies they might choose whatever view they liked while addressing themselves to different members of the entente in order to dissociate them and to sow the seed of suspicion and discontent they would come to you for instance and they would tell you that you are taking a parochial view of armageddon if you allow yourselves to imagine that this is primarily a struggle for the independence of belgium or the future of france we germans they would say are nearer the truth when we regard it as a russo-german war was not indeed the original issue in plain words whether serbia should become an austrian vassal or remain a russian tool why should you fight then for serbia and for russian predominance in the balkans and then the germans would come and say to us well this is in the first place our quarrel with england for a place in the sun did not they invent that wretched encompassment policy in order to encircle us and to cut us off from every foreign market thus blocking the way to the realization of our world policy why should you russians whose dynasty has always been friendly with ours join them and play their game why should you chiefly a continental and asiatic power whose principal interest lies according to us germans in the far east why should you fight for british predominance on the seas well ladies and gentlemen what is the best means to parry and to refute such arguments based chiefly on the idea of the incongruity of interest between the allies is it not to show that the two views on the war which i have just set out are one or rather that they are two different sides of the same view there is something in common between the german world policy directed against great britain and the austrian balkan policy directed against russia and that something is german aggression i do not think that the first part of this assertion i e that the german conflict with england is based on german aggression needs any further proof on my part to-day as the opposite view is defended in this country only by a small misguided minority but i shall proceed to develop the second part of my assertion namely that russian policy in the balkans was to a great extent provoked by the same cause by german aggression because here different views may be taken and in particular i must show you that these two aspects of german aggression the western and the eastern tendency practically start from the same source and have the same origin let me remind you first that both aspects of german aggression which i have just called the western and the eastern can be designated by geographical names the name for german aggression in the west is morocco and the name for the other the eastern arm of the german push is mesopotamia you know that the germans came rather late in their endeavor to secure good colonies what were left unoccupied at that time were second-rate or quite worthless but here on the very outskirts of europe lay two of the best granaries in the world which seemed to be falling from the grasp of their owners with no heir to the succession morocco and mesopotamia in these two words centers the whole story of german diplomacy in the twentieth century i cannot tell you the story of german intrigues at morocco and their failure i can only remind you of the fact that the german bluff for such it was then considered to be in regard to morocco was countered in this country in july nineteen eleven by sir edward gray's declarations to the german ambassador and by the famous speech of mr lloyd george at the mansion house where the chancellor of the exchequer made this plain declaration if a situation were to be forced on us in which peace could only be preserved by the surrender of the great and beneficent position which britain has won by centuries of heroism and achievement by allowing britain to be treated where her interests were vitally affected as if she were of no account in the cabinet of nations then i say emphatically that peace at that price would be a humiliation intolerable for a great country like ours to endure morocco gone mesopotamia remained and while recalling to your mind the story of german attempts to bluff us here i shall be more than once tempted to repeat on behalf of vital interests of russia the utterances of mr lloyd george on behalf of great britain here we come to the balkans the balkans as the only way to mesopotamia the german push to mesopotamia has also got its geographical expression and even two expressions one for austria-hungary from vienna to salonica 
and another for germany from berlin to baghdad this is an old story it is not at all recent but at the beginning it looked inoffensive and it was called economic penetration of asia minor in order to show you just how old that penetration is i will give you a quotation from a famous pamphlet by dr springer published in eighteen eighty six under the very telling title of babylonia the richest land in antiquity and the most paying place for colonization in the present among other things you can read there is the following the east is the only region in the world which is not yet appropriated by any of the expanding nations if germany does not let slip her chance but puts it into her pocket before the cossacks can dip their hands into it she will soon have the best share in the partition of the world as soon as some thousand armed german colonists begin to till the splendid soil the fate of near asia will be in the hands of the emperor this was written in eighteen eighty six i will not detain you by recalling how these ideas were realized i suppose you know all about the friendship of william with the red sultan about the emperor's theatrical journeys in eighteen ninety eight to the tomb of saladin in damascus and to the holy places in jerusalem with all that display of german splendor and with the profession by the emperor that he is the only and the best friend of the sultan the only one who does not think of any partition of turkey and that because he wants her all for himself the emperor the true and faithful protector of the moslem all over the world and then after the emperor came the krupps and vondergolts instructors for the turkish army and concessions for german capital the railway line very short at first from haidar pasha to izmid then just a little further to angora then by a short cut down to the south to kone and finally in eighteen ninety nine from kone to its terminus on the persian gulf this is in a few words the story of the baghdad railway i am not going to dwell on all these developments which i suppose to be known and i pass on to my chief point how did all this expanding policy of germany in the near east affect russia and her policy in the balkans russia as a whole i do not mean single politicians paid simply no attention to it for a very long time and even at the most important moment of that development and economical expansion permitted the germans to divert her attention from the near east to the far east just as you permitted germany to take heligoland from you when she was on the eve of building her huge fleet we were both taken unawares in eighteen seventy eight while prosecuting her traditional policy in the balkans russia liberated bulgaria in harmony with gladstone and in opposition to beaconsfield but what did she gain for herself while doing this we are now informed owing to revelations from the family archives of the austrian statesman count julius andrasi that before going to war russia in the first place by the secret treaty of reichstadt of the twenty sixth of june eighteen seventy six and by secret conventions of the sixth of march eighteen seventy seven handed bosnia and herzegovina over to austria-hungary to be annexed whenever she liked without recourse to arms in the second place russia formally renounced all claims to constantinople and control over the dardanelles and all claims to an exclusive protectorate over the christian nationalities in the balkans thirdly and finally after her victories over the turks victories which cost her hundreds of thousands of lives russia submitted to austria her preliminary draft for the armistice in the beginning of january eighteen seventy eight she conformed her claims to the observations formulated by the emperor francis joseph and she reduced her demands in turkey to which turkey had consented in the preliminary treaty of san stefano i do not mean to say that all this was done without hesitation and protest but such was the leading policy of the then chancellor prince gorchakoff and this course was taken not only in order to comply with the wishes of the european concert but also because it represented the views of our leading statesmen during the reign of alexander ii certainly the feeling of offence at this humiliation was very strong and also of bitter dissatisfaction with austria and germany who had helped in diminishing our advantages secured by war and these feelings were largely spread among the russian masses this compelled russia to change her whole system of foreign policy it was during the reign of alexander three that we approached france and that the basis of the russo-french alliance was laid down 
however our traditional relations toward austria-hungary still remained unchanged in february eighteen ninety seven the emperor francis joseph visited st petersburg and an agreement on balkan affairs was concluded between russia and austria-hungary on the basis of a partition of the balkan peninsula into two spheres of influence the western including control over servia macedonia and albania and the eastern where russia was to control bulgaria and european turkey at that time as you may see we did not at all resent the austrian push to salonica the line of division between the two spheres of influence in the balkans was considered to be traditional and went back as far as the reign of catherine the second and the emperor joseph i can add that this line of division between the two spheres has actually become the traditional view in the balkans serbia was considered accordingly to belong to the austrian sphere of influence there even existed a secret treaty of eighteen eighty one renewed in eighteen eighty nine between austria and king julian according to which serbia was made a tool of austria in her push to salonica austria formally promising her aid in the extension of serbia in the direction of the vardar valley on condition that they were not to extend either to the sanjak of novi bazaar a passage between serbia and montenegro which austria kept to herself according to the treaty of berlin of eighteen seventy eight or to the dalmatian shore on the adriatic still later as recently as nineteen thirteen i personally heard from ferdinand the king of bulgaria the expression of his view that serbia was to remain under austrian sway he even told me that he impressed this opinion upon alexander the serbian heir apparent that was also the reason why russia considered herself unconcerned in macedonia Macedonia was the sphere of the Austrian push, and as late as 1897, Russia agreed with Austria to preserve the status quo in Macedonia, and continued obstinately to defend it down to 1904, in spite of British demands for a serious reform in that wretched country. We can state exactly when the traditional policy of Russia gave place to a new and an opposite line it was at the time when russia had finally altered her international course and had drifted into the channel of the entente with england it was in the years nineteen o seven to nineteen o eight in august nineteen o seven a treaty with england had been concluded on asiatic questions and in may nineteen o eight there was an interview between the tsar and king edward seven these two years nineteen o seven and nineteen o eight represent the period of transition when the russian foreign minister mr izvolsky after having found new friends in england was still unwilling to surrender old friends in austria and so he is found discussing with them to our great disadvantage new schemes conceived under new international conjunctures the possibility of the final downfall of turkey the possibility of the advance of austria-hungary to salonica and of russia on the bosphorus were the subjects of secret discussion on former lines but at the same time new developments took place and two facts in particular must be remembered as outward symptoms of the changing situation first in june nineteen o three a new dynasty appeared in serbia the dynasty of peter karagorjvik which was friendly to russia and then there began a bitter struggle for the emancipation of serbia from the economic bondage of austria a russophile radical party under the leadership of mr pashik took a line which entirely changed the whole situation it was then that austria began to talk about the serbian danger then secondly baron arenthal the austrian foreign minister on the twenty seventh of january nineteen o eight made his famous speech about the new railway line to be constructed through sanjak through the corridor i have mentioned and he particularly emphasized the importance of that railway as a means of direct communication between vienna egypt and india this speech was an open avowal and from that moment the eastern question was reopened in all its historical magnitude and significance under this new light the annexation by austria-hungary of bosnia and herzegovina in nineteen o eight received a meaning quite different from what it was supposed to have in eighteen seventy six at the time of the reichstadt concession it brought about an acute conflict with russia and this diplomatic defeat of russia at the hand of german bluff in nineteen o nine served as an antecedent to the german policy of nineteen fourteen thus 
people who insist upon the fact that there must be a direct connection as cause and effect between these events of nineteen o seven to nineteen o nine and the present war are right i suppose the war might have begun from various causes and on many pretexts on the part of germany but as a matter of fact it began by reason of the eastern question being reopened and we cannot understand the present situation in the balkans unless we discuss the eastern question in full coming to this part of my lecture i find a very good definition of what the eastern question properly is in its european shape in the initial phrase of mr miller's book on the ottoman empire he says the near eastern question may be defined as the problem of filling up the vacuum created by the gradual disappearance of the turkish empire from europe tilling up the vacuum i agree with this definition but with one correction and a very serious one there is no vacuum no emptiness not only in the world of physical things but also in the world of morals as long as there were no moral entities by which i mean no nations conscious of themselves as long as there were no moral entities in the world of the enslaved raya in turkey there was also no vacuum accordingly there was also no dislocation of turkey although symptoms of decrepitude and of coming decay were already present and numerous the process of decomposition developed as the consequence of a new process of national integration as its counterpart or inverse look at this little collection of maps showing different projects for a partition of turkey i took them from the book of mr juvara who counts a hundred of these projects beginning as early as the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries and half of them are earlier than the eighteenth century i e before the beginnings of a real dislocation of turkey compare these maps with the ethnographic map of the balkan peninsula you will see how these early projects for the partition of turkey make a clean slate of its ethnographic composition here for instance father coppin contrives to give something to everybody to france and to england to spain to modena and parma to the pope and to venice and all that on the very small spot of the morea which he divides into six parts next mr cara a girondist executed by the jacobins during the french revolution gives prussia a place on the danube and the black sea others cut to the quick in the living but torpid bodies of nations drawing lines from north to south or from west to east of the balkan peninsula looking at some of the later maps you will see that the vacuum begins to fill up with living matter and will notice how political frontiers of projected local kingdoms begin to coincide with national or religious divisions well this change in political cartography reflects in itself the whole story of the eastern question the real dislocation of the ottoman empire begins with the real growth of the balkan nationalities and fantastic schemes and combinations are soon eliminated by substituting for them real solutions the only trouble which is a new one is to find just where the ethnographic frontiers go populations are mixed claims are uncertain and a new and internal struggle begins between the balkan nationalities themselves their original and lofty aim that of national unification gradually assumes the shape of new aspirations towards an equilibrium of power while ethnographic frontiers begin to serve only as a pretext covering hidden tendencies toward hegemony and domination let us now for a time put aside the far-reaching designs of european conquerors and diplomatists in the balkans let us even forget dynastic intrigues favored or hampered by the reigning families of europe let us review the double and elementary process of turkish decay and of national awakening in the balkans what exactly was the principal cause of the destruction of turkey the answer may be partly found in what has been said already but i want to impress it on you by the aid of an english book which according to my view is undeservedly forgotten and which i wish particularly to recall to your minds at the present time i mean professor edward freeman's book on the ottoman power in europe which was written on the eve of the berlin congress of eighteen seventy eight and met at the time with a rather unfriendly reception it might have been written to-day this is what freeman says the presence of the turk in europe is incidental they remain at the end of five hundred years as much strangers as they were at the beginning 
european ideas and words like nation government law sovereign subject do not apply to them how can they form a nation when the mohammedan part of the population has always been a ruling race and the christian or other non-mohammedan part has always been a subject race the non-musulman subjects of a musulman ruler sink to the condition of a subject people the utmost that the best mohammedan ruler can do is to save his subjects of other religions from actual persecution he cannot save them from degradation he cannot without forsaking the principles of his own religion put them on the same level as mussulmans that is why in turkey there can be no subject and no national government when we call an englishman a british subject we mean that he is a member of the british state but if we call a bulgarian an ottoman subject it means that he is the member of a body which is held in bondage by the body of which the ottoman sultan is the head and he is also subject to all the lesser turks as his daily oppressors as far as the turks themselves are concerned the turkish government is a government i e a system of the administration of the law but their rule over the christian is a rule of mere force and not a rule of law the christian is in strictness out of the pale of the law the utmost that he can do is to purchase the security of his life and property and the exercise of his religion by the payment of tribute that is why among the nations of western europe no one wishes to get rid of the government of his country though he may wish to modify and improve it in many ways but the christian subject of the turkish government does not wish to reform the turkish government he simply wishes to get rid of it altogether he wishes to become a member of a political community of his own nation which shall have nothing to do with the turk that power could not redress their grievances because the existence of that power in itself is the greatest of their grievances the root and cause of all lesser grievances the only solution is the transfer of the power of the turk to other hands i have known turkey for nearly twenty years and i can give you no better explanation of the real causes of her fatal downfall than that given by the famous english historian you will ask me perhaps seeing that the book was written in eighteen seventy eight how it is possible to apply freeman's statements to regenerated turkey the turkey of to-day the turkey of the young turks after their revolution of eighteen o eight well there was one moment when i myself had some doubts and after that a time when i did not wish to play the part of the bird of ill omen but when two years had elapsed after the revolution after this two years test it became clear even to those who knew nothing about the internal state of turkey that the trial had failed i was in constantinople ten days after the revolution of july twenty three nineteen o eight had begun i saw the general enthusiasm of the crowds in the streets i sympathized with the initiators of the national movement i made acquaintance with some of them one week later in salonica day by day i was able to follow their first attempts to formulate their political program it was intended at least as much to liberate turkey from europe as from the old sultan as to their relations with christian nationalities i saw the chasm which existed between their idea of a united ottoman empire whose members should enjoy equal rights and the firm decision of christian subjects to preserve their separate national existence their native habits their inherited traditions based on concessions given some hundreds of years ago by the early conquerors of byzantium no freeman was right complete separation was the only possible solution of the problem i left turkey with the impression that her fate was sealed but who was to profit by the coming destruction of turkey the most natural answer was given already by gladstone it will be in the first place the balkan nations themselves the balkans were to be given to the balkan nations well that was not an anti-russian solution the only thing russia claimed in the balkans in case of the disappearance of turkey was a narrow strip of land all along the straits with a comparatively mixed population but it was beyond doubt an anti-austrian solution because it blocked forever the way to salonica and an anti-german solution because it completely destroyed the scheme of berlin to baghdad 
germany did not fail in the famous speech of the chancellor bettmann hovig before the reichstag in april nineteen thirteen to acknowledge that it was a disadvantage for her that the position in the balance of forces which was occupied hitherto by european turkey began to be filled in part by slav states the chancellor pointed out at this date that such a state of things might bring about a european conflagration which set slaventum against germanentum and thus make it necessary for germany to help austria-hungary not merely within the limits of diplomatic mediation thus foreshadowing the arguments of the german white paper of august nineteen fourteen the chief strength of the anti-german solution was this that it satisfied local interests and stood in perfect harmony with the national aspirations of the awakening christian populations of the balkans looking backwards at the events we may say that all diplomatic designs however far-seeing they seemed at the time have miserably failed in case they were inconsistent with local national needs and that on the contrary small balkan nations steadily growing in consciousness and cohesion have always found their way mostly taking by surprise diplomatic wisdom the two kinds of help they really wanted from the entente were first to let them alone and to ward off austro-germany while they were fighting their common enemy turkey and secondly to suggest and if necessary to impose solutions in very delicate and disputed questions of establishing satisfactory and permanent ethnographic frontiers the entente succeeded in accomplishing the first task and utterly failed in the second the only possible way to defeat turkey by the forces of the balkan nations alone was to arrange a compact amongst them and to lay the foundations of a balkan league while the only chance of austro-germany to win the game was to keep them disunited and to foster internal dissensions and national rivalries in the balkans germs for both were not lacking and the story of the relations between the balkan states is in substance the story of a continuous struggle between these two tendencies of union and discord the idea of a balkan union is not new it was dreamed of by slav idealists and intellectuals over half a century ago it was even tried by the serbian patriot prince michael who as early as eighteen sixty six to sixty eight i e about the time of the unification of italy and germany concluded the same system of treaties which forty-five years later brought about the victory of the balkan peoples over the turk but for a time it did not succeed in may eighteen sixty eight michael fell victim to a conspiracy in which austria had some hand because austria knew how dangerous it was for her to see that union of the small balkan nations accomplished with michael's death serbia lost her chance of becoming what she sought to be the piedmont for all balkan slavs because in the next years another slav state in the balkans was formed by russia this was bulgaria whose national consciousness was being awakened thenceforward there began a growing rivalry between the two related nations bulgaria had won eighteen seventy her own national church the exarchy while serbia remained under the greek patriarch and as the patriarch proclaimed the bulgarians to be schismatics here was the new difference of religion to increase the feeling of national disparity it was then that the struggle for macedonia began and grew ever fiercer before that time the serbians did not claim the macedonian population as their own macedonians called themselves bugari and spoke a bulgarian dialect but Serbian patriots, from the end of 1860, claimed Macedonia as an historical inheritance of the Tsar Dushan, and tried to prove that there were Serbian sounds preserved in Macedonian dialects. The feeling of the Macedonian Slav population was not with them. Macedonian Bulgarians participated in general Bulgarian risings of the 70s, and suffered equally when the Bulgarians were massacred by the Turks and they were included by russia in the liberated bulgaria by the treaty of armistice of san stefano march eighteen seventy eight the undivided bulgaria of san stefano has always remained since then a national ideal 
if lord beaconsfield had not likened at that time to the austrian advice of count andrassy and if this ideal had then been realized there would have been no ulterior struggle between serbia and bulgaria and no attempts on the part of austria to make use of this struggle in order to divert the attention of serbia from the adriatic shore and from dalmatia which is serbian to the valley of the vardar and to salonica the treaty of san stefano i am sorry to say was torn to pieces at berlin july eighteen seventy eight by the help of english statesmen who suspected russia of designs for expansion but this suspicion afterwards proved quite unfounded the wrong horse policy showed here at its worst and thus it finally happened that the bulgarian national ideal based on ethnography is at this moment being realized by germans and by that royal degenerate their king ferdinand meanwhile there was a moment when it seemed that a just and reasonable partition of slav lands owned by the turk was likely in spite of austro-german attempts to sow discord to be attained by the balkan states themselves united in one balkan league the possibility of building such a union appeared again with the change of dynasty in serbia in nineteen o three the younger generation of serbian and bulgarian intellectuals did very much to cool down international irritation and in nineteen o four an attempt was made to conclude a commercial treaty with the further prospect of a customs union and even a treaty for mutual defence unhappily this treaty met with a formal veto on the part of austria still conversations were resumed as early as nineteen o nine and proceeded further in petrograd in nineteen ten without coming to any definite result in regard to macedonia and finally a formula of partition of macedonia was secretly arrived at when the turco-italian war of nineteen eleven made it clear to everybody that turkey's life in europe was soon to end by the serbo-bulgarian treaty of march thirteenth nineteen twelve the limit was finally drawn in macedonia approximately according to the view of mr sviets the best serbian specialist in geography on the lines of serbian ethnographic research this treaty was followed by the greco-bulgarian treaty of may nineteen twelve wherein unhappily no frontiers were established which could settle conflicting claims then when the albanian revolt of nineteen twelve proved finally the weakness of turkey military agreements were concluded on september five nineteen twelve with serbia and on september twenty eighth nineteen twelve with greece on october thirteen the allied balkan states formally demanded turkey's consent to the autonomy of the european vilayets redivided according to nationality and on october seventeen turkey replied by declaring war on bulgaria serbia and greece montenegro having been at war since october nine nobody expected at the time a decisive victory for the allies and thus it was easy for russia england and france to persuade austria-hungary to let the balkan states fight it out by themselves austria confidently expected that the balkan states would be beaten by the turks it was a great disappointment therefore for both austria and germany when in the short space of a few weeks the allies had become masters of the turkish provinces in europe the war for liberation was properly finished at lule borgas on october thirty one for bulgaria at salonica on october twenty seven for greece and at monaster on october twenty eight for serbia if by that time by the end of october or perhaps november a treaty of peace could have been concluded the question of a just ethnographic partition should have been solved but now there began a war for conquest which was to end with the capture of constantinople by bulgaria on march thirteenth nineteen thirteen of yanina by the greeks on february twenty four and of durazzo and scutari on april nine by serbia and montenegro unhappily this war for conquest was also the end of the balkan league encroachments on foreign nationalities did not fail to revive ancient mutual animosities serbia and greece having become masters of macedonia began by very summary means to assimilate the local population bulgaria grew impatient to conclude peace with turkey in order to turn against the allies herself serbia and greece answered by concluding a treaty of alliance on may twenty ninth nineteen thirteen against bulgaria in order to defend their booty 
as the treaty of march thirteenth nineteen twelve provided in case of conflict between the allies for arbitration by the tsar russia made an attempt to convoke the quarrelling allies before her tribunal in petrograd but at the time russian diplomacy made bulgaria understand that she must yield and make some further concessions to serbia this sufficed to make bulgaria resort to the foolish proceeding of trying a solution by force on june twenty nine a sudden attack was made by the bulgarians on the serbians and on the greek army and then a veritable avalanche of misfortune descended upon bulgaria russia let go of romania whose soldiers advanced to sofia england did not stop the turks who recaptured adrianople and passed on to bulgarian territory at the same time the greeks reached the frontier of the kingdom of jumaya while the serbians were besieging vidin after two weeks of unequal struggle bulgaria appealed to europe two weeks later she asked romania to mediate on july thirty negotiations were opened at bucharest and on august ten a hasty peace was concluded which simply mutilated bulgaria and distributed balkan territory among the victors as if no ethnography existed thus the work of the balkan union was utterly spoilt and it was the austro-germans who really won the victory at bucharest at the beginning of nineteen fourteen i wrote in the report of the carnegie commission sent to inquire into the causes and conduct of the balkan wars the treaty of bucharest has sown a new seed of discord in its violation of the sentiment of nationality it divides the balkan territories on the principles on which the treaty of vienna divided national regions in europe in eighteen fifteen this historical example suggests that here too national reaction will follow on the work of diplomatic and political reaction those who won claimed that a balance in the balkans had been secured an end made of pretensions to hegemony and peace thus secured for the future unhappily a nearer examination leads rather to the conclusion that the treaty of bucharest has created a state of things that is far from being durable while writing these lines i was far from foreseeing that this prophecy was to be accomplished during that very year and the next you can see now the bearing of the events of nineteen thirteen and of the mistaken policy of a fictitious equilibrium in the balkans on the events which brought about the present war if the partition of christian populations in the european provinces of turkey had been made according to the treaty of march thirteenth nineteen twelve and in accordance with the actual ethnographic frontiers the balkan league would have been kept in existence and austria-hungary would not have dared would not have even thought of sending her ultimatum to serbia i do not mean to say that in that case there would have been no european war what i mean is that probably there would have been no war in july nineteen fourteen on the pretext of a serbian danger for austria still when this war began not everything was lost in the balkans on september seventeenth nineteen fifteen the diplomatic representatives of the entente powers visited the bulgarian premier mr radovsalov and handed to him identical verbal notes they acknowledged in these notes that bulgarian pretensions to macedonia were just and they gave bulgaria a solemn guarantee that macedonia would be given back to her within the limits of the treaty of march thirteenth nineteen twelve quite independently of what serbia or greece might think of it they even proposed as a guarantee immediately to occupy the promised territories with the italian army if this proposal instead of being made in september had been made in march half a year before i am nearly sure that bulgaria would have sided with us but at that time there was no unity of opinion among the diplomatists of the entente as to the better solution to choose does not this mean that sometimes let us be charitable diplomatists are liable to be out of touch with the existing reality and not quite well acquainted with things they ought to know well ladies and gentlemen things are just now so complicated in the balkans that i do not venture to utter any opinion as to what is to be done immediately in that region we are now in the very process of development of new military operations which in a few weeks perhaps may change the whole situation but what i know and what looms over momentary events so as to be seen afar from a distance is the conspicuous lesson given by the occurrences of the past which i have just recalled to your memory 
nothing short of extermination can change the state of national feeling and the task of diplomatic wisdom is quite plain and simple if it does not permit itself to be guided by feelings of hatred or revenge the settlement in the balkans to be durable must be based on the just national aspirations of the balkan peoples the allies who are led by feelings of justice and freedom will know how to rearrange the conditions of national life in the balkans in order to prevent the recurrence of mutual distrust and that false principle of balance of power which is profitable only to our enemies and to crown our victory which is sure to come with a new reconstruction based on international law and guaranteed by international sanctions end of lecture one lecture number two the representative system in russia by p n milyukov from russian realities and problems lectures delivered at cambridge in august nineteen sixteen this librivox recording is in the public domain the duma is dead long live the duma i wonder whether you know ladies and gentlemen just when this historic phrase was pronounced by the late sir henry campbell bannerman some members of the first russian legislative assembly had just come to london in july nineteen o six as representatives attending the interparliamentary union for arbitration when they learnt that the assembly they represented was dissolved the duma the first russian duma was dead it died while attempting to regenerate the political and social life of russia on a completely new and largely democratic basis autocracy and landed nobility the two chief agencies of historical russia though decaying had proved too strong for the newly born national representation the conflict between the new and the old did not even last long the important work performed by the first duma was done by it in an existence of only seventy-three days then the government in order to have a more subservient chamber used all their power in influencing the elections for the second duma the result was just the opposite of what they expected instead of a strongly constitutional duma with a constitutional democratic majority a socialistic and revolutionary duma was returned with no majority at all for the government if you will look at these figures which show the composition of the first and second duma you will see the difference exactly in the first duma the so-called cadets or constitutional democrats numbered a hundred and eighty seven and in the second duma the representatives of socialism in both its forms of agrarian and urban socialism formed the majority of one hundred and eighty this duma knew its weakness very well and tried to keep clear of any direct conflict with the government but it was useless this chamber too was dissolved after one hundred and three days of existence it was a dramatic struggle that struggle which was carried on by those two dumas and it was observed with keen sympathy and followed with the closest attention by the whole civilized world the duma was dead again but long live the duma the memorable greeting of sir henry campbell bannerman while it acknowledged the crisis through which the young russian representative institutions were passing expressed at the same time the firm belief that the russian constitution could not be destroyed either by the whim of single persons or even by the mistakes of its own political inexperience the duma has lived on but the first the heroic age of its life was really at an end thenceforward the duma was to live in obscurity after a few months of meteoric splendor there followed long years of a very modest existence i should call the second age of the duma's life that of political mimicry the duma with its changed composition tried to adapt itself to its political environment the new majority renounced bold schemes for the general reform of russia and devoted themselves to the rather ungrateful task of self-preservation the duma was still interesting to observe at close quarters but it was much more difficult to admire and indeed was thought negligible as an agent in russian politics i suppose that is why the russian duma since nineteen o seven has been nearly lost sight of by the world i am going to speak to you about this 
the unknown duma of the last ten years which include the action of the third duma from nineteen o seven to nineteen twelve and the fourth duma which was elected in nineteen twelve and will expire in nineteen seventeen i shall try to explain to you just why the russian duma was unable to take a more prominent place in russian political life just what it lacks in order to become a real and strong representative of the people at the same time you will see i hope that in spite of all drawbacks and deficiencies the duma has contrived to make itself an indispensable engine in the national life that it soon struck root in the country and that it retains the vital essence inherent in the very principle of national representation what is the chief difference between the two first and the two second dumas and what is the precise reason of this difference first and foremost it was the change in the electoral law that opened a chasm between these two groups of dumas at the time of the dissolution of the second duma on june sixteenth nineteen o seven an edict was issued contrary to a fundamental law that is to say without the approval of the duma itself which entirely changed the composition of that body the political parties which had built up the majority in the first two dumas were proclaimed illegal on the alleged pretext that their program was to fortify the constitution by revolutionary means the settled composition of the duma was curtailed in parts which were considered to be unreliable thus the number of polish deputies was diminished and the asiatic provinces were deprived of all representation then and this is the chief point the political centre of gravity was transferred from the democratic groups of population to the higher social classes which were believed to be more reliable look at the figures which show the social composition of the duma before and after nineteen o seven these two sets of figures explain everything you see that in the first two dumas the relative majority of forty three per cent was composed of peasants but that fifty one per cent that is to say an absolute majority consisted of the landed gentry in the second two dumas that as i say explains everything before nineteen o seven it was the peasants who were favored by the electoral reform they were supposed to represent the conservative and traditional basis of the national life the gentry were regarded at that time as exponents of modern liberal tendencies owing to their foreign education but when the first and second dumas proved that the peasants were strongly inclined to agrarian revolution the government transferred their confidence to the small but influential group of reactionary landlords who succeeded in organizing themselves under the name of the united nobility i have used an english word gentry but i must point out the difference which exists between the russian gentry and the english our gentry are much more dependent upon the government having been liable in ancient times to military service and having received their lands as recompense after the reforms of peter the great the same class entered the civil service and here too they depended on the government for promotion from grade to grade from chin to chin as we say in russia and hence they are called chinovniks men of the grades now if you consider the social position of the different political parties in the third duma you will see at once which of the parties was thought to be most dependent on the government and therefore most reliable it was that party which contained the largest number of the landed gentry i shall leave out the polish deputies of whom in the third duma eighty-two per cent were nobles the poles whatever their views on social questions belong to the opposition because the government would not yield to them on the matter which chiefly interests them i e the future organization of poland but let me draw your attention to three groups the octoberists named from the manifesto which granted the constitution in october nineteen o five the nationalists and the rights in these three groups the landed nobility form fifty seven forty eight and forty four per cent respectively and these are the groups most favored by the government in the two later dumas we must take a brief survey of their characteristics the octoberists claim to be constitutionalists but the nationalists and particularly the right group 
are unwilling to admit that autocracy has ever been limited by the constitution and their extreme wing even strives for the restoration if necessary by violent means of the autocratic form of government which existed previous to the october manifesto the octoberists are chiefly the party of former bureaucrats and functionaries by their previous avocations they are much better prepared for legislative work and at the same time they are much more subservient to the government whilst both the nationalists and the right group include more democratic elements peasants and priests together with the gentry and are less ready to be led and less prepared to lead in matters of politics after the dissolution of the second duma the cabinet with the late premier stolypin at their head were inclined at first and by way of transition to lean on the octoberists but political agencies behind the cabinet together with the powerful ring of the so-called united nobility would have preferred to join forces immediately and openly with the avowed partisans of autocracy the whole internal policy of russia as well as the internal history of the duma during the last decade reflected the struggle between these two tendencies with the government's aid the octoberists prevailed at the elections to the third duma at which the edict of june sixteenth nineteen o seven was first applied in this chamber the government used its influence much increased by means of the edict on the one hand to paralyze the opposition and on the other to keep up a steady control over the extreme right element the uncompromising revolutionaries of reaction the right and the nationalists did not exist at all as political parties in the country it was only after the elections within the duma itself that they took shape the general result of the elections on the basis of the electoral edict of june sixteen nineteen o seven is shown in this table as you see the result did not quite correspond with the government designs the illegal parties of the opposition were present to the rather significant numbers of a hundred and forty six and one hundred and fifty two this opposition had to sustain various attacks on the part of the right groups particularly during the first year of the chamber nevertheless the opposition succeeded in keeping its head above water then it quickly mastered the situation and soon the octoberist and central group in order to secure a majority found themselves bound to go with the opposition in many cases in committee work in budget questions in international questions in questions of popular education in a number of religious issues and sometimes even on constitutional points the result was that in the second half of the life of the third duma the government turned their backs on the octoberists mr stolypin now tried to approach the nationalists the more conservative group by that time rumors were rife again that a coup d'etat was in preparation the third duma however was permitted to live up to the end undestroyed but at the election for the fourth duma fresh exertions were made by the government in order to defeat the octoberists and it now became their turn to fall into opposition the negative aim of the government was to defeat the octoberists and this task was easy because the octoberists had made themselves exceedingly unpopular in the country by their subservience to the government in the third duma it was far more difficult to attain the positive aim that of electing a nationalist majority the octoberists were defeated but there was nobody to take their place there was no majority in the fourth duma as the nationalists even with government aid did not succeed in getting a majority the opposition reappeared in slightly increased numbers while the octoberists left to themselves and deprived of the element of discipline which they had owed to government protection fell to pieces there were now three different groups the central the left and the right wing with a composition like that the fourth duma seemed unable to live and it would have been dissolved if only its existence had been considered of any consequence at that time but just owing to its entire lack of power the fourth duma was suffered to live and the government only tried to use the opportunity in order again to circumscribe and limit the rights of the chamber here however they met with opposition 
a majority which was not to be found for constructive work was forthcoming in the fourth duma when such matters as the right of interpolation or the right to legislative initiative or even the freedom of parliamentary speech were questioned by the government about two years ago for the first time during the existence of the duma some votes of credit were refused to the government as a means of political resistance and the vote of disapproval was carried by a majority such was the state of the internal struggle when the present war began with this war all internal strife was postponed by the same majority in order to devote themselves to the one task of carrying the external struggle to decisive victory only two months ago you saw here in england representatives of all parties in the fourth duma and they appeared before you as they are now in their own country united by one aim to make national defence as efficient as possible i have given here only a few hints as to the internal story of the last two dumas but they are sufficient to show you two things first how difficult it was for the government to secure a majority to their taste and second just how much the representatives of the nation were handicapped in their endeavours for the regeneration of their country it will help you to a still clearer understanding of the situation if you make yourselves acquainted with the structure of legislative institutions in russia let us begin with the electoral law bismarck is said to have called the prussian electoral system the most wretched in the world i should think that the austrian system before nineteen o five before the granting of universal suffrage was still worse than the prussian and i may say that the russian system is much worse than the austrian the system of russian representation is purely artificial and depends entirely on the government for voting purposes the population is distributed into separate groups called curias the principle accepted in russia is this the more democratic and numerous the group is the more their electoral power is limited there are three curias in the towns and as many in the country the least democratic the moderate and the most democratic thus for the towns these are one wealthy capitalists two the middle class of citizens three the working classes and for the country districts one the large landed proprietors two small landed proprietors three the peasants of the russian communities the vote except in six large cities like petrograd moscow kiev odessa and so on is not recorded by the constituencies themselves but by special electors chosen by the constituencies the number of electors given to the various constituencies varies in opposite proportion to the number of the population thus for instance one-fifth of a million of landed gentry have the right to choose two thousand five hundred and ninety four electors one half million of wealthy citizens choose seven hundred and eighty eight electors eight millions of the middle class choose only five hundred and ninety electors twelve millions of working men choose a hundred and twelve electors seventy million peasants choose one thousand one hundred and sixty eight it works out at one elector for every two hundred and thirty of the landed gentry for every thousand wealthy citizens for every fifteen thousand middle-class citizens for every sixty thousand peasants and for every one hundred and twenty five thousand working men the former austrian system was more liberal as it gave one elector for every sixty four noblemen twenty three wealthy citizens three thousand one hundred and seventy one middle-class citizens and eleven thousand five hundred and fifty five peasants now let us come to the highest electoral unit the provincial electoral assembly where the electors for the duma are chosen there are about fifty of them in russia you see from this plan that in order to become an elector in that assembly one must pass through different stages of election and the more democratic the voter is the more stages have to be passed the peasants choose their electors in the village these electors are sent to the townships in the township they elect to the district the second degree electors who in the district choose the third degree electors who finally go to the provincial assembly and elect members for the duma from the province there are three stages of election for small landed proprietors the preparatory the district and the provincial assemblies but only two for the large landowners who choose their electors in the district to elect deputies in the province 
it is the same for the wealthy class of the capitalists they choose their electors who choose the deputies in their provincial assembly it is the same for the middle class of citizens but for the working men there are again three stages they choose their electors in the factories and these come to the district assemblies where they choose their electors for the provincial assemblies thus six groups of electors meet in the general assembly of the province and they elect members of the duma from their majority which chiefly consists of landlords and capitalists sometimes with the addition of small landowners and middle-class citizens the influential group of large landed proprietors and capitalists before electing members of their own class is obliged to elect one peasant and one workingman member from each province thus neither peasant electors nor workingmen within the assembly have the right to elect separately whom they like best their vote is drowned in that of the majority you can imagine the result the landed proprietors of course elect such peasants as are likely to comply with their interests which gives to the duma the worst representation of the peasant class this explains how it could happen in the third and fourth dumas that the peasants entirely changed their position they had been in the ranks of opposition in the first and the second duma they now sit on the benches of the government parties it is not quite so bad with working men because every representative of the working men is invariably a socialist in russia thus it is quite impossible for the capitalists to elect a non-socialist member russia is the only place in the world i suppose where the bourgeois and the junkers are obliged to elect socialist members i must add first that every citizen who enjoys the right to vote may at any time under this or that particular pretext which are unhappily too many to be enumerated here be struck off the electoral list and secondly that if a majority in a district or provincial assembly is not quite to the taste of the government the local authorities have the right to redistribute the voters and in such a way as to secure artificial majorities if you consider all these things you may wonder how it happens that in spite of all there is still an opposition in the duma and that this opposition even formed one-third of the third and the fourth dumas the answer is first that the six large cities which have the direct vote have always elected opposition members and in the second place owing to the peculiarly democratic composition of the population in the extreme north and in east russia between the volga and the ural mountains the deputies who are elected there always belong to the opposition footnote in that part of russia the landed nobility is mainly non-resident and peasants form the great majority of the population End footnote siberia on the other side of the urals has always belonged to the cadet party and the caucasus has always been represented by socialists on the other hand central russia is represented in the duma mainly by the parties of the landed gentry chiefly by octoberists as to the nationalists the most conservative group they regularly come to the duma from the western frontier and partly from the south where national antagonisms are more keenly felt the deputies representing the russian dominating nationality in these countries form a thin upper social stratum and they always carry on a somewhat bitter struggle with the more ancient and sometimes more cultured members of the polish gentry that is why they bring with them to the duma feelings of religious and racial hatred which unhappily sometimes find expression in the legislation of that body the local peasant population is russian but as we already know the power of their vote is exceedingly limited such as come to the duma invariably share the views of their landlords and sit on the same benches now we come to the rights which the duma possesses the duma has got the power to legislate the power to vote the budget and the power to control the administration full power to legislate does not belong to the russian duma entire branches of legislation and sometimes very important branches are withdrawn from its competence thus the right to legislate in military matters has always been withheld although the duma did very much to improve the state of the russian army and navy a few years before the war the right to legislate in questions of church administration is also a subject of dispute although the duma claims nothing more than what the government has always possessed in matters of religious legislation since the time of peter the great 
further the duma is thwarted by the indiscriminate use of imperial acts and orders in council there is one case in which the law expressly allows emergency legislation this is when the duma is not sitting you can however hardly imagine how much this article eighty seven is misused for matters not at all urgent at times when the presence of the duma is not desired we even had a case of the prorogation of the duma and of the council of empire for three days in order to carry through without the legislative assembly a very important law the curtailment of the control of the duma over the budget is perhaps even more serious it is particularly here that the feeling of distrust toward the young representative body has guided the government in the making of our constitution in the first place all the expenses which were customary before the granting of the constitution in nineteen o five were considered sacrosanct and not to be touched they are specially protected from the hasty influence of budget legislation footnote this is the mock term borrowed from naval terminology armor-plated by the opposition and now in general use End footnote. doubly protected are the expenses for the court and imperial family the yearly interest on the state loans and so on in the budget of nineteen o eight these protected items amounted to one billion one hundred and sixty four million roubles i e they made up forty seven per cent of the whole of the budget expenses if you consider that out of the remaining fifty three per cent the non-protected expenses a large part cannot be exactly determined in advance as they belong to different branches of the state economy and can only be approximately estimated at the beginning of the year you will see how small the financial power of the duma really is but that is not all even if its members should try to use their rights in order to reject some non-protected item of expense such an item as had already figured in the previous year's budget in that case the only result would be that the figure of the previous year's budget would be substituted it is only entirely new and unprecedented expenses which can be struck out of the budget with practical results but the most important thing is that the permission of the duma can be evaded altogether for all expenses necessary for war and also for preparations for war and even in all cases of urgent necessity you can easily guess what happens when circumstances like the present occur in such cases the regular budget does not at all reflect the real state of things also in such important matters as signing commercial treaties giving concessions for the construction of railways determining the details of a foreign loan and the tariffs and so on the duma is not asked to give its help and consent we find the same thing when we come to the third chapter of the duma's rights the control of the administration it is a right which is especially important in russia owing to the habit of lawless and arbitrary action inveterate in russian administration but the representative system is quite incompetent to tackle it according to the law the duma has the right to interpolate and ask questions and the government is bound to return answers within a month but even supposing that an interpolation on current events preserves its interest after a month and still draws the attention of the public which is not often the case and supposing that the answer of the government has proved unsatisfactory what is the result it is no use carrying through the duma sweeping orders of the day expressing strong disapproval perhaps of the whole administration the cabinet is not responsible to the elected chamber the question of ministerial responsibility is i might say the most delicate and the most burning question of the present day in russia for while concerted action is a crying need nothing except an occasional coincidence of opinion is possible under the present system but however much these obstacles hinder the working of the representative system there remains one more obstacle to be mentioned and that is perhaps the most serious of all i mean the composition and working of our upper house the council of empire i know the alternatives proposed in england under similar circumstances although i can hardly call them similar mend it or end it well we cannot possibly end it mend it that sounds all right but the lower house cannot apply this practical remedy in russia because the chief features of the constitution the upper house is included 
are protected by fundamental laws and the initiative in every important change belongs to the monarch what then does this upper house represent i am afraid it is a chamber unique in the world half the members are nominated by the tsar chiefly from former officials i do not wish to be disrespectful many glories of the past are contained in our upper chamber but as our historical life began late and develops quickly one is startled to see under the peaceful roof of the marinsky palace men and names which remind one of political standards long since doomed to oblivion and of political experiments proved inadequate by painful failures too much of the past surviving in the present makes one feel uneasy of course it would be unjust not to mention that there are many excellent legislators amongst the councillors men of profound knowledge and very large experience perfectly acquainted with the technicalities of legislation but there is one circumstance which prevents them from being able to express their mind freely and independently and makes them bow to the average standard of the assembly every nominated member of the upper house can be removed from the house by the simple process of omitting his name from the list published at the beginning of every year the elected half of the members of the council of empire represents by a large majority the class of large landed proprietors the most influential part of the russian nobility the nobility is represented directly by eighteen members as well as indirectly through the representatives of the zemtsvos who number fifty one may add to these sixty-eight members representing the upper social stratum six dignitaries of the church which makes a solid majority of seventy-four out of the whole number of ninety-eight elected members on the side of conservatism there remain twelve representatives of commerce a rather inadequate representation of capital if compared with that of the landed interest and six intellectuals representing the learned order of the academy of science and the universities and these generally form the extreme left wing in the council of empire six members for poland here as well as in the duma take an intermediate position between the two wings the activities of such an upper house are directed as might be imagined not only the duma but even the cabinet even the ministers are often considered too liberal by the council of empire every law which bears as they say the stamp of the thirtieth of october the date of the constitutional manifesto is sure to fall through or to be relegated to the archives of the upper chamber one must not forget that no bills are able to reach the upper house unless they have previously been approved by a majority of the duma you will see for yourselves what are the prospects of constructive and of liberal legislation in russia as on the other hand the existence of the duma does not admit of any reactionary legislation the practical upshot is that all legislation of a constructive character is entirely paralyzed a state of things which cannot but be transitional well that is all now but if you should think that with all these restraints which are intended to hedge round and prevent the free play of our young representative institutions we are driven to something like despair of their future development you would be very much mistaken on the contrary we are very hopeful particularly when we consider how much has been done in the line of constitutional practice and the political development of large masses in the very short space of ten years during which our representative institutions have existed not only have we kept them alive in spite of all attempts of autocratic conspirators to abolish them but we have found a steadily growing support in the country for a system of liberal policy we have seen our political parties even the more conservative and those which had been artificially built up with the aid of the government one by one yielding to the claims of the country the present war did very much to reveal that hidden process and make the result clear to everybody i have told you already that this war has united us in the general aim of victory i must say now that the war has done more than that it has really worked miracles it taught the united fourth duma the best means to obtain their general aim it taught us that in order to be strong the nation must be thoroughly organized in the fourth duma whose composition you know there is now a strong majority three hundred and fifteen members out of the whole number of four hundred and forty for a scheme of constructive policy on a liberal basis 
that is what is known under the name of the progressive bloc this majority moreover has not only talked and discussed it has already begun to act the session of the duma that ended a month ago on the third of july has already enacted by way of parliamentary initiative such measures as the prohibition of alcoholic drink for all time to come this had been introduced by an imperial ukase for wartime but it is now confirmed and extended beyond the war by the law of the duma they have passed another law for the equalization of the rights of the peasants in their committees they have prepared important drafts of laws extending the franchise and the functions of both semstvas and cities and these will come before the whole house at the beginning of the next session i e in the autumn of nineteen sixteen lord robert cecil told you in his inaugural address at this summer meeting that british political conceptions of freedom and justice appealed to russian ideas well i am here to witness that they do appeal to the russian representative assembly i had personally to report to the duma in the last days of its closing session the experience brought back by our parliamentary delegation from great britain two months before particularly as to some national questions and i can tell you that the chamber was very much impressed by what we had to tell and that this impression will be reflected in future legislation my time is up ladies and gentlemen permit me again to quote the words of lord robert cecil it may be truly said that freedom is as much admired in russia as in england yes ladies and gentlemen it may be truly said that we worship freedom we are worthy of freedom we shall have freedom long live the duma end of lecture two lecture number three past and present of russian economics by peter struve from russian realities and problems lectures delivered at cambridge in august nineteen sixteen this librivox recording is in the public domain dedicated to sergei dmitrievich sasanov formerly russian minister of foreign affairs who worked with zeal and wisdom to create the anglo-russian alliance part one the historical foundations of russian economics i must ask your pardon for my bad english but in deciding to accept the very kind invitation of cambridge university to speak before you i was only impelled by the conviction that at a time like this so fateful to the allied countries there lies upon each one of us the obligation to promote to the measure of our feeble powers spiritual intercourse and friendship between our peoples for as was said by one of the most powerful english thinkers the distances of nations are measured not by seas but by ignorances and their divisions determined not by dialects but by enmities looking back on the intellectual history of the university of cambridge and of its members we should not find it difficult to demonstrate how greatly even distant russia is obliged to the work of your cambridge men but personally i feel just now especially urged to recall and to honor with you one name the name of j r seeley that great teacher of historical insight and political wisdom to this regis professor of cambridge university i myself owe very much and that of great importance and this led me a good many years ago to have his expansion of england published in russia and every year i recommend my students at the beginning of their course to read this masterpiece which makes it possible for every thinking man to enter into the spirit of english history and to realize the political genius of the english people now let me pass on to my special subject in the whole field of russian economic history perhaps the most interesting subject of study is the relation between the native and the extraneous elements in the process of economic and social development russia is a connecting link between the western and the eastern worlds this statement of russia's position is vague enough to be incontrovertible but when applied to different historical periods it means very different things in the early days of the russian state the military intruders from scandinavia who are usually looked upon as its founders were never more than a thin layer on the surface of the general population yet the eastern slavonic elements which formed the bulk of that population stood far closer to the western world of culture than to the eastern barbarian periphery of europe 
kiev and novgorod were at that time the uttermost outposts of western culture turned to the east but facing the west and themselves of western make a very characteristic expression of this fact is to be found in the ecclesiastical history of the famous medieval writer adam of bremen who in speaking of the russians of kiev distinguishes them from the barbarians by calling them greeks and describes kiev as amula septri constantinopolitani clarissimum decus Graciae, a rival of the sceptre of constantinople and the brightest ornament of greece the tartar invasion changes all this isolating the russian population from the west and plunging it into another an asiatic world the distance between russia and western europe increases and russia becomes if not a part of asia at least a world by itself this change is curiously reflected in the character of russian historical sources russia becomes a wonderland and travellers who visit it are afterwards able to tell things strange and incredible that strike the imagination travel literature from the time of herberstein in the sixteenth century up to the beginning of the nineteenth bulks far more largely in the sources of russian history than it does in the historiography of other european countries a fact which has called forth many bibliographical and historical studies on the part of russian and foreign scholars it would be a tempting task to distinguish the various elements of russian economic life as they lie before us at the critical moment when russia became a great power and definitely entered the european world on equal terms with other nations it has been contended that the economic evolution of russia before peter the great did not lead to a development of town life in the forms characteristic of medieval europe it has also been said that feudalism never existed in russia these and other statements of the same sort are at once too absolute and too vague now we see clearly enough that russia had some rudiments of the feudal system which in a marked manner embodied the principles of feudalism again the town institutions and the regulation of commerce and industry had in russia before the time of peter the great very conspicuous points of resemblance to the more developed forms of western europe we should obtain rather misleading results if we confined ourselves to contrasting the rude primitive conditions of russia with the complexity prevailing in europe what is really interesting is not the general contrast but the determination and delineation of the far more subtle points of resemblance and dissimilarity but that is not my task in the present lecture i wished merely to allude to this and to emphasize its importance i shall now pass straight on to the period when russia becoming one of the european great powers forced an outlet to the baltic in order to appreciate peter the great's work one must bear in mind that at the beginning of the seventeenth century at the epoch of so-called confusion polish troops inundated large regions of russia and that at this epoch there were plans partly effectuated to submit the region of novgorod to swedish domination and there arose an even more strange project to make russia an english dominion under james i as protector and emperor the documents concerning this project were recently examined scientifically by a learned russian woman madame lubimenko who i should like to remark has made some valuable contributions towards our knowledge of earlier anglo-russian relations from such a political downfall characterized by projects nearly annihilating russia as an independent state what an uprush under peter the great the moment when this occurred is when regarded from the purely economic point of view marked by no fresh departure changes occur only in certain methods and measures of state interference with economic life and the speed of the development of that life is accelerated the economic and political evolution of russia as indeed in no less measure the general cultural development of the land is marked by one original distinguishing trait in order clearly to understand this originality one fundamental all-determining peculiarity of russian history and above all of her economic evolution must be steadily kept in mind russia has never ceased to be a land which continues to colonize and be colonized within its own bounds the word bounds must here be taken in the sense not of political but of geographical or sociological boundaries in this connection the tartar invasion is of little moment 
i have here pointed out the fundamental fact in russian economic history russia is building up her culture not in a confined space already occupied and settled but in a free colonial area which is continually expanding and at the same time is constantly connected territorially with the centre from which it expands when the russian state was being formed the moscow region was such a centre the process we have outlined was in the making of russia as fundamental and as decisive for her destinies as were for great britain the growth of her maritime power and her overseas colonial expansion as was for france the creation of political and cultural unity out of the diverse forms and relations of the middle ages for all other european countries the process of colonization either came to an end long ago or has assumed the form of the foundation of overseas colonies for russia on the other hand colonization is still going on within her own bounds somewhat after the fashion of the german colonizing process between the twelfth and fourteenth centuries which created a great part of present-day germany and destroyed slavonic peoples and slavonic states which have now passed into oblivion but it must here be noted that russia has never destroyed other peoples as the germans for instance destroyed the baltic slavs a brother people to the poles of the present day the making of russia is at once a centripetal and centrifugal process the most fertile provinces or governments of european russia those situated in the south are called new russia for these are regions of steppes of which agricultural colonists took possession only at the close of the eighteenth or at the beginning of the nineteenth century while the russian lancashire is the centre of russia the region adjoining moscow the chief russian coal-fields are situated in new colonial russia moreover the most thickly peopled governments of russia excluding poland bore and still bear the name ukraina this term is now often used in a racial or national sense but the original and literal meaning of the word that which from the present point of view that is to say historically presents most interest is as follows ukraina or okraina i e limits or if one may borrow the old roman expression limes rosicus or polonicus referred to colonial lands which were still in process of settlement colonies and outposts at once of both states russia and poland now these are the most densely populated governments of russia still a few more examples odessa the largest town on the black sea which is twelve hours by express train from kiev the mother of russian towns is far younger than new york saratov the chief commercial centre of the lower volga acquired serious economic importance only in the second half of the eighteenth century the foundation of st petersburg or petrograd as it is now called also really bears a colonial stamp petrograd is not to be compared with other new towns which owed their origin to the wish or to the caprice of enlightened absolute monarchs the artificiality of st petersburg founded in seventeen o three is quite different in kind from the artificiality of shall we say karlsruhe founded in seventeen fifteen quite apart from the impossibility of drawing comparisons in point of size between the duchy of baden and the empire of russia petrograd considered both historically and economically is a town colony on a gigantic scale deliberately set down on the banks of the desolate waters so run the words of pushkin the greatest of russian poets who sang the praises of the mighty founder of the empire st petersburg was built in the midst of war by the methods of war few there are among those who admire this magnificent nevsky prospect who know that this the finest of the central thoroughfares of our capital was laid down by the hands of swedish prisoners of war who in the year of the conclusion of the peace of neustadt which brought to an end the great northern war had every saturday to sweep clean the street they themselves had built at present there is much talk of the artificiality and even of the harmfulness of petrograd not long ago a well-known russian writer wrote a striking article in which he contended that petrograd was fated to disappear from the face of the earth nowadays talk of this kind is but irresponsible chatter and comes either from people who have become absorbed in over-profound thought on the political themes of the past and of the present or from those who have given their fancy too free a rein in the same political sphere of thought 
but at the time of the foundation of petrograd petrograd which was not the result of organic growth but was created by the will of the state and of the monarch it was in very fact a matter of doubt whether the newly created city could continue to exist on the occasion of one of peter the great's festivals there was erected a triumphal arch with two pictures representing respectively st petersburg and its harbour under the one there was the inscription urbs ubi selva fuit the city where a forest was under the other in which neptune was depicted standing before the harbour there appeared the words videt et stupe skit he sees and is amazed it was this that made so acute an observer as Vokarat, the secretary of the Prussian embassy, writing in 1737, twelve years after the death of Peter the Great, express, and not without good reason, doubts as to whether Petrograd would maintain its position. So artificial, in a sense, and so fragile was this creation of Peter's. His doubts were based on solid economic grounds, but now Petrograd is the first commercial and industrial city of the empire, with great and varied industries, and with an immense political, social, and economic past which no power can blot out from Russian life. I have dwelt on the colonial character of Russian economic development. Russian economic culture, being colonial, must needs be extensive. But this is not all. At one time, the economic culture of the United States was very extensive, and it remained so in part up to the present. But the special feature of Russia, as contrasted with the United States in this respect, is the peculiar combination in her extensive colonial culture of the new with the old, of a certain freshness, so to speak, with a certain ancientness. The famous dictum of Goethe, which was originally used by him with reference to the United States, america you are better off than this old continent of ours in the pulsing hours of life you have no inner qualms of useless recollection or vain strife was once applied with great emphasis to russia by the most brilliant russian political thinker of the days of alexander ii alexander herzen nevertheless when applied to russia the words are historically untrue for in the development of russia the middle ages and the modern period are so to speak simultaneously present combining to form a strange amalgam but this statement in its turn needs correction and limitation the middle ages are less complex more featureless and more colorless in russia than in other european countries this combination of the colonial and the ancient which has just been described as the peculiar feature of russian life may be traced through all fields of economic activity as our first example let us take agriculture at the present day it may be taken as firmly established that the typical russian village community with its periodical redistribution of land to secure a fair partition is not an early or primitive institution but a comparatively late adaptation of the peasant group on whose shoulders lay the burden of paying the taxes and performing the labor services exacted by the landowner or the state and if we are to assume that there was some spontaneous element in the life of the village community, the assumption can in general be admitted only for colonial conditions. But however that may be, there are two great facts in Russian economic history which, so to speak, lie side by side. On the one hand, we have the colonial advance of the agricultural population ever seeking to reach free land. On the other, we have the institution of serfdom, the historical meaning of which consisted in part precisely in its binding to the land this mobile, continually escaping population. Russia is, too, the land where serfdom continued to exist after it had disappeared from all other European countries, and this in spite of the existence of free land, to which the agricultural population could escape. Here we have an example of precisely that commixture of old with new which characterizes the whole economic development of Russia. One naturally asks oneself the question, how could serfdom maintain its hold in Russia till 1861? Serfdom, moreover, in the most extreme form known in Europe, in the form of slavery, existing within the confines of a single nation in answering this question there is one fact which must be clearly understood the legal institution of serfdom was an envelope and the actual relations which existed within that envelope were extremely varied 
in particular in so far as the serfs drew the greater or a considerable part of their income from industrial or commercial pursuits serfdom meant for the peasant population chiefly dependence of a financial character the obligation to pay sums of money or taxes to the landowners a peasant in such cases paid the obrak as this money tax was called but beyond that was free to do as he pleased this is why there existed in russia long before the abolition of serfdom a class of persons free to dispose of their labor although socially and in the eyes of the law slaves the peasants without ceasing to be serfs not only built up the elements of a free working class but created from amongst their own ranks the elements of a commercial and industrial bourgeoisie in russia of course there had long existed a class of town merchants and manufacturers but the building up of russian industry of the domestic as well as of the factory type was not the work of this ancient town class the real builders of russian industry were the obrak peasants of northern russia who in spite of the fetters of serfdom were yet full of the spirit of industrial enterprise this fact accounts for the peculiar feature of russian industrial development which is common also to the industrial evolution of england in england as in russia industry is a child not of the town but of the country as a matter of fact the parallel drawn between the two nations is after all not so surprising for england looked upon as an industrial country is as compared with other european nations a young country and one in which industrial evolution has been far less closely connected with town life than in italy germany and france in russia as a country still younger industrially than england this is perhaps even more clearly in evidence even the very foundations of industrial development in the two countries are alike adam smith clearly saw the connection between the development of english industry and the commercial expansion of england in the case of russia in spite of the prevailing system of natural economy the enormous size of the state which readily divides itself into an industrial and an agricultural region has long meant the existence of a very large and growing internal market by supplying the needs of this market russian industry is enabled to grow and to develop if it may be said that the russian textile industry in part to the hardware industry is of country and of peasant origin yet in the history of that industry the state the landowners and the town handicrafts all played a certain and no unimportant part the whole of the eighteenth century is marked by the attempt to create factory or large-scale industry in russia at a blow perhaps nowhere else could one find at that period so many units of the factory type of so large an average size as in russia at a time when the domestic system was still being developed in england large factories were being founded in russia both by the state and by private persons and based on semi-compulsory labor what part is played by this factory industry thus artificially created imposed on russia from above and not built up from below the part it plays is that of a special system of technical training the russian peasants who followed industrial pursuits before creating their own domestic system on the basis of which the true factory system was to develop first of all passed through the school of the large factories which were based on government privileges on the utilization of serf labor and on the industrial skill of other more advanced countries on leaving these factories they took with them to their villages and communicated to the masses of the people a considerable body of technical knowledge and skill the same happens in the case of the town handicrafts in the eighteenth century it was a common practice for landowners to apprentice young serfs to the town handicraftsmen who were then mostly foreigners thus the foreign craftsmen in the towns who had found their way into russia as early as the sixteenth century exercised an influence on russian industrial development in the industrial life of the muscovite state foreigners in general occupied relatively speaking a very prominent position most of the foreigners were however in those days persons in the service of the tsar invited by him to manage his industrial undertakings some of them afterwards left the service of the tsar and themselves founded private industrial establishments finally we occasionally find foreigners who were allowed to enter russia for the special purpose of carrying on some commercial or industrial venture in this last-named group 
the pioneers were the english with their moscow or russian company the notable historical fact that the first private factory in russia was founded by the english is little known in england indeed even in russia the factory in question the rope factory established at volukta and later transferred to kolmogro provides one of the first recorded cases of observations being made regarding the relative productivity of the labor of workers of different nationalities and regarding the relation between wages and labor productivity observations of this very kind have in recent years been generalized into an entire scientific theory thus gray the company's agent reports in fifteen fifty eight that according to his observations the work of five russians corresponds to that of three englishmen but that five russians require less wages than a single englishman footnote this theory is mainly associated with three names one of the great english captain of industry thomas brassey eighteen o five to eighteen seventy two of the well-known german economist luto brentano and three of the american economist jacob schoenhoff author of the economy of high wages eighteen ninety two and footnote look at the map of europe european russia lies between the baltic and the black sea the whole economic history of russia from the beginning of the process which led to the formation of a single russian state is determined by this fundamental geographical factor and in considerable measure consists in the advance of russia towards those two seas the two movements advance to the baltic and advance to the black sea were parallel nor can we say that one of them was more important than the other all that can be said is that the cultural and political importance of the process is more evident in the northern movement than in the advance to the black sea but on the other hand this southern movement is of enormous economic importance the european shores of the black sea consisting of the most fertile provinces of european russia are in the economic sense the genuine creation of the russian people conquered by them from nomads and nature the relation which exists between the part of russia which economically gravitates toward the baltic and that which gravitates towards the black sea may be roughly compared to that existing between the eastern and the western states of the great american commonwealth from the time of catherine the second the russian state clearly conceived and consistently strove to carry into effect the policy of advance towards the south catherine by securing the freedom of navigation in the black sea made black sea trade possible the colonization of the shores of the black sea laid the foundation of the agricultural production of the region the free outlet of agricultural products to the sea being again the necessary consequence of the colonization often when one speaks of the traditional struggle carried on by russia with turkey the conqueror of the byzantine empire it is forgotten that this struggle has been waged in reality not by armies not by the fleet but by the agriculturalist who has turned steppes periodically laid waste by nomadic invaders into an extremely rich agricultural region with a large russian population without any offence to our gallant army we can say that not by her infantry and artillery but by her agricultural colonization followed in the nineteenth century by the industrial development of the colonized area has russia defeated turkey on the black sea and in consequence serbia was freed from the turkish yoke and bulgaria was called to life this is a fact which must be borne in mind by the russian peasant as well as by the russian soldier this fact is a striking confirmation of the deep saying of your ruskin the true history of a nation is not of its wars but of its households the russian peasant in less than a century built up a great russian settlement on the northern pontus whilst centuries of turkish dominion in parts of pontus still more blessed by nature have yielded almost nothing in the shape of economic culture it is a remarkable fact that apparently no one has described with such power and insight the great cultural work which has been done here by the russian people and the russian state as one german writer kohl a traveller and geographer of some merit kohl eighteen o eight to eighteen seventy eight travelled in the ukraine and in new russia in the thirties and forties of last century and afterwards related the results of his personal investigations he tells how in the space of sixty years russia changed a land of scythians and cimmerians the siberia of the greeks and romans to use his apt expression into a temple of ceres 
denomadized and civilized it it is for this reason that the memorable period which ushered in the reign of the emperor alexander i is from the russian point of view notable in the field of foreign relations not only for the struggle with napoleon but also as carrying on catherine the second's policy of russian organic expansion toward the south the ministry of commerce which was then founded first of all directed its attention to new russia to the development of its trade and its general economic life generally speaking this was a period when new economic ideas ideas coming from different sources and widely differing in character penetrated russia and penetrated with great force of impact at this time adam smith's famous work was by imperial command translated into russian and in st petersburg there appeared a french translation of the work of the spanish free trader jovelanos then too under french and american influence the foundations of russian protectionism were being laid and in the same first decade of the nineteenth century along with the translation of adam smith's masterpiece there appeared a russian translation of alexander hamilton's report on manufacturers the manifesto of american protectionism written many decades before the beginning of friedrich liszt's propaganda at this time too there appeared at st petersburg and in german a review with the special object of bringing russia into closer relations with the near east and with the characteristic title constantinopel unsi st petersburg der orient unsi der norden this review written in the tongue of our present foes set before russia very definite political and cultural aims subsequently the armed resistance shown by germany to the realization by russia of these very aims was in no small measure responsible for the present great european war the near eastern question would perhaps have been finally solved at the time of the struggle with napoleon if the russian emperor had not considered it necessary to continue the struggle on foreign soil after the enemy had been driven from the russian territory he had invaded many russians it is well known including the chancellor rumyantsev and the famous soldier kutuzov then considered the emperor's decision a mistake however that may have been the napoleonic period brought forward for solution the same problems with which russia has now once more a full century later been brought face to face through the combined german austrian and turkish attack on us and on our allies and for which a solution is now demanded with all the inexorable force of historical necessity germany allied with turkey decided to throw russia back from the path we have been treading for the past two centuries in the course of which we have settled and called into life a whole enormous region at this solemn moment so critical for russia the position of russia in the struggle which foes have forced upon her is based upon a living historical right that is to say on an historical right which is combined with real strength and living necessity the historical right in question is the great civilizing work chiefly economic in character which has been accomplished by the russian people on the shores of the black sea the real strength is embodied in the enormous russian population which lives in that region and which desires in order to be able to breathe freely to receive into its own hands the keys of its own house this russian population of russian lands which economically gravitates towards the black sea is probably at least twice as great as the combined population of asiatic and of european turkey not in vain did the fathers and forefathers of that population create out of the siberia of the greeks and the romans a new temple of ceres their work it was that won for them the right to breathe freely in their own home part two the economic prospects of the russian empire in my first lecture i endeavored to give an historical account of the colonial character of russian economic life i shall now try to sketch as before in the most general outlines what this colonial character means when considered not historically but from the point of view of the present day every state of any size represents a considerable variety of natural and historical conditions this variety it is which determines the division of a nation into different economic regions the extent however to which such individual regions differ from each other is different in different countries it perhaps reaches its maximum precisely in the case of russia 
here the population while under one government and while the predominance of the russian element in point both of numbers and of culture is overwhelming and i am leaving out of account such regions as poland and finland which constitute entirely separate entities from the cultural point of view the population i say lives on an enormous territory which presents the utmost variety as regards the fundamental conditions which determine economic life forming for customs purposes a single territory with the exception of finland an exception which is really an anomaly to be explained by purely historical reasons simply because at the time of the annexation of finland it was impossible to establish a proper customs control over the long coastline of the new territory and with a population the vast majority of which lives under the same code of civil law russia is yet a complex of territories in different economic conditions and in different stages of economic development it is just this which makes russia at the present moment an empire from the economic point of view no matter what the aims of her state policy may be and quite independently of any imperialism the building up of this enormous state was no matter of chance it is no chance that in that state there should be a single national nucleus to which the hegemony naturally belongs it was the consequence of the fact that only as a politically united whole could the land make progress in all respects and that only a single ethnical element that which formed the moscovite state possessed the political talent required but this political structure a complex of widely different economic regions united in the form of an empire and the predominance of the russian element impose and particularly in the economic sphere an enormous burden of responsibility to whom much is given of him will much be required and much has been given in the first place as regards the more important of the cereals which are used for food by the inhabitants of the temperate zone who belong to european culture russia produces more of these speaking absolutely and not relatively than any other country in the world in respect of maize which is mainly used as fodder russia of course falls short of the united states in respect of potatoes russia again takes second place to germany but in any case russia is responsible for more than one-fifth of the world's total production of wheat rye barley maize and oats russian agriculture being distinctively extensive as opposed to intensive offers possibilities of enormous further development starting from its present enormous absolute dimensions i shall note only three more facts in this connection one russia is the greatest flax producing country in the world two russia is one of the world's greatest producers of sugar beet although her climatic conditions are less favorable for this branch of agriculture than those prevailing in central europe three the forest wealth of russia is undoubtedly greater than that of any other country taking these facts into account even without any exhaustive survey of the agricultural production of russia a survey which i cannot give at present it is evident that russia occupies a very important place amongst nations producing foodstuffs and vegetable raw material standing in this respect generally speaking on a level with the united states and in many cases even in advance of that country there is however one peculiarity of russian economic life which although it is almost certainly of a temporary character is yet extremely important for the present day and for the near future the period in which we live is in one respect a direct contrast to that in which our forefathers lived a hundred years ago in those days under the influence of contemporary facts and of the doctrine which we associate with the name of maltus people dreaded a large population and its rapid increase in the intervening century mankind has found out how to rationalize reproduction on purely individualistic lines and now all are more alarmed by the danger of a stoppage in the growth of population which threatens the most highly civilized part of the world today russia is the only large country where the birth rate has in recent years shown practically no tendency to diminish since too there is abundant room in russia for a diminution in the rate of mortality a very considerable growth of population enters into any estimate of the economic prospects of russia as a very essential factor this is a fundamental fact of our present economic position and in no less measure of our political social and economic future 
we in russia have not yet been gripped by the individualistic rationalism so typical of countries of older economic culture which though in another form was recommended by maltus but which as a real potentiality entered so little into his calculations we are going on multiplying and if we succeed and evidently we are already beginning to succeed in lowering the death rate through the increase in material well-being which accompanies the spread of education the rate of growth of the population of russia ought to continue to show an upward trend for a considerable time to come or in any case not fall below the fairly high level at which it stood in the years immediately preceding the war in russia there are large resources of human energy and we are now well aware that the existence of so large a quantity of energy stored in the form of human beings is not due to some inexorable law of nature but is historically determined by definite psychological factors but we economists also know that the quality of the constituents of a population is of enormous importance to its economic life further there is such a thing in human beings as economically essential quality if i may be permitted to use the phrase if one were to believe certain representations of the russian people which have recently been given currency in england such economic qualities are entirely foreign to that people in these representations the russian people is depicted as a religious anarchist caring nothing for the things of this world as an eastern people of contemplators with no aptitude for the bourgeois life and conduct of western peoples i must say that it is impossible in any way to agree with such hasty generalizations which ignore the actual facts alike of the past and of the present the russian people in its great russian branch the most prominent i think both politically and culturally possesses very decided economic gifts our late great historian kluchevsky showed to my mind in very convincing fashion that the russian state was itself in considerable measure of commercial origin and bears an evident commercial stamp at the very beginning of its history the peasant of northern central russia is one might say a trader and industrialist manufacturer to his fingertips his history and his own nature have made him what he is no one who travels and is in the least observant can help noticing that not only in the baltic provinces but even in finland certain branches of trade namely small retail trade in all kinds of food products are to a considerable extent in the hands of russians who have made their way hither from yaroslav tver and other trading provinces of old russia none the less it cannot be denied that at present the russian is on the average inferior to the western european in respect of economic qualities his labor is less intensive the economic virtues power of constant application thrift and a sharp sense of the distinction between meum and tuum are less developed than among western peoples what is the explanation of this fact the sole explanation which most people are inclined to give is that the national defects in this respect are due to the insufficient spread of education i e of schools and other forms of educational instruction in russia i will not attempt to deny the importance of this circumstance but the cause we are seeking lies deeper and at present our understanding of the historical process goes far enough to enable us to determine the historical causation of the phenomenon in question the qualities which impart to the modern european his special economic strength are the products of a complicated historical process the changes which produced these qualities were somewhat as follows the reformation and the so-called counter-reformation so far as the latter aimed at overcoming the dogmas of the reformers by adopting as its own the strongest points in the reforming movement meant and this constitutes their importance from the point of view of economic history the widespread of certain religious ideas in their direct application to daily life and these ideas took firm hold of the masses of the people now these ideas as applied to morals and manners have to a large extent become detached from their roots in religion have become quite profane if one cares to use the term and have been so to speak secularized by bourgeois morality footnote this has been demonstrated by max weber in his acute and well-known essay on the spirit of capitalism End footnote. 
this has been the case least of all i think with the anglo-saxon race i regard it as a great happiness for great britain that in this country more than in any other country of western europe religion has retained its power over the mind of the nation in russia the church exercised no influence in such a direction and in such a sense the church has in russia played a very important part in the development of russian culture but such work she has hitherto accomplished only to a quite insignificant extent the deeply permeating religious education which serves so to speak as a subconscious primary foundation for economic culture and which has been so important a factor in the economic development of the west in russia this statement would include finland and the baltic provinces poland shared russia's fate in this respect is lacking in the present economic equipment of the peoples of russia you will understand now why it is so important for russia to increase what i have once named the personal fitness that is to improve the form of the average working man which is the foundation of economic efficiency in the whole nation and you will understand too why for the sake of the war it was necessary to prohibit the sale of alcoholic liquors and of what enormous importance that prohibition is for the whole future of a country like russia it means the preservation and the elevation of the chief agent in economic life of man himself once again we find here illustrated that combination of backwardness and ancientness with a certain impulsiveness and freshness to which i referred in my first lecture without the heroic effort that was implied in the full and decisive renunciation of alcoholic liquors which proceeded from the moral will of the whole nation russia could not have overcome her backwardness that low level of the individuals who make up the mass of the nation which is our historical heritage the progressive and collective impulse embodied in the command of the state overcame the backwardness and inertness of a multitude of weak individuals and in this connection i should like to touch on the tremendous revolution in the sphere of agrarian structure which took place in russia after the political revolution of nineteen o four to nineteen o five allow me once again to speak of contemporary life as a historian when in my lectures on economic history i speak to my students of so-called enclosures in england a fact and a process of which you have of course a far better knowledge than i or my students i say to them imagine stolypin's agrarian reform stretching over whole centuries so to speak split up into a great number of separate local measures and carried to a large extent by the initiative and in the interests of the landlord in each particular case and in the same way ladies and gentlemen i would say to you that which in england in the form of enclosures came about in the course of several centuries and which expressed itself in elemental economic processes at times of a cataclysmic character happened in russia or rather is being evolved as an integral reform or revolution systematically carried through from above this revolution moreover was effected within the peasantry without any participation of the landlord and altogether without any bearing on his interests by this process the land of the russian peasants comes into agricultural use under full individual control the sentence i have just spoken is with the exception of the words russian peasants taken nearly literally from the preface to professor goner's well-known book on enclosures in england you understand that this process although in certain cases it may be painful is of enormous positive importance to the whole economic and social development of russia footnote the well-known political aims conservative or even reactionary of stolypin's agrarian reforms matter little in comparison with their significance for the economic and social development of russia End footnote. russia is becoming more and more a country of peasants that is a country of small land tenure which is growing invincibly at the cost of big estates and this agrarian reform creates the conditions for transforming these small holdings from the medieval form of a common or common cultivation into a new form of independent and rounded off individual holdings thus are being laid the economic foundations of that russia which must by its nature be a great peasant democracy based on free cooperation of a multitude of small cultivators working on their own land it is a country of a peasant democracy growing in all respects both in quantity and in quality 
and at the same time it is a whole world in itself i shall simply note a few points russia may calculate on solid grounds that she will be able to produce within her own borders a sufficient quantity of cotton for herself and now she produces nearly all the amount she needs for this purpose irrigation is necessary and the execution of this work is only a question of time russia throughout her territory has an enormous deposit of coal some geologists hold that the kuznetsky coal area in the altai region is the richest coal field in the world and this wealth is as yet almost untouched further if we remember that in siberia and in the urals russia possesses a practically inexhaustible supply of iron ore you will realize what a great economic future awaits her as a whole in speaking of the economic future of russia it should never be forgotten that russia should be taken as a whole that is european and asiatic russia together for instance european russia in the matter of coal supplies stands lower than great britain and germany but it is just in this respect that siberia is an inexhaustible store and that many-sided russian genius of the eighteenth century lomonosov of whom you have heard from my colleague dr labodanilevsky with marvellous sagacity predicted that russian power will receive its plenitude from siberia and the arctic ocean that the expansion of russia would also attain to central asia turkestan our great scholar of the eighteenth century did not anticipate all this means that russia taken economically is an empire which may become self-sufficient within its own borders on the largest scale but this self-sufficiency or avrapkaya does not in the least exclude the most animated exchange with other countries it must be borne in mind that various countries stand at any given moment on various planes of economic evolution and these differences which are historical but daily perpetuated through all changes make it inevitable that various countries should be in need of one another at any moment thus a certain international division of labor has a tendency to strike deep roots and to establish firmly certain special functions even russia has such specialities in the field of industry all countries can manufacture rubber galoshes but in russia an enormous number of people use galoshes and russians are so accustomed to wear them that russia having created a large production of this article has also been able to develop a considerable export of galoshes before the war the only site in the streets of berlin that gave some encouragement to our pride in our national industry was the display in the shop windows of russian galoshes which occupied a place of equal honor with russian caviar a natural specialty of russia but in old industrial countries there must be many more industrial specialties and thus the economic self-sufficiency of russia does not mean her economic isolation from the rest of the world just as such self-sufficiency does not mean isolation for the british empire or for the united states of america russia and england can very well supplement each other and given the requisite energy on the part of the english the importance of russia as a market for english goods may very greatly increase it is twenty-five years ago since i maintained that the economic development of russia is in essence like that of the united states now this is acknowledged clearly enough in russia herself and in other countries with great insight this thought was recently put forward by an american economist who wrote in an economic sense russia and the united states are more alike than any other two great countries of the world underneath their wide differences of language government and religion these two countries show fundamental similarities russia includes the eastern portion of the great plains area of the northern hemisphere america the western portion both have had a history of agricultural pioneering both have great natural resources of fertile land forests and mines which have been drawn upon with the pioneers inevitable prodigality russia and america are the two wings so to speak of the great movement in economic development which originated in western europe a little over a century ago and thence has spread eastward and westward they both borrowed from this center the new technical equipment of machinery and power for production and transportation and adapted it to their similar needs i will summarize russia is a country of immense agricultural forces and possibilities and this place occupied by agriculture in the economic life of russia at the same time secures her industrial development 
the agricultural russia is that steadily growing market on the basis of which russian industry will develop the russian peasant democracy is still in swaddling clothes and its development in the atmosphere of economic independence and political freedom will mean the growth of industrial culture throughout the empire in spite of the many defects inherent in us russians there are in russia no signs at all either of degeneracy or senility all our energies must be directed to one end to the elevation of the masses of the people through the improvement of the personal fitness of the individuals composing these masses this is the task in the execution of which the paths of economics ethics and religion meet and cross for man is the chief agent in the economic life economic fitness can only rest on moral qualities and moral qualities as living energy issue in the long run from the religious consciousness your great thinker once said that it is open to serious question whether among national manufactures that of souls of a good quality may not at least turn out a quite leadingly lucrative one i at any rate am firmly convinced that the production of souls of a good quality is the most lucrative national manufacture and therefore the favorable external conditions under which as i have explained russia lives are from my point of view important above all as conditions of the production of that which ruskin again called human worth terrible are the sufferings and the sacrifices of war but if amidst this horrible bloodshed any consolation is possible it is the faith that sufferings and sacrifices will yet lead to the uplifting of human nature and so will provide a basis for true welfare in every respect in economic life as in everything else End of Lecture 3 Lecture number 4 Poland, Old and New by Roman Domovsky From Russian Realities and Problems Lectures delivered at Cambridge in August 1916 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 the present war has brought into prominence the name of poland and the fact of the existence of the polish nation a fact which during the last two generations had been gradually sinking into oblivion during the period preceding the outbreak of the war the people of this country would occasionally meet with some polish name would read a novel by sienkiewicz the author of quo Vadis, would go with pleasure to Paderewski's concerts and enjoy his interpretation of Chopin's Polish music. To many of them these things did not even suggest the fact that somewhere in a distant part of Europe there existed a national life, a civilization, whose literary and artistic products thus reached them in fragments. They were like fishermen who, having caught a fish close to the surface of the sea, were satisfied with it and did not even ask themselves what sort of life it was beneath the surface that had produced the specimen they caught. In the years just prior to the war, the papers brought them occasional news about a desperate struggle for existence going on in German Poland, about the unheard-of measures employed by the Germans for the purpose of destroying the Polish nationality, about the law to expropriate Polish landed estates, about the Polish children being flogged because they insisted on praying in their mother tongue, and so on. But they knew very little of the nation engaged in the struggle and failed to realize what the contest meant for Europe. It was only after the outbreak of the war, when the Polish problem reappeared and when the idea of reuniting the partitioned Polish territory was put forward in the proclamation issued to the Poles by the Grand Duke High Commander of the Russian Army, that questions began to be asked. What was the Polish problem? What was Poland herself? What her frontiers? What the number and strength of her people? And what the role of this nation in Central Europe? It was not easy to find answers to these questions. Outside Poland itself, literature concerning that country, still pretty rich as late as fifty years ago, particularly in French and English, became in time worse than poor. The few modern books on the subject are very far from being exact, and are accordingly unable to give a true picture of Polish reality. 
the average educated man therefore knew that in the past there existed a great polish kingdom that towards the end of the eighteenth century it disappeared from the map of europe and that later the poles tried to reconquer their independence by means of a series of insurrections but what became of the nation afterwards what was the life it lived and the role it played he did not know the polish problem had apparently become an internal problem of the three empires which possessed polish lands of russia germany and austria and it therefore interested scarcely anybody outside those countries it falls to me to give the first of a number of lectures on poland at this meeting and i therefore consider it my duty to begin by giving some elementary notions concerning the country and its people the territories on which the three empires have faced the polish problem in recent times may be grouped into three categories one the provinces of the ancient polish kingdom where the bulk of the population is of polish stock and speaks polish they stretch from the carpathian mountains to the baltic sea and comprise nearly the whole of the vistula basin as well as the basin of the river varta the odor's chief confluent this territory is divided up between russia kingdom of poland austria western galicia and germany poznania and westusia the total area of these provinces is about seventy five thousand square miles and their population exceeds twenty million its density approaching two hundred and sixty inhabitants per square mile a very dense population when it is remembered that france has only one hundred and ninety per square mile two the provinces to the west and north of poland proper which did not belong to the polish kingdom at the time of its partition but where a large majority of the people are of polish race and speak the polish tongue they belong chiefly to germany upper silesia and the southern part of east prussia and to austria austrian silesia or teschen and they represent an area of about nine thousand square miles with almost three million inhabitants three the provinces to the east of poland proper which belonged to the kingdom of poland but where the bulk of the population is of non-polish origin and speaks either lithuanian or white or little russian on this territory only a small part of which eastern galicia belongs to austria while the chief portion the so-called north and southwestern provinces is in the possession of russia and which represents an area of about two hundred thousand square miles with thirty million inhabitants the poles form only a more or less considerable minority twenty five per cent in eastern galicia and a very small percentage in the easternmost districts belonging to russia but there are no reliable statistics concerning nationalities this vast stretch of territory whose inhabitants are non-polish by race is nevertheless to a certain degree a country with a polish civilization the national religion of poland is the roman catholic only a certain percentage of the nation being protestants of either the calvinist or lutheran confession compact groups of polish protestants are to be found in the southern part of east prussia and in some parts of silesia particularly in teschen austrian silesia where polish protestants initiated the national renaissance in the nineteenth century in the eastern non-polish part of historical poland the lithuanian population is of the roman catholic faith the white and little russian population had belonged to the eastern church since the tenth century in the seventeenth century when the uniat church was established the majority of the white and little russians went over to the roman church but in the nineteenth century the uniots were incorporated into the eastern orthodox church of the russian empire in the economic respect german poland is an agricultural country polish silesia however which possesses the richest coal fields in the european continent is one of the most important mining and industrial districts in the german empire it is the country of the richest coal fields in europe and produces coal to the amount of fifty one million tons per annum those industries are wholly in german hands the poles supplying only the labor throughout the second half of the nineteenth century galicia austrian poland lived exclusively on its agriculture being a country with the densest rural population in europe 
latterly it began to develop industrially notwithstanding the fact that it has a very dense and poor rural population and that the country had to struggle not only against the competition of other parts of the habsburg monarchy but also against the policy of the austrian government which in the past destroyed the country's industry and which even at present hinders its industrial development by means of taxation and differential tariffs on transport industries have the most favorable conditions in the kingdom of poland which has an open market for its industries in russia and in asia this part of poland may be called half agricultural its industry and commerce supplying the half of its revenues polish civilization developed under western influences at first they were those of the roman church then those of medieval germany later those of the italian renaissance fifteenth and sixteenth century in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries there came strong french influences through close intellectual relations with france and the introduction of french institutions by napoleon napoleon's civil code is the law of the kingdom of poland to the present day when compared with the neighboring civilizations viz with that of germany to the west and that of russia to the east polish civilization is prominently distinct in character it had two great and flourishing periods the first was in the sixteenth century at the time of the renaissance and the reformation when poland was one of the most active participants in the intellectual life of europe when she gave copernicus to the world when she produced her own distinct movement of the reformation and when the polish protestants having supplanted latin by the vernacular polish literature reached a high degree of beauty and power this great period was called the golden age its second great period came in the nineteenth century after the partitions when poland in the period of romanticism produced a poetry which ranks with the greatest in history but which is unfortunately little known in the west of europe where only a very few people learn polish in spite of most unfavorable conditions this polish civilization lives and progresses at the present moment and contemporary polish literature and polish art can by no means be classed with the poorest of europe in her political constitution and in her social structure poland developed in the past characteristics quite different from those of other countries some of which were the cause of the decline of the polish state those characteristics must be accounted for by the geographical situation of the country and the part played by it in european history in the tenth century when poland appeared on the historical arena there were two europes the roman and the byzantine the roman church had conquered all the west and centre of europe all the latin and germanic countries some western slavs and even the hungarian kingdom founded by the turanian invaders in the danube valley the byzantine church had spread its teaching all over the balkan peninsula among the greeks and southern slavs and was converting the eastern slavs of russia whose great centre was kiev of all slavs the poles were the most distant from rome as well as from byzantium and therefore the most isolated from the influence of ancient civilization either roman or byzantine this is also the reason why of all slav countries poland was the least known to contemporary chroniclers and why even now we know nothing certain about the origin of the polish state concerning the beginnings of poland we have only legends preserved in polish tradition and transmitted to us by the polish chroniclers of the twelfth century it appears that poland before coming into contact with other european nations and adopting the christian faith in the tenth century had had a long existence perhaps of some two centuries as a small kingdom isolated from the life of contemporary europe both western and eastern at least legendary history gives the names of a long series of rulers of two successive dynasties which reigned prior to the adoption of christianity by the poles in nine sixty five the chroniclers of other countries first mention poland in the tenth century when she is carrying on wars against her neighbors at first against the german empire and its eastern marks and later against the russian rulers of kiev that is against the roman west and the byzantine east this situation between two medieval civilizations determined the whole course of poland's evolution it may be mentioned here that the most recent investigations into the beginnings of polish history show that these wars were preceded by those against the norsemen and especially against the danes 
they represent the first stage of poland's struggle for the baltic hints about them are found in the old norse and icelandic sagas it may be mentioned too that shakespeare was somehow acquainted with the scandinavian tradition of these wars for when describing the vision of the dead king in the first act of hamlet horatio says so frowned he once when in an angry parle he smote the sledded pollocks on the ice this passage has long been the subject of contention but recent investigations show that in the first half of the tenth century the danes were the most dangerous enemies of the little kingdom of poland these wars however end very early in the middle of the tenth century because of the expansion of the german marks toward the east the german empire became the only great danger to poland in the west and her struggles against it represent the chief moments of poland's medieval history it is a great historical truth that nations trying to cope with their enemies submit to the strongest influences of the most dangerous neighbors whom they are obliged to fight and so medieval poland after adopting the roman faith introduced there from bohemia develops pre-eminently under the influence of german civilization and german institutions when she appears in european history poland represents a primitive kingdom under the despotic rule of the piast dynasty she is a country of forests and marshes with large oases of denser agricultural population scattered among the forests the population consists of free husbandmen and slaves above them there is a class of warriors very strong numerically from which the ruler chooses his officials there is no trace of feudalism in the country the only important people in it being the king's officials who gradually accumulate wealth and give origin to a series of great families rich and therefore powerful which however remain legally on an equal footing with the mass of poor warriors this military class was subdivided into clans the members of each clan being bound together by strong ties of solidarity each clan had its name and crest the polish nobility which sprang from this military class and which derived its family names from its landed properties in the fifteenth century had no family crests of which there was only a limited number each of these bore a name which had been the old word of call of the clan in many instances one crest belonged to more than a hundred families the clan system survived in this way throughout the whole of polish history it is evident that the warrior class in poland had quite a different origin and a different legal and social position from that of the feudal nobility of western europe owing to the adoption of the roman faith and the struggle against the german empire which led the rulers of poland to interfere in the affairs of bohemia and hungary poland entered into close communion with the west particularly with the german empire and this resulted in the gradual penetration into the country of western ideas and western institutions thus among others the medieval custom of dividing the country among the sons of the ruler on his death was adopted in the twelfth century it was most disastrous for a kingdom like poland which was surrounded by powerful enemies and which had not yet quite reached its natural frontiers and had not sufficiently strengthened its position on the baltic the slavonic populations on the baltic coast west of the vistula had only recently been incorporated into the polish state while to the east of the vistula a lithuanian tribe of prussians had remained independent and pagans the missionary work carried on among them from poland having proved unsuccessful divided poland was unable to complete the task of conquering the baltic coast and in this way the field was open for the teutonic order the knights of the cross established there a german stronghold which later on became one of the foundations of german prussia and the greatest danger to the independence of poland the election of kings which played so unfortunate a part in the later history of the polish kingdom was also a medieval institution introduced from western europe which in poland attained a stage of extreme development the influence of western ideas and institutions was shown chiefly in the formation of the polish nobility and its political role towards the end of the medieval period the close communion of poland with feudal europe resulted in undermining the despotic rule of the piasts the wealthy magnates began to regard their position as being similar to that of the dukes and barons of the feudal west and they opposed themselves to the power of the princes 
on the other hand the very numerous and mostly poor military class succeeded in securing in poland the position of western knighthood the division of poland was very favorable to these changes for weak princes waging war against each other were obliged to reckon with the powerful lords in their dominions when poland in the fourteenth century was again reunited under the last rulers of the pious dynasty the kings in spite of their despotic tendencies did not attain to the unlimited power of the early piasts they were obliged to consult the great lords in state affairs in the end of the fourteenth century the last piast died childless and the successor to his throne louis d'anjou of hungary wanted to assure the crown of poland to his daughter the law did not admit of succession in the female line and he succeeded in accomplishing his plan at the cost of great concessions to the magnates and of renouncing the most essential attributes of the crown poland then became more similar to the west european feudal monarchy though she lacked a feudal organization of society and though the primitive clan system still survived here lies the chief source of the degeneration of her political institutions the kings in their struggle for power against the magnates could not like the sovereigns of the west look for support to the middle class for that class was very weak in poland they therefore tried to find it in the powerful class of the knighthood or gentry schlachta but between the gentry and the magnates there was only a difference of wealth and culture both belonged directly to the same class of the community both were members of the same clans and the gentry by its social character was destined rather to cooperate with the magnates than to struggle against them and as both those elements occupied the same legal position the power wrested from the king by the magnates became legally an acquisition of the whole of the nobility the rich and advanced as well as the poor and uncultured for a country like poland which had no feudal hierarchy in her social structure the destruction of despotic rule meant gradual transformation into a democratic republic the end of the middle ages when those constitutional changes are taking place in poland is at the same time a great landmark in polish economic history in the fourteenth century when the sea routes to the levant being harassed by the turks became very unsafe trade with asia was carried on in great measure by continental routes leading from western germany through poland to the greek settlements on the northern coast of the black sea in this way poland became a commercial country and the merchants of her cities particularly those of krakow were famous for their wealth with the conquest of constantinople and the black sea by the turks those continental routes were cut and the trade of poland was ruined the cities which had been rapidly gaining political power lost it very soon at the same time the great geographical discoveries then made opened up new sea routes and gave a strong impetus to the commerce of the western seafaring nations this commercial growth and the industrial development of england and flanders produced a rapid increase in the population of the countries of northwestern europe which became a great market for polish grain thus poland having lost her commercial importance gained very favorable conditions for agricultural development the fifteenth century is in poland a period when agriculture and landed property are organized on a large scale till that time she was a country of small husbandry intended only for local consumption with the opening of foreign markets large agricultural units were rapidly formed by means of clearing the forests of internal colonization of the amalgamation of small units and of expansion towards the southeast to the fertile territories of the ancient grand duchy of kiev which had been depopulated in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries by the nomads of the steppes and which under the protection of poland's military power were now again colonized all this work was done by the polish gentry which availing itself of its newly won political power grasped the entire profit made possible by the new conditions of agricultural development they became a class of prosperous large and middle landowners a large portion of that class especially in mazovia where it was most numerous remained poor and sat on small lots of land many being even landless but the majority became wealthy landed nobles economic prosperity strengthened the power of the nobility 
they excluded from the diet the representatives of the cities and reduced the free husbandmen to serfdom with the object of securing labor which they needed very much in the new conditions from this time onwards the whole of polish history is practically the work of the polish landed nobility they made the laws they decreed the wars and they elected the kings the election being limited throughout the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries to the lithuanian house of jagielu and becoming in the second half of the sixteenth century quite free the nobility were free to choose from among foreign princes as well as from among themselves this ancient class of warriors which developed into the landed nobility had many great qualities above all chivalry courage a very severe code of honor and duty toward the country great family virtues and a sense of decency in private life but in the new conditions of prosperity they gradually lost their energy and their aggressiveness lost to a great extent their ability for sacrifice and gradually substituted the cause of individual freedom for that of country in the mass they were very ignorant it is true that after power and wealth had been acquired there appeared a craving for enlightenment in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries western universities particularly those of italy in the period of the renaissance were crowded with young poles who were more numerous there than other foreigners the university of krakow founded in the year fourteen hundred became a great centre of science and intellectual culture not only for poland but also for neighbouring countries this movement which rapidly raised the intellectual level of the ruling class which led to the refinement of manners and which gave birth to the golden period of polish literature in the sixteenth century came to a stop at the end of that century under the influence of new factors in polish life owing to her geographical situation and her social and political conditions poland was obliged to absorb many alien elements the primitive kingdom of the piasts was founded and expanded on a territory inhabited by kindred western slavonic tribes of polish race only on its southeastern border in red russia the piasts had incorporated some eastern slavs into their dominions in the twelfth century during the period of division nearly the whole country was raided by the tartars and to a great extent depopulated a fact which caused the subsequent german immigration into the country the princes encouraged german settlers granted them privileges in the towns and in the country settlements and even gave them the right to be ruled according to german law during that period polish cities were organized on the basis of the magdeburg law and they even enjoyed the right of appeal to the high court at magdeburg after the reunion of poland in the fourteenth century the last king of the pious dynasty casimir the great who gave poland a great code of laws the statute of wislica based upon the principle of one king one law one coinage abolished the right of appeal to magdeburg and created conditions under which the german element was quickly absorbed by the polish community the end of the fourteenth and the beginning of the fifteenth century is the period during which german influence in poland comes to an end and the expansion of germanism towards the east is stopped for centuries by the defeat of the teutonic order at the battle of tannenberg grunwald with the subsequent second treaty of thorn by which the western possessions of the order including the mouth of the vistula and the city of danzig were again incorporated into poland germanism was even pushed back where it remained within the same frontiers till the second half of the eighteenth century till the partitions of poland in the second half of the fourteenth century poland had two powerful and dangerous neighbors the teutonic order which barred her access to the baltic and extended its conquests into polish territories and the grand duchy of lithuania whose rulers of the gedimin dynasty extended their dominion over western russian principalities at a time when great russia was still under the tartar yoke the lithuanians were engaged in a struggle with the teutonic order but they also frequently raided polish possessions and struggled against poland for the acquisition of russian southwestern territories poland was too small to fight both those enemies and in these circumstances the polish lords displayed a great genius for statesmanship they married the heiress to the polish throne hedwig daughter of louis of hungary to the lithuanian prince Jagiello elected him king of poland and in this way realized a personal union between poland and lithuania 
lithuania proper i e the northern part of jagiello's empire which was still pagan was baptized by the poles converted to the roman catholic religion and exposed to the influence of polish civilization at a great meeting of polish and lithuanian nobles an act of brotherhood between the two countries was signed and a solemn oath taken by both parties thenceforth the hereditary grand dukes of lithuania of the house of jagiello were by principle elected to the polish throne up to the reign of sigismund augustus who died childless but during whose reign the union of lublin was concluded fifteen sixty nine whereby the two countries were fused into one state and by virtue of which lithuanian deputies began to be sent to the polish diet by the union with lithuania the polish state was more than doubled in territory and in population that population was polish neither by race nor by civilization in the north of the newly acquired country lived the lithuanians recently converted from paganism and still semi-barbarous the southern and larger part of it was inhabited by west russian slavs white and little russians christians since the end of the tenth century but belonging to the eastern church and to the byzantine civilization the close union with lithuania in the second half of the sixteenth century was bound to lower the general intellectual level of the polish state and after that time poland was a very heterogeneous country in race in language in religion and in civilization the lithuanian nobility which had obtained equal rights with that of poland and whose representatives took their place at the side of the poles in the diet were far inferior in ideas as well as in customs and manners to the polish nobles refined pupils of the italian renaissance polish civilizing influences spread very rapidly over those eastern territories but this success was paid for very dearly by the checking and even the retrogression of intellectual development in poland proper on the other hand the union with lithuania opened a new period in poland's foreign policy the destruction of the teutonic order and the internal disintegration of the german empire gave poland comparative safety in the west but the new frontiers of the state in the east and southeast were very troublesome and a source of frequent wars against muscovy the tartars and the turks in this new period poland has more and more intercourse with the east and eastern influences become strongly felt in the country in the sixteenth century poland was a great european country closely associated with western life and taking a very active part in western intellectual movements among others in the reformation in the seventeenth she gradually withdraws from europe becoming more and more isolated in her life as well as in her institutions in the seventeenth century also there comes into the life of the country a new alien element in a large mass the swedish invasion and the long period of wars caused by it in the heart of the country resulted in a considerable depopulation and opened a field for immigration then a great jewish wave came from germany their settlement in the country was opposed by the middle class which was however very weak and had no influence on the contrary the ruling class of landed nobles favored the new settlers who unlike the polish middle class which had never reconciled itself totally to the new order of things did not struggle against the exclusive rule of the country by the nobility poland had had jews since the middle ages but their numbers were no larger than in other european countries they were polish jews speaking the language of the country but now she became the home of the largest jewish population in the world and the new settlers brought with them and preserved a german dialect called yiddish which they speak to the present time part two such were the factors which contributed to the formation of the old poland of the second half of the seventeenth and the first three-quarters of the eighteenth century of the poland which was going to lose her independence towards the end of the eighteenth century territorially she was one of the largest countries in europe politically she had the most democratic constitution the gentry her ruling class formed eight per cent of the population and represented all degrees of wealth from the great magnates whose properties were like kingdoms down to the small landholders and even the quite landless and poor gentry that gentry was nearly all polish in language and ideas 
for the nobles of lithuania and western russian countries gradually adopted the polish language polish manners and customs the love of polish freedom and of the polish commonwealth the weak middle class was also polish not only in poland proper but also in the eastern territories only in the northwest on the borders of germany the larger towns contained a considerable percentage of germans in the towns side by side with the poles were the jews their numbers increasing from west to east the chief mass of the population the peasants were reduced to serfdom of different races polish in poland proper lithuanian white and little russian in the east in her religion poland was roman catholic in the sixteenth century the reformation had spread powerfully among the nobility throughout the country in the form of calvinism and Socinianism. but towards the end of the century with the reign of sigismund the third of the swedish house of vasa there came a catholic reaction drawing its strength chiefly from lithuania where catholicism was confronted by the eastern faith and was therefore more fervent lithuania proper was also roman catholic having been converted from paganism by the poles the west russian provinces belonged in the beginning to the eastern church but in the seventeenth century the larger part of their population was brought within the fold of the roman church by the brest union by which the uniates accepted the roman dogmas acknowledged the supremacy of the pope and retained only their ritual there developed a struggle between the uniates and the disuniates i e those who remained in the eastern church situated on the borders of the western world and containing countries of both roman and byzantine civilization with the former gradually absorbing the latter poland represented very different stages and types of civilized life while in the west they lived on a more or less european level in the southeast on the fertile plains of ukraine frequently raided by the tartars the poles carried on their pioneer work amidst constant warfare with the nomads a most adventurous wild life and most troublesome types of citizens developed there and there arose great magnates who like kings had their own armies which they employed against the invaders but sometimes also in the intestine troubles of the republic there also in face of constant tartar danger a peculiar military organization of cossacks appeared on the dnieper which growing in strength and independence itself became a great danger to the republic the economic life of the country was very simple its commerce and its middle class having been ruined the country lived almost exclusively on agriculture and on the export of grain through danzig to northwestern europe the community was composed practically of two classes of free nobles and peasant serfs its structure being thus simplified and reduced to a more primitive state national education had at the end of the sixteenth century fallen into the hands of the jesuits and its level had been gradually lowered the mass of the gentry were brought up in ignorance and in very backward ideas the ruin of the cities which are everywhere productive centres of civilization contributed to the general abasement the gentry had preserved many virtues in private and family life but they were not enlightened enough to have the right ideas concerning the needs of the state and the methods of public life in this way the constitution of the country was doomed to degeneration from the sixteenth century till the fall of poland more enlightened minds tried to forward ideas of reform and produced a very rich political literature on the amendment of the republic as well as a long series of active attempts at improvement but all those attempts were powerless against the ignorance of public opinion meantime to the east and the west of poland there arose two great military powers peter the great being a despotic ruler had transformed by force the old muscovy with her growing anarchy into a modern strongly organized bureaucratic and military power on the other side the absolute kings of prussia had organized their state and their army and this army became under frederick the great the first military force in europe because of their absolute rule neither of those powers needed any preparation of public opinion to introduce reforms quite different was it in poland with her liberties and with her democratic rule by the gentry there intended reforms had to be passed by the diet and it was necessary to overcome not only the conservatism of ignorant public opinion and the opposition of powerful magnates who were often led by personal and family ambitions but also the foreign intrigues which worked in the country 
nevertheless after the first partition a strong reform party appeared it began its work by reforming public education in the modern western sense and it gradually formed a majority for the new constitution of the third may seventeen ninety one which gave political rights to the middle class and admitted their representatives into the parliament took the peasants under the protection of the law introduced a hereditary monarchy a modern organization of government and a standing army there was no time for the completion of the great work taking advantage of the french revolution which engaged the western and eastern european powers prussia and russia with the collaboration of austria completed the destruction of the polish state but the reforming movement of the eighteenth century was the beginning of a new poland that lived struggled and progressed after the partitions this movement strengthened the ties between poland and other european nations and laid the foundations of new national life the reformed schools of the second half of the eighteenth century produced a new generation of enlightened men standing in their knowledge and in their ideas on the highest western level those men led poland through the napoleonic era and they ruled her in the duchy of warsaw founded by napoleon and in the kingdom of poland established by the congress of vienna which kingdom in spite of its difficult conditions was one of the best governed and most rapidly progressing countries in europe the first decades of the nineteenth century are a period of the greatest upheaval not only as regards polish political efforts but also in the intellectual life of the nation outside of the kingdom the polish university of vilna the capital of lithuania becomes a great centre of learning and intellectual activity and its pupils open the greatest period of polish literature a period when polish poetry in the era of romanticism reached summits accessible only to the richest literatures of the world after the insurrection of eighteen thirty to thirty one when the constitution of the kingdom of poland was destroyed and polish educational institutions in lithuania were suppressed there appeared new centres of polish thought one abroad among the emigrants chiefly in paris another in german poland in posen the continuity of this intense and independent intellectual life of the nation was never interrupted in the second half of the nineteenth century warsaw became its centre and holds its place till the present time in spite of most unfavourable conditions as the polish university and polish schools were suppressed and public education in russia and by russians was forcibly introduced into the whole country the change in the political situation of austrian poland in the second half of the nineteenth century the introduction there of polish public education with two polish universities in krakow and Lwów, gradually gave the austrian poles a prominent place in the intellectual life of the nation but galicia throughout the whole preceding period of one hundred years was the most backward part of poland and in spite of all her progress in the last fifty years she could not surpass the kingdom and warsaw with all their traditions of the reforming movement of the eighteenth century of the duchy of warsaw and of the half independent kingdom of the congress and with their modern spirit developed chiefly under french influences which were potent in the country throughout the second half of the eighteenth and the first half of the nineteenth century the same elements gave national strength to posen which found itself in a very dangerous situation under prussian rule that part of poland participated in the reforming movement of the eighteenth century as well as in the life of the duchy of warsaw while galicia annexed by austria at the first partition seventeen seventy two stood apart during the period of the greatest activity of polish thought thus it happened that the weakest part of the national body austrian poland lived throughout the last fifty years in conditions most favourable to the progress of national culture which it needed most but on the other hand being the poorest part of poland with the densest agricultural population it found itself in very difficult economic conditions had no chance of industrial development and was exploited by other more advanced countries of the Habsburg monarchy nevertheless the existence of national institutions and polish schools raised the level of intellectual life and strengthened the national spirit galicia has in the most recent times been less and less austrian and polish ideals have dominated the political life of that province more and more 
in the last century the greatest danger threatened the national existence of german poland exposed as this country was to the direct attacks of germanism carried out methodically by the government with the collaboration of the german nation to prussia the destruction of polish nationality in her polish provinces presented itself as a national necessity with polonism strong in posen and royal west prussia provinces annexed at the partition of poland her german territories in east prussia and silesia were partly isolated and exposed to great danger in case poland should recover her national strength and reconquer her independence to ensure retention of those territories prussia is bound to aim at the destruction of polish nationality not only in her own provinces but also in a large part of russian poland that is why the prussian state spared neither efforts nor funds in the work of exterminating the poles and did not hesitate to adopt measures which provoked the indignation of the whole civilized world fortunately for the poles posen was the oldest part of the national body the cradle of the polish kingdom with the polish civilization deeply rooted in the mass of the population with the national character most developed and tenacious they rapidly learned german methods of work and adopted them in defence of their nationality of their ideals and of their mother language as well as in the economic struggle in the defence of polish landed property and in industrial and commercial competition in their economic progress they equalled and in some respects even surpassed the germans of the country in agriculture they reached the level of most of the progressive countries of europe and at the same time they developed a strong middle class and to a great extent polonized the towns where the germans and jews the latter supporting germanism had been very strong in the last decades of the nineteenth century the percentage of germans in their country was considerably reduced to thirty eight per cent as against forty five per cent in eighteen sixty seven while the jews pushed out by polish traders emigrated to germany and have nearly disappeared from the country they now form only one per cent of the population as against seven per cent in eighteen fifteen the energy solidarity and discipline of the poles in the legal and political struggle as well as in economic competition astonished the germans and proved to them that the slavs when properly trained are their equals and in some respects may even prove their superiors the country which under the name of the kingdom of poland was united to russia in eighteen fifteen and which had its own constitution government and army till eighteen thirty one which incorporated afterwards into the russian empire was nevertheless governed by polish officials till eighteen sixty five has since that date been subjected to a system of anti-polish policy in which the russian government imitated prussian methods but the kingdom of poland was a large country with a homogeneous polish population with fresh traditions of its modern and progressive state from eighteen fifteen to eighteen thirty one with its solidly organized social and intellectual life with its french laws napoleon's code and any attempt at the destruction of its national life was doomed to failure in the last fifty years the kingdom found a new source of strength in its industrial progress with the abolition of the customs frontier between the kingdom and the empire in eighteen fifty a large market in the russian empire was opened to that polish country rich in coal and minerals with a fairly dense population composed after the belated peasants reform in eighteen sixty four chiefly of a strong and healthy class of small landowners and of a numerous proletariat representing cheap labor for the industries textile and metallurgic factories grew rapidly and there arose large mining and industrial centers living mostly on their export to the east at the same time warsaw because of its geographical situation on the route from the west to the east and at the crossing of the lines from vienna to petrograd and berlin to moscow at a point where the western narrow gauge ends and the russian broad gauge begins became a commercial city of great importance the polish community which had been exclusively agricultural for centuries was not prepared to profit by the new favorable conditions and the growth of great industries and commerce was in the beginning chiefly the work of the germans and the jews at first the poles supplied only the unskilled and part of the skilled labor gradually however the progress of technical and commercial education enabled them to appear in the field of competition and they began to gain ground rapidly 
in this way the kingdom produced a very numerous and well-to-do middle class recruited from remains of the ancient town populations from the gentry and from the peasantry which to-day is already the foremost social force in the country the nineteenth century brought with it great changes and these resulted in the fundamental social reconstruction of poland in old poland the great mass of the population consisted of peasants who were chiefly serfs and owned no land these the napoleonic era made free later at first in prussia and austria in the first half of the nineteenth century then in russian poland in eighteen sixty five they were endowed with land and became a class of independent small landowners this great peasant reform was not carried out solely to satisfy the social needs of the times in german and russian poland particularly the reformers were inspired by the political purpose of breaking the power of the polish landed nobility which in the eyes of the governments represented the polish national tendencies and which could not be reconciled with foreign rule the ignorant peasant had no national aspirations and it was hoped that satisfied with his economic condition he would prove a loyal subject and might even be employed against other sections of the nation in a sense therefore the reform was carried out in a manner very favourable to the peasants and it produced a strong class of small landowners a class which with the progress of education with the improvement in the methods of land culture and with the internal colonization of the country in all parts of poland during the last decades gradually grew still stronger many large landed properties disappeared having been sold out to peasants in small lots this reform proved most beneficent to the polish nation the healthy industrious and thrifty class of small landowners became the strongest foundation of poland's national existence it manifested its qualities best in german poland where education has made the largest strides where everybody can read and write and where the industrial development of the empire and the protection of agrarian interests by the state produced a most prosperous situation for the agriculturists the small landowners of german poland are a very prosperous class their savings supply the polish banks of the country with money in the cultivation of land they rank with the most progressive farmers in europe at the same time as education among them progressed they became conscious members of the polish nation got inspired with the polish national idea and with polish patriotism they became a well-organized and disciplined army of citizens struggling against aggressive germanism for the cause of poland it may be said that it was the polish peasant who stopped the progress of germanism in the country and frustrated all the efforts of the prussian government to dispossess the poles of their land to buy it out of polish hands through the government's committee of colonization and to settle germans on it the peasants in russian poland developed in the same direction only there the progress was much slower their economic condition is not bad yet it is not as favourable as that of the peasants in german poland russia is a great agricultural country and russian grain competes the more easily with that of the country even on the polish market as it is favoured by special tariffs with respect to the education of the masses on the other hand russian poland is the most backward of all the three parts of the country even to-day nearly half the population of the country is illiterate but in russian poland also it is the rule that with the progress of education the peasant becomes an ardent pole attached to the national cause and ready to struggle in its defence the peasant class of austrian poland found itself in the worst conditions even before the peasant reform galicia had a denser agricultural population than any other part of poland and this reform left the peasants owners of abnormally small lots of land as late as forty years ago galicia's population was also the most ignorant in all poland though it must be said to the credit of the galician land diet that during the last fifty years of the country's autonomy it made the fostering of the education of the masses its chief aim two-thirds of the country's expenditure throughout this period were applied towards the improvement of public education particularly of the primary schools which were polish in the polish and ruthenian in the ruthenian part of the country in this way galicia outdistanced russian poland in the education of the masses as far back as twenty years ago but in spite of considerable progress the unfavourable economic condition of the small landowner in this overpopulated country 
remained a very unhealthy source of political fermentation the peasant reform produced not only a class of small landowners but also a very numerous landless proletariat here lies the reason why the number of emigrants from poland has been so great in recent times emigration in large masses began in german poland in the seventies and was rapidly followed by emigrations from the russian and austrian parts of the country as a result the polish population in the united states today numbers some three and a half millions to which total must be added some hundreds of thousands of poles in southern brazil and other overseas countries the rapid development of german industries attracted a large portion of the emigrants from german poland to the german mines and factories in the west of the empire particularly westphalia where in some localities the polish population today forms a majority recent decades have developed a system of temporary emigration polish peasants go for a time to the states to germany and even to denmark england and france many of them buy land in poland with their savings and become farmers this temporary emigration is financially of great importance especially to austrian poland where the country's budget is made solvent only by the earnings of the emigrants the kingdom of poland alone with its rapidly growing industries was able to absorb a considerable part of its rural proletariat into the mining and industrial centres thus transforming it into an industrial working class this class very strong in numbers but mostly very ignorant and badly organized because of the backward institutions and the bad administration of the country became not only a very important element of the community but also a source productive of trouble in this respect the system of administration introduced by the russian government with its extensive methods adapted to the vast and sparsely populated territories of the russian empire proved most fatal when applied to an industrial country with a very dense population and situated in the centre of europe where it is directly exposed to western influences the condition of the working class in russian poland is certainly the most unhealthy in all europe one of the chief changes in the structure of the polish nation was the rapid growth in the second half of the nineteenth century of a strong middle class in german poland this class developed in the midst of the bitterest struggle against the germans for the control of the local market and it produced a very numerous class of polish tradesmen and small industrials who proved so successful in competition with the germans that they drove many of the latter from the country and again polonized the towns which to a great extent had already been germanized they also organized a very extensive system of polish cooperative banks which an eminent german economist called a state within the state a system which is one of the model organizations of its kind and which is also the chief foundation of the economic independence of the poles in german poland in russian poland the middle class represents all stages of wealth from the great industrials and merchants down to the small traders and craftsmen and includes a very numerous class of people of liberal professions here the polish commercial and industrial class feels cramped particularly because of the herding together in cities with the jews who driven out of russia by anti-jewish laws gather in poland this explains such facts as the commercial boycott of the jews in poland which is partly a manifestation of the economic energy of the polish middle class and partly of the tendency of the whole community to strengthen the polish element in the town populations the jews in poland it must be mentioned here in their mass do not belong to the polish nationality their language is yiddish a german dialect and they are organized as a separate jewish nationality against the poles in these conditions the struggle against the jews is a national struggle it must be firmly stated here that this commercial boycott is carried out without any manifestations of violence on the part of the poles and that everything written about the use of brutal force by the poles is pure invention one of the results of these fundamental social changes is the limitation of the social role heretofore played by the great landowner class in the past the nobility in poland constituted the nation itself it ruled the country without competition on the part of any other class the middle class being small in numbers and wealth and the peasants being serfs 
in the second half of the nineteenth century the area of great landed property was considerably reduced at first by the peasant reform and afterwards gradually reduced still more by the selling out of bigger units in lots to peasants this process of internal colonization progressed rapidly down to the most recent times and it is to be expected that after this war owing to destruction and financial ruin a great part of the large landed properties will disappear and be colonized by peasants thus on the one hand the class of great landowners lost very much of its power and on the other hand new social elements appeared on the arena and developed great strength in this way the polish community lost its old character and became like other european nations part three with regard to the political situations of poland there are three divisions of the country first there is austrian poland which enjoyed until the outbreak of the war some national freedom and had national institutions its schools were polish and so on here the chief struggle was for a position of influence in austria this struggle became more and more intense and the position of the poles in austria became more and more threatened first because of the development of the ukraina nationality in the eastern part of the country whose language is the little russian dialect and then by the alliance of austria with germany the austrian german alliance gave the germans more and more influence on the whole of austrian affairs and the new tendency was to reduce the importance and influence of the poles in the empire in german poland there was a desperate struggle for national existence against the german system which is very well known the polish community here had a position of great strength for instance the banking corporations of german poland had been developed to such perfection that the famous german economist called them a danger to the state the position was strengthened also by some territorial acquisitions of the poles who had acquired parts of the country which did not belong to the poles at the time of the partition but whose population is polish by origin and speaks polish all the force of poland was directed to penetrating that part of the population with polish ideas and to a great extent it has succeeded silesia began to send to the german parliament polish members who belonged to the polish club some fifteen years ago and even in the south of eastern prussia where they were most isolated from polish influence and owing to their religious confession because they are lutheran all their clergy are germans and the work in the schools is done in german even in that country polish ideas gradually developed and so long ago as nineteen hundred in the elections to the german reichstag the polish candidate got six thousand votes against his german opponent who obtained eight thousand in russian poland the struggle was neither for a position in the empire because there was no chance of getting any influential position nor for national existence because the national existence of the poles in poland proper was not threatened by russia it is true that the institutions were russian and the schools were russian but they were unable to russianize the poles the polish culture showed great vitality against the russians the struggle in russian poland was for the progress of national civilization which was stopped by the policy of the russian government before the present war all three parts of poland had their own political struggle but a close analysis of the political situation of the whole of poland revealed to the polish leaders the following facts first that the greatest danger threatening the national existence of the poles came from germany for the german view was that if they wanted to assure for themselves their position on the baltic coast they must destroy not only the poles in german poland but must look to the future destruction of the kingdom of warsaw that means the total destruction of the polish nation and that struggle between poland and germany is a struggle for life and death the germans knew of the renaissance of polish civilization and realized that if poland kept her power to struggle against germany sooner or later they lose their position in the east the second fact realized by the poles is this the german policy is the only policy which considers the polish problem as a whole which has some logical solution of the polish problem neither russia nor austria has such a system but the germans have and german statesmen have already realized that their polish problem is not limited to the frontiers of the german empire 
their chancellor in one of his speeches in german poland said we are struggling not only with our poles in german poland but with the whole polish nation the third fact realized by the poles is that germany to a certain extent controls the polish policy of the other two empires the german tendency in austria has the effect of reducing the polish influence in austria in russia german influence works strongly in the anti-polish direction germany seeks to destroy polish nationality she knows that it would not be sufficient to annex a large part of poland because that would only strengthen the position of the poles in germany it is much more convenient to keep them as they are and gradually to destroy them to assure that on neither side of the frontier shall polish civilization flourish so she employs every possible influence in russia to destroy any policy which supports polish progress i may remind you that when the polish members in the second duma brought forward a bill for the introduction of polish teaching in the schools of the kingdom of poland all the organs of the german semi-official press published articles in which they said quite openly that polish teaching introduced into russian poland would be a provocation against germany when the poles realized that political situation they employed all their forces to come to a reconciliation with russia they saw their only salvation was in the defeat of the german power but that work of reconciliation with russia was not easy especially after the annexation of bosnia and herzegovina when it was evident that a war between russia and her western neighbors the central empires was inevitable so the poles were in a hurry to organize as quickly as possible polish influence in russia against the central empires but there was a very great difficulty because of the poles and because of the russian government the poles had the long-standing tradition of a struggle against russia between the poles and the russians there was a sea of bloodshed in secular struggles and fresh memories of insurrection followed by oppression did not favor the movement of reconciliation a yet stronger difficulty was the policy of the russian government which was anti-polish until the outbreak of the present war there was a curious contradiction between the foreign and home policy of the russian government in the period preceding this war the foreign policy was anti-german because russia in her foreign interests was threatened by germany but the home policy was pro-german and in poland on the western frontier supported the germans against the poles owing to the peculiar situation of the polish protestants the Russian authorities, represented chiefly by men with German names, considered the Polish Protestants Germans, and enforced the German language in their schools. The Poles were obliged to fight desperately for the retention of the Polish language in their schools, and then came the occupation of Poland by the Germans in this war. The Germans published an order that German teaching should be introduced into the schools because the Protestants were assumed to be Germans i was told an interesting story about that the protestants of warsaw sent a deputation to the governor-general of warsaw at the head of them was a doctor of protestant theology of a german university the deputation told the governor-general we are poles and we want polish teaching in our schools then the governor-general said allow me to say my government considers all protestants in warsaw as germans whereupon the doctor of protestant theology answered oh if that is so it will be very easy for us to become roman catholics and the german governor made the concession asked for on that struggle for the organization of polish civilization public opinion against the central empires was at one in this war four-fifths of the public opinion of the poles is on the side of russia and against germany and austria as can be proved by the experience of the russian army in poland the poles understood first that their national existence is threatened by germany and that the only chance for their future is the german defeat and secondly that their national role is that of a barrier against the progress of germany in the east the power of germany comes not from the west but from the east from prussia from the country built nearly on the slavonic side and every progress in the east means a new increase of the german power and the first thing for europe to do in the future if she wants to have germany less dangerous is to stop the progress of germanism in the east by what means may it be stopped in the country of polish civilization that russian civilization which is such a great progressive force in the east it is sufficient to mention its work in the caucasus and central asia has no constructive power 
therefore if the country is to be saved from german conquest if poland is destined to present a barrier against german progress polish civilization must be given freedom to develop and that this civilization is able to fight against german aggression is proved by the struggle of the german poles the truth is understood by many enlightened and thoughtful men in russia and at their head we see the august person of the russian emperor who gave his approbation to the ideas of the grand duke's manifesto addressed to the poles end of lecture four lecture number five the nationalities of russia by harold williams from russian realities and problems lectures delivered at cambridge in august nineteen sixteen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It would not be right to say that the nationalities of Russia are entirely unknown in England. During the last few years especially, a great deal has been said and written about a number of the nationalities under Russian rule. The Finnish, Polish, Armenian, Jewish, and Georgian questions have all been discussed in England. But there is one disadvantage in the mode of discussion that has hitherto prevailed in this country these questions have been viewed not as a whole but in segments they have been seen as moments as phases in some great dim struggle of which the full meaning is hardly realized most of the questions have been dealt with from a purely political point of view the sufferings of finns armenians and other nationalities of russia have been loudly proclaimed we have heard of their grievances we have heard the voice of their complaint but we have rarely heard the voice of their joy or the accents of their daily life now i do not think we can fully understand the meaning of any one of these questions if it is wrested entirely from its context appeals have been made to our human instincts the generous sympathies of english men and english women have been enlisted on behalf of many causes but if we were to put some of these causes side by side and compare them we should find ourselves confronted by perplexing anomalies consider together for instance the finnish and the jewish questions or again the armenian and the georgian questions you will discover strange contradictions that are at first sight startling and perplexing you will ask questions and will probably arrive at broader and more general conclusions your humane instincts will be vindicated the impulse of sympathy will still be strong but it will be intelligent and clear when i think of the nationalities of russia i do not think first of all of political struggles of debates in the duma or of newspaper articles i think of certain more intimate aspects of the lives of these very numerous and varied peoples of certain episodes which show the way their thoughts are tending without regard to the vicissitudes of political conflicts politics are necessary whether we like or dislike them but politics are a system of relations and we cannot understand relations unless we first of all realize what bodies they are between which the relations subsist i remember reading two or three years ago a book by a tartar mullah named musa bikiev who is called by many admirers in russia the luther of islam the book was on a very technical subject the subject of fasting when the days are long as you know during the month of ramadan the mohammedan must fast from sunrise to sunset and this particular theological question was discussed by musa bikyev in this book but the work is not wholly a dry theological treatise the writer describes a journey he took in finland he had interesting conversations with a finnish professor of the mongolian language he visited tamerforce the manchester of finland and records his admiration for finnish education Finnish institutions, and Finnish industries. Then he took a journey further north still, to Tornea, not very far from the polar circle, at the head of the Gulf of Bothnia, and there with a party he ascended a hill and saw the midnight sun. The sight of the midnight sun evokes from Bikiev a very fine passage on the majesty of God, and then he returns to his difficult theological question how can mohammed's precepts on fasting that had in view a hot country like arabia with its long nights be observed in the land of the midnight sun bikiev was born in the russian empire at kazan on the volga he saw the midnight sun also in the russian empire and the fact that impressed me was that it was the extreme diversity of social and geographical conditions prevailing in the empire that quickened in him this interesting process of thought that stimulated this fruitful work of theological inquiry 
then i think of a young buryat scholar a member of a semi-nomad tribe in the east of siberia one evening in petrograd i walked with this young buryat along the banks of the neva and he described to me a very interesting visit he had made to the great buddhist monastery of lhasa in tibet he told me of the wonderful library of buddhist works and of the magnificent image of buddha maitreya in the monastery and then he went on to tell me of this very interesting attempt to transliterate his buryat mongol mother tongue by means of roman characters that again was a curious instance of the varied mental processes that are going on among the nationalities within the russian empire on the one hand a keen interest in tibet the home of that type of buddhism which the buryats profess and on the other a hunger for western civilization that led to an attempt to adopt the latin alphabet to the buryat language i recall again a young georgian who lived and studied in petrograd and in order to earn a living he secured a post as proofreader on a russian newspaper but the chief interest of his life was to translate sophocles from greek into georgian verse these are the things i like to think about when i think of the nationalities of russia the number of languages spoken within the russian empire is something over a hundred and the number of languages spoken will give some idea of the very great variety of grades of culture and of civilization there are within the empire there are almost as many grades of culture and civilization as there are grades of climate upon that great plain if you take for instance the alphabets of the various newspapers published in the russian empire you will see what an extraordinary variety of forms of culture are intermingled there you have the gothic letters in the german swedish and finnish papers then you have the roman characters in polish and lithuanian you have the hebrew alphabet in the yiddish and hebrew press and literature you have the black square armenian characters and you have the beautifully rounded georgian characters you have the arabic alphabet for the tartar and the kyrgyz languages you have the mongol characters for the buryat language you have russian characters for great russian little russian and white russian each of these alphabets represents a very different type of culture the russian alphabet stands for the old byzantine culture the gothic characters stand for the germanic culture of the northwest of russia the armenian and georgian alphabets represent the ancient civilizations of transcaucasia the arabic alphabet stands for the great mohammedan culture which dominated the middle east and still has great power there the mongol alphabet which is ultimately derived from the syriac alphabet shows how the semitic culture of mesopotamia impinged at one time on the ancient civilization of china then you have an extraordinary variety of forms of speech several great families of languages are represented you have the indo-european family including russian polish lithuanian lettish swedish and also german so far as it is spoken in russia then you have what is called the finno-ugric family including the finnish of finland and the finnish languages of the east of european russia and also the languages related to hungarian on the borders of european russia and siberia you have the tartar or turkish languages represented by kazan tartar azerbaijan tartar crimean tartar bashkir sart or uzbeg kirghiz and turkoman you have the mongolian family including buryat and kalmik which latter is spoken near the mouth of the volga you have the manchu family represented by the languages of tunguses and other tribes in siberia you have the strange and curious languages whose origin and connections are yet hardly known in the far east of siberia some languages apparently related to the languages of the north american indians and others to the language of the esquimaux then in the caucasus you have those extremely interesting languages related to georgian and also to armenian languages which are believed by the scholar who knows them best professor marr of petrograd the son of a scotch father and a georgian mother to form what he calls a japhetic group which is a kind of cousin to the semitic group of languages thus the languages of the empire represent an extraordinary variety of linguistic tendencies and of lines of linguistic evolution within this broad expanse of russian territory men have elaborated various forms of speech which mean various ways of thinking various ways of looking at the world various efforts to rise to a spiritual consciousness all these tendencies have gone their own varied ways in the course of history they have come into conflict they have influenced each other 
and now we find this wonderful variety of forms of speech and forms of thought of spiritual reaction all linked together in the vast territory of the russian empire all linked together in one complex imperial organization i think if we realize this we shall realize one very important fact i wish we could at last get out of the way of thinking of russia as a huge piece of the map as something flat and given and static and solid and stationary russia is not that russia is a process russia is one huge process of evolution in which all these various nationalities play a very important and very hopeful part we hardly realize i think that russia is only beginning to be russia has been forming russia has during the centuries of her long struggle on the great plain been gathering together the materials for a great existence for some great new experiment in human life in this world of ours the materials have been gathered together by a long series of conquests by a long series of struggles by great efforts in trade and colonization and now as far as we can see this part of the work is done the materials are there and they are waiting for their elaboration russia has made her notes she has outlined her plan and now has come the time for her to write the great volume which she is destined to write in history i have said there are over one hundred languages in the russian empire but that does not mean that there are a hundred nationalities a great many of these languages are spoken only by what we may call ethnic units which still linger in the region of mere folklore which have not obtained any grasp upon civilization which are liable to assimilation which will probably in process of time disappear as separate ethnic communities in this way in the northwest of russia finnish tribes are being assimilated and are gradually disappearing many of these tribes are extremely interesting in themselves and few parts of the world are so interesting for the ethnologist as is russia with its great variety of local customs its myths its religions the wonderful traditions of many of the tribes in the caucasus the many strange customs going back to ancient times leading back to all kinds of strange and unexpected connections with older civilizations so that in the far north of siberia you may find curious reminiscences of the wisdom of the ganges all kinds of curious relics of customs half familiar to us and half unknown but on the other hand there are several ethnic units which have by various means in various ways grasped the apparatus of civilization for themselves and have attained the rank of nationalities and it is with these nationalities that i particularly wish to deal in these lectures the position of the nationalities of the russian empire is not quite so strange not quite so foreign as it seems at first sight to englishmen after all there is a very close analogy with our british empire take the ordinary russian university such russian universities as those of petrograd and moscow you will find there in certain respects a very close analogy even with cambridge i mean so far as the character of the students goes here in cambridge there are or were english students from various countries there are scotchmen irishmen south africans english and dutch there are indians from various parts of india there are french canadians and british canadians there are many from the straits settlements from australia and new zealand you will find something of the same kind of thing in petrograd or moscow you will find not only russian students there but poles armenians georgians tartars and lately even turkomans who in a work published in england about thirty years ago were called quite rightly the man-stealing turkomans the difference between the british empire and the russian empire is that in russia there are no dividing oceans if we could think of the british empire as being all of a piece with all its great variety of people jostling each other on a great plain we should realize more clearly the national problems of the russian empire russia has as it were its irish problem its south african problem its french canadian question its colonial question and all these questions are juxtaposed and intermingled very closely and are all entangled in a most extraordinary way with the question of the russian population which is spread all over the empire and very often cuts through the territory occupied by other nationalities you have this great plain which is in a sense a sea with the russians as the great colonizers with the nomad tribes as the pirates who in the long run were subdued and tamed to russian rule 
how did this very complex organization called the russian empire with its great varieties of nationalities come to be what it is i don't want to tell over again the story of russian history which has been very ably set before you in several lectures during the week but there are two or three points to indicate which have a bearing on my subject if you will remember first of all a number of loosely organized slavonic tribes coalesced and formed at kiev a state which for a time flourished and was then swept away by the tartar invasion then these slavonic tribes who by this time were known as russians transferred their centre to the upper volga and the oka river and afterwards established a new centre in moscow where they began to collect the scattered fragments of the russian people the russian ruler at moscow subdued the various russian principalities around him and gradually formed a strong national unit then using moscow as a kind of fulcrum he began the great work of expanding over the great plain a very curious expansion which apparently by a strange historical necessity could not stop until the limits of the plain were reached the moscow rule extended southward and subdued the tartars then it began to extend westwards and came into contact with the poles there was a great crisis there seemed to be a danger of the russian state disappearing entirely under the blows of the poles and the swedes there was absolute anarchy and absolute disorganization and the russian state was saved by the heroism of the russian people who took the work of evicting the invaders into their own hands then the work of building up began again it continued throughout the seventeenth century continued slowly with a tendency towards the west towards the baltic and with a steady tendency towards the black sea and then finally peter the great by a stroke of genius decided upon a new capital he wanted a new fulcrum for the more critical leverage of the century that was to come he founded petrograd and using petrograd as a lever russia continued her work of expansion along the baltic seaboard first of all the baltic provinces were secured then the northern shore of the black sea was secured by the annexation of the crimea in the reign of catherine the great next the kingdom of georgia became annexed to russia by the voluntary act of its own ruler that was the beginning of the conquest of the caucasus then after the shock of the napoleonic wars during the nineteenth century russia completed her great work of expansion by extending out to the far east of siberia and by conquering central asia just before the napoleonic wars there happened that very tragical and very strange and mysterious thing the partition of poland the three partitions of poland which placed a very large territory in the west and southwest under the rule of russia during the nineteenth century russia became a very active participant in western civilization and there was an extraordinary development of civilization in russia expressing itself in a very great variety of ways in literature in art in economic and social life and in the development of political forms this new and energetic and growing russia that was for the first time conscious of her great power and her great resources that threw itself as a people heart and soul into the work of civilization had around it a great variety of nationalities and it is a very remarkable thing that during the nineteenth century in russia there was not only a very great and very brilliant russian national movement but several other national movements were either revived or began their work on the territory of the russian empire you have heard of the magnificent polish revival that gained its power and its pathos from the intense suffering of the poles who had lost their inheritance the nineteenth century saw the beginning and the rich development of the finnish national movement in the caucasus the ancient civilizations of armenia and georgia which had sunk into decrepitude which had lost their vigor and their power were revived very largely because the contact of this old stream of civilization with the new stream of russian civilization then little by little through the force of example or the force of local conditions there arose other national movements russia became the centre of the very interesting and very manifold jewish movement then there came the lettish and the esthonian movements and in the baltic region farther eastward arose a mohammedan or turkish movement then finally even some of the tribes of eastern siberia were touched and there appeared the faint beginnings of a national movement among the mongol buddhists all these movements are very varied some are very strong some have a very clear perception of their objects 
some have already produced very definite results and can show a record of bright achievement others are weak and feeble some of the movements draw their vigor from sources of their own others are dependent almost entirely upon russian civilization drawing their material from russian civilization translated into their own tongue and using it as a stimulus of the national force of their own people some are independent of russian civilization some are more or less dependent some are dependent partly on russian and partly on western civilization some are dependent exclusively on russian civilization for the material with which they are building their new national home there is an extraordinary variety in these movements and where there is movement there is conflict there is conflict with the dominant people with the russians or rather less with the people than with the policy of the government then there are fierce conflicts of the various nationalities amongst themselves and the quarrels between the nationalities are very often much more violent than the conflict between russia and any of the nationalities there is conflict there is movement there is progress there is disappointment there is hope there is tragedy in the vast process that is russia we find as it were cosmical forces at work tremendous cosmical forces of good and evil on a scale that we in our quieter empire are hardly able to realize and in this cosmical struggle there is tragedy deep tragedy and i think the note of tragedy will never be entirely absent from russian history because of the greatness of russia because of the tremendous task that lies before this group of peoples on the vast plain that stretches between the baltic the black and the white seas afar to the pacific and the frontiers of the chinese empire and the borders of persia there is tragedy in this we cannot eliminate the tragedy but at the same time in spite of conflict which comes from movement in spite of suffering which is due to participation in the very great very complex historical process in spite of baffling enigmas and crushing disappointments which we find ourselves unable to explain in spite of all this there is joy in russia the joy of all these peoples of various origins of various hopes of various faiths uniting on that vast expanse to create new types of rich human lives to produce some new manifestation of the power of the human spirit which shall bring wealth and power and happiness to the world for the sake of that great joy the pain and the tragedy can be borne after the outbreak of the war there was a wonderful scene in the russian duma one after another deputies representing various nationalities of the empire arose to declare the devotion of their peoples to the great cause for which russia had gone to war and their determination to make every effort and every sacrifice in order that russia with the allies should secure the victory over germany and austria it was an amazing scene to me it was a revelation through study i had come to the conclusion the fixed conviction that underlying all the divergent interests of the nationalities there was a sense of unity for years we had heard of suffering and oppression for years we had heard of protests from all sides of the empire against police and government measures of all kinds and it appeared on a superficial view that there was no general interest at all that the various nationalities were simply waiting for an opportunity to break away from russia that russia at the first shock might fall asunder that i could not believe but these declarations in the duma showed me as i had never realized before that russia with all her variety was one and that in a great moment of history when she realized her purpose and her destiny her sons felt suddenly and with a great joy that they had a common aim much has happened since then many sad things many disappointing things in some cases the enthusiasm is not so strong as it was then but the fundamental fact remains the fact that we have to take account of today that all these various nationalities in spite of their divergencies constitute a unity in what does this unity consist first of all in all this apparent chaos and welter of things and races there are certain harmonizing facts there is a certain proportion there are definite regions which are mutually complementary economic regions geographical regions the basins of the great rivers the mountains and various parts of the plain all constitute separate regions which in a curious way balance each other or interlace and supplement each other but the chief 
factor in the unity of the russian empire is the russian people first of all because of its numerical preponderance of the 170 millions of inhabitants of russia nearly 100 millions are russians of one kind or another and this fact constitutes one of the great differences between austria and russia in austria there is no one nationality that very largely outnumbers the others whereas in russia you have this tremendous numerical preponderance of the russian element the influence of the russian element is felt everywhere because of the activity of the russians because the administrative organization is in their hands because their language is spoken in all the ends of the empire it is the language of administration it is the main language of trade of intercourse between the various nationalities and you will find that the russian language influences very deeply the present-day languages of nearly all the nationalities of the empire just as english strongly influences present-day welsh then again most of the nationalities of the empire are very largely led by russian civilization they get their knowledge of modern european civilization through russian channels the civilized values that they handle are derived very largely from russian sources are very often direct translations from the russian and this powerful combination of physical and moral factors in a very curious and subtle way binds these nationalities together in spite of their great divergencies and in spite of features of russian administration that very often arouse irritation indignation and protest on the one hand you have russian administration a very complex organization a very deep-rooted organization which is now undergoing a change is very slowly and with great pain adapting itself to new economic and social conditions is being loosened so as to allow greater space and room for economic and national development this administrative organization does as a matter of fact hold to a large extent the nationalities together on the other hand partly aided by this administrative organization partly thwarted by it you have the extraordinary energy of russian civilization which has very quickly outrun the political organization which has developed by leaps and bounds which by an innate vigor of its own does most constantly affect every inhabitant of the empire and catches all the nationalities in the sweep of one great historical tendency then again russian civilization while it has an assimilating effect while it seems to mould the various peoples of the empire after one type has at the same time the effect of creating a new variety first of all you have an apparent assimilation you find the old customs disappearing and people becoming simply modern you find a dreary monotony in dress in habits in amusements you see the cinematograph in all corners of the empire flashing out the same pictures that are shown in paris and london and new york the gramophone in the urals drones out tartar songs and it all looks very melancholy and very depressing but at the same time under this appearance of assimilation there are stimuli which provoke to new action all the elements of variety the first stage is the new fashion the second stage is the new initiative in each region and in each nationality there is first of all mere imitation and then a growing realization that these new civilized values can be adopted by the particular nationality can be made their own by the various nationalities of the empire and can be used as elements of entirely new creations that is the marvelous fact that while the old varieties are disappearing a very wonderful new variety is arising taking up into itself all the most vital elements of the old variety and carrying them on to an entirely new era of civilization the russian people then constitutes the chief factor in the unity of the empire now i have a very difficult task before me i have to describe in the very short time that remains at my disposal some of the nationalities that compose the russian empire i must admit that this summer school has filled me with deep admiration during the past week i have seen you ladies and gentlemen taking in a knowledge of russia in rapid deep breaths and the keen interest you are displaying in a country to which i am deeply attached has touched me enormously i may say the same on behalf of my russian friends who have come here to lecture to you still the task i have before me is very difficult and the number and variety of the nationalities of russia is so great 
that i cannot hope to do more now than to note some of the leading features in a few typical national questions look first of all at the russians of whom there are nearly one hundred millions in all of all types the great russian the little russian and the white russian the three great divisions of the russian people you have heard in other lectures the history of the elements that made up the russian people of the wandering slav tribes which gradually assimilated a great many of the peoples of the plain thus in the north and centre in great russia there is a very large admixture of finnish blood whilst in the south among the little russians there is a large admixture of turkish blood the white russians of the west are considered by many scholars to be the purest specimens of the slav race now living i shall not dwell at length on the great russians of whom a great deal has been written and been said but i should like to say something about the little russians you have perhaps heard something of the ukraine movement you know that the austrian government during this war and before it has published maps indicating that as the result of a german victory they hoped for the creation of a ukrainian state comprising a part of galicia and a very large part of southern russia i have seen pamphlets written by little russians or ruthenians or ukrainians as they are variously called which advocate plans very much of the same kind i must admit that the ukraine movement is a very puzzling movement because if you look at the great russian and little russian languages you will see that practically there is hardly more difference between them than between english and scotch when i was in galicia last year i spoke with ruthenian peasants i spoke russian with slight modifications and they spoke their own language and we understood each other perfectly i had much more difficulty in understanding a cabman in newcastle the other day than i had in understanding these people although their language is declared to be a distinct language from russian and a distinct literature is being created in this language the fact of this difference in language is used as an argument sometimes by extreme ukrainians for the establishment of a separate ukraine state and sometimes by the more moderate ukrainians as a plea for the establishment at any rate of a separate administrative region for the whole of the ukraine or the greater part of southern russia it is a very difficult question there are certain differences of tradition very powerful differences between the great russians and the little russians their folk songs are different their music is different and their temperament is different in some respects the southern russian is the irishman of russia then again there are differences of historical tradition there never was an actual distinct little russian state in the complete sense of the word in the middle ages when the tide of tartar invasion began to recede the southern steppes were overrun by cossacks some of whom were great russians and some of whom were little russians that is they spoke the southern russian dialect they formed a military organization whose allegiance swayed between moscovy and poland they lived a very free and interesting life they were altogether a most interesting people but there never was a little russian state in the full sense of the word there were differences in the development of civilization there were differences in the church organization which in southern russia was much more democratic there were and are very great differences in land tenure and there were certainly very great differences in spirit and all these factors have created a marked distinction between the great russian and the little russian but again after the southern steppes had been conquered by russia and after the region had been gradually drawn into the general life of the russian empire a certain unifying a certain assimilating process went on and the southern regions began to feel themselves more and more a part of a larger whole then in the early part of the last century arose a movement to promote the literary development of the little russian language and the movement received a very powerful stimulus in the work of a very talented poet called taras shevchenko whose poems have almost become folk songs among the little russians of today this movement did not constitute any danger to the russian empire it might have developed into a movement like the provencal movement in france but when reaction set in after the great reforms of the early sixties the russian government took alarm and the language movement in little russia was very largely suppressed it was only permitted to print and publish in little russian fiction or poetry and that not in the orthography chosen by the people themselves but in the orthography of the great russian language this aroused strong protest among the ukrainians the leaders of the movement were arrested and exiled 
then the movement passed to galicia where the eastern section of the population is little russian or ukrainian lemberg became the new centre and galicia became what the ukrainians called the piedmont of the ukrainian movement this development found favour with the austrian government which saw in it partly a bulwark against russia and partly a means of checking the growth of polish power in galicia then later on it was taken up by germany as a means of impairing the unity of russia in 1905 the embargo on the ukrainian language was removed in russia great activity was developed various works appeared newspapers novels histories poetry translations and so on in great quantities and the ukrainian movement gained a new life in russia demands were presented for the autonomy of ukrainia but the conception of the boundaries of the new state varied considerably moreover in the last fifty years the great russian language has made great progress over the whole of southern russia and although the population of southern russia is now in the bulk little russian there is a big streak of great russian population amongst the ukrainians sometimes there are islands of great russians and sometimes they are to be found in broad strips and the language spoken in the towns is not the little russian but rather a variety of great russian with jewish and occasionally polish and little russian elements it is a harsh language it is a kind of new dialect of great russian and you will find that as economical development progresses as the industrial centres in southern russia increase as the population migrates and mingles with other elements the confusion will grow greater you will find a sort of admixture between great russian and little russian and the process of assimilation will develop more rapidly and all this makes it difficult to determine how far any independent ukrainian civilization is possible in southern russia i think the natural tendency is for the russian literary language to gain the upper hand even if all the present administrative restrictions were removed because the removal of administrative restrictions would give russian civilization even greater power than it has now at the same time it is perfectly obvious that if there is a genuine demand for instruction in ukrainian in the schools if it is found that ukrainian children grow more rapidly into intelligent citizens if they receive primary instruction in their mother tongue if there is an increasing development of ukrainian literature it seems to me perfectly obvious that no administrative obstacles should be put in the way of the movement and then my opinion is that ultimately after very considerable vacillations this southern russian language movement might in the great complexities of the russian empire again assume largely a provencal form and as for the questions of administration local government and so on i think they might be solved in connection with the general tendency of decentralization within the empire i do not wish to say anything absolutely definitive about the ukrainian movement because i am not entirely convinced by the very strong arguments of my friend dr struve and at present i should like to leave the question open as to the white russians their dialect is so little different from great russian that it is hard to imagine that a white russian movement of any considerable extent could arise there is an incipient movement which is now being used by the germans as a means of propaganda in vilna because the germans wish to emphasize even minor distinctions between the russian nation coming to the non-russian nationalities in the northwest we have finland i simply cannot discuss at length the finnish question in the short time we have this morning but there are two or three things i should like to say first of all finland is mainly populated by the finnish people who are composed of three finnish tribes who driven there by the northern movement of the slavs in their turn drove the laps to the far north the finnish people of finland are not isolated their territory is geographically and geologically distinct from the neighboring russian territory but they themselves as a people are by no means wholly isolated in fact they became a unity as the result of the competition between sweden and russia around the gulf of finland in the early days of russian history the russians fought constantly with the swedes and the finnish tribes passed sometimes under russian rule sometimes under swedish rule until finally swedish rule was established in the whole of what is now finland and over all but a certain portion of the finnish people who were left outside in the governments of archangel and olenets these were orthodox whilst the finns in vinland were first of all catholics and then when the reformation came became lutherans 
thus the main body of the finns were almost exclusively under the influence of swedish civilization and there was practically no finnish movement until after the finns came under russian rule the very peculiar conditions under which finland became incorporated into the russian empire with complete internal autonomy with a kind of ring fence separating the finns from the rest of the peoples of the empire made it possible to develop within finland a very interesting and a now very strong national movement which first of all fought very hard against swedish predominance swedish was the dominating language of the state the language of the aristocracy of the towns of culture and of civilization generally and then when the finns suddenly discovered in the thirties through the labors of the scholar elias lonrot that they had a great national epic there was a sudden uprush of national pride amongst the finns a great many people in the towns who had hitherto called themselves swedes suddenly discovered that they were finns adopted the finnish language and adapted it to literary purposes and then began the great contest for equal rights for the finnish language within finland it was won by the finns and swedish and finnish gained equal rights in public life the finnish movement rapidly developed and during the last thirty years its progress has been most extraordinary and so the swedes who were once predominant find themselves being elbowed out of the land in which they were masters the new finnish literary language is in spirit though not in structure or vocabulary scandinavian it has produced literature not great perhaps but very interesting with a number of talented authors of whom the novelists johanni aho and arvid jarnefelt are probably the best some excellent poetry some very interesting art and also an extraordinarily effective scientific apparatus an apparatus of learning of which the university of helsingfors is the active centre in the last few years the autonomy of finland has been limited in many ways there has been a conflict between the finns and the russian government i cannot enter into the details of this conflict now but i can only say that amongst the nationalities of the empire the finns occupy a very peculiar and so far distinct place and as to their assimilation by the russians or any other people in the world there is no question whatever because there is no people in the world so tenacious of their nationality as the stubborn hard-headed finns then south of finland you come to the baltic provinces which include three nationalities the germans who are in the great minority but hitherto have had nearly all the power in their hands the estonians and the lets the estonians and the lets have in common their general subjugation to the germans who by means of the order of the sword a branch of the teutonic order conquered them in the thirteenth century and after fierce battles subdued them and held them in serfdom until the beginning of the last century but there is a great deal of difference between the estonians and the lets in spite of the community of their historical experience and their long subjugation to german culture the estonians are related to the finns and the common people of estonia and the finns understand one another perfectly well although the educated finns and estonians understand one another with greater difficulty the lets are an entirely different people and are akin to the lithuanians who live farther south the estonians and the lets owe the beginnings of their own culture to their hard training under the germans there are no people in the world who hate the germans more than the estonians and lets do because of the bitterness of their serfdom the hatred is simply elemental if you look into the past history of the lets and estonians you will find that occasionally the barons were on excellent terms with their serfs treated them kindly provided education for them and helped them in various ways but the general effect of serfdom was so cruel that what it was can only be realized by seeing the vindictive hatred of the lets and the estonians for their former masters the hatred of the lets was expressed in the most violent form in the lettish revolution of nineteen o five which was followed by cruel repression in the early part of the following year the new civilization of the lets and the estonians is partly of german origin and partly russian but the intercourse of both peoples with the russians is growing closer and they are subjected more and more to the influence of russian civilization and culture then south of the lets you have the lithuanians in the governments of vilna and grotna and the suwalki government in the kingdom of poland 
i wish i had more time to tell you about the lithuanians they are one of the most interesting peoples in the russian empire their language is extremely old with forms as old as sanskrit and i have an idea that the lithuanians have stayed near their original home during the whole course of their existence there is a curious feeling about them their neighbors call them sorcerers and wizards up to the seventeenth century they worshipped their gods in groves and had an institution of vestal virgins who kept the sacred fire burning there were prophets and soothsayers and there were curious manifestations of tree worship then the history of lithuania and its contact with the teutonic order is extremely interesting but all that wonderful story i have no time to tell now the lithuanians too have lately developed their national movement with its newspapers novels poems and its apparatus of propaganda i have left myself hardly time to speak of one very important question that of the jews but i must ask your very careful attention to this for just a few moments longer i have not spoken of the polish question for two reasons in the first place it has been already admirably expounded to you by mr roman Dmowski and other lecturers during the week and in the second place the polish question stands on a quite distinct plane from the question of the other nationalities of the russian empire the question of which i have now to speak is one of which very much is heard in england it is a burning question and indeed i think it the most difficult question in the whole russian empire and that is the jewish question the greater part of the jews came into the russian empire with the partition of poland and the region they were compelled by law to inhabit comprises the western and southern provinces of european russia the so-called pale of settlement which through the vicissitudes of the war has been abolished i hope for ever now the jewish question is so very difficult it is such a tragic question that it cannot be discussed only in terms of current politics it cannot be understood if it is made the subject of invective on either one side or the other it is too deep it cannot be treated casually or flippantly and one thing i should like to establish is that while the jewish question is most acute in russia it is not only a russian question but a world question and even if the present political disabilities of the jews in russia are removed the jewish question will not have been finally solved the jewish question constantly present and ever evading solution is one of the very strange experiences by which the human race in persistent self-questioning is finding its way to a clearer knowledge of itself it is a difficult question the finest of the jews realize this difficulty and it has led some of them to adopt as their ideal zionism or the establishment of a jewish centre of civilization in palestine but in russia the jewish question is most acute first of all because nowhere else are there so many jews in a compact mass and in the second place because of the marked inadequacy of russian administrative methods as they are brought to bear on the complex necessities of the case these are the two elements which make the jewish problem in russia so acute and perplexing on the one hand you have the cruel and intolerable oppression of the jews you have the perpetual humiliation and irritation of the jews in the small towns who have no room for expansion who live poor and miserable lives you have the long long tale of their bitter suffering and at the same time you have such facts as the growing power of the jewish element in finance in petrograd and moscow in banking and commerce and industry and the very powerful influence of the jews in the intellectual life of the russians you have these two sides and both these sides must be clearly borne in mind but the interesting thing in russia is that the very intensity of jewish suffering in russia stimulates the efforts of the jews and of those who understand who the jews are and what they are to find a real solution these efforts go in various directions on the one hand there is a constant fight to secure elementary rights of existence in russia on a level with the other inhabitants of the great plain and at the same time there is an effort which is now largely crowned with success to bring about a new jewish national revival and the inner life of the jews in russia is extremely interesting because of this conflict of aims and ambitions and because in the long run this movement is illumined by a spiritual light i believe that after the war after the great struggle not only with the enemy but with ourselves with our own limitations is fought through after the war is won 
not only will the jews secure in russia the conditions for a tolerable existence but i believe that other nationalities including many of whom i have had no time to speak those twenty millions of russian turks who are now awakening to a new national life the armenians the georgians and all the rest who are struggling towards a new civilization that all these nationalities will secure liberty for themselves and liberty to cooperate to the full extent of their powers and with a complete confidence in the value of their own contribution in the great work which this enormous and complex russian empire is called to accomplish in this strange adventure of spiritual discovery in the great march of these manifold groups of men into the unseen future i believe that all the nationalities of the russian empire will combine as a choir of many voices with many wonderful instruments to sing a joyful song of conquest over the mystery which surrounds us all end of lecture five First part of lecture number six, The Development of Science and Learning in Russia, by A. S. Lapodanilevsky, from Russian Realities and Problems, lectures delivered at Cambridge in August 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Friendly intercourse, either between nations or individuals, cannot be achieved without mutual knowledge and appreciation of their respective moral forces for moral forces prove to be powerful springs of action not only in times of peace but also in times of war when they reach in certain cases their utmost tension and incite men to great deeds although moral forces are not all concentrated in thought this principle has the greatest combining power of them all and exercises it both in peaceful and warlike activities thought implies unity of cognition constantly referred to an object other than the mental state itself and brings men forward to some definite end leading through the intricacies of life to a higher destiny these considerations prompt me to draw your attention at this meeting the main subject of which is the study of russian civilization to russian thought past and present the term thought as stated above particularly in its methodic sense is distinguished from will and feeling but even with this restriction it is still too wide for our present object i shall use it often to cover the leading principles and general movements of philosophy science and learning and apply it in this sense to the psychological and historic study of such development in russia the solution of such a problem in its totality would be probably unattainable for any one man even if he were familiar with all branches of human knowledge science and learning i have of course no such claims and intend to give you merely an approximate idea of what might be done to elucidate some general aspects of russian thought as manifested in the scientific and learned work which is going on in russia thus conceived the historical study of russian thought implies however manifold problems it must be considered not merely in its leading principles but in its characteristic features and not only in its general movement but in its special development which depends on local and temporal conditions of russian life i have therefore to deal with two sets of problems concerning russian science and learning one the leading principles and characteristic features two the general movement and special development the two sets are of course closely connected one with another in clearing them up i shall take into account this connection these problems are not easy to solve and they grow even more perplexing if thought be considered as part of a more complicated whole namely consciousness and be studied in its relations to will and feeling if it be moreover observed in the process of its realization and regarded as a leading factor in conscious activity these new problems cannot be treated here at length but i think i ought not to leave them out entirely and i shall touch upon them slightly in some concluding remarks on russian conceptions of consciousness as a whole and on their realization in russian life part one 
every thought which has a pretense to knowledge must be unified knowledge not merely philosophy but every manifestation of science and learning aims more or less at such an end and tries to attain it in different ways this principle of unity of thought must be distinguished from the process of unification it can be realized by different factors or modes of thought two of these which in the main do not exclude one another deserve perhaps some attention i mean intuitive and discursive thought intuitive thought is a spontaneous creative and inventive power discursive thought is a controlling methodic and orderly power they can be associated in one person and this combination is perhaps one of the most pregnant characteristics of genius but they can be dissociated and represented by different persons belonging to the same or to different nations one of the best writers on the history of modern science has made an attempt to apply this distinction to different types of modern european thought he identified two logically different factors or modes of thought with two actual national types of thought and found these modes existing in different peoples even if this scheme should prove to be true for the characteristics of the thought of some other nations it would probably be too artificial to explain russian thought russian thought can hardly be characterized by either of these modes and eminent russian scientific and learned men have been distinguished by the predominance of one or other of them besides some peculiarities of russian thought at least had a much more complicated and concrete origin they were and still are in a certain degree dependent on local and temporal conditions which will be examined here from a historical point of view mainly in connection with the process of unification the unifying principles of russian thought can be perceived in its history and were formed at its different stages in a religious or secular spirit let us consider this in some detail and illustrate our statement by some examples one religious thought whatever may be the factors of its evolution gives even at its lowest stages a conception of the world which tends to a certain unity even in heathen times we can trace such a frame of mind although russian mythology could not of course reach systematic unity it contained some germs of unification around which the varieties of heathen experience were gathered although the russian olympus even after the attempt of vladimir sviatoslavovitch to restore the heathen cult cannot be arranged in a strict hierarchy yet its chief deity the angry and jealous perun appears as a centre of crystallization for various conceptions concerning the creative powers and processes of nature connected with thunderstorms and thundershowers and even embracing some elements of culture thus vivifying fire could be obtained according to tradition from the oak tree which was sacred to perun oaths were tendered in his name and so on this unifying tendency became much stronger in christendom christian monotheism of course could not at once abolish polytheistic superstitions and even in our own times some russian peasants for instance in the government of pskov mention perun in their oaths but the baptism of vladimir sviatoslavovitch and his people revealed to them the idea of an almighty creator and a benevolent providence and thus introduced a somewhat transcendental but harmonious conception of the world which can be traced for instance in the precepts of vladimir monomach and other literary works of that time this unification in a religious and christian spirit was however transformed by degrees into a dogmatic subordination the orthodox church swayed the minds of medieval men and regulated the aims of their knowledge it was thought necessary to elaborate the revealed teaching of the church into a well-balanced system of concepts and to develop it in a chain of regular syllogisms this subordination enslaved science and produced scholastic learning this principle is represented for instance by st john damascene his treatise on dialectics in which he tried to adapt the logic of the ancient schools to the teachings of the orthodox church was translated into slavonic and circulated in russian copies of the fifteenth century and later maxim the greek one of the disciples of john damascene formulated this theory in russian as follows quote, 
logic can be useful in so far as it is employed by us to glorify the lord and stirs up our love for him but it cannot contradict his holy words and must endeavor to agree with them zinovi otensky a pupil of maxim the greek conformed to the same doctrine though he admitted that reason must play a certain part in theological controversies a friend of maxim the greek the monk artemius also expressed the same idea in one of his letters to the tsar ivan the terrible Quote, true reason he said is always confirmed by the bible and reason when it contradicts the bible is false End quote. thus the principle that reason must be subordinated to revelation was expounded by a father of the greek orthodox church was stated by a series of russian writers of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries and prevailed even in the seventeenth in muscovy from this point of view the bible so far as it was translated supplied the place of scientific and learned works on nature and man pious commentaries e g those of georgius Pisidis on god's creation took the place of treatises on natural science and the lives of the saints particularly the great collection of the metropolitan macarius stood for monographs on moral and historical subjects although greek culture was much better fitted for such a role russian men of letters began to have recourse to latin civilization and to study latin books particularly those which were of use for theological controversy and scholastic learning by degrees some notions on formal logic some dissertations of aristotle on natural science expounded in this spirit some treatises of thomas aquinas on justice and other topics and some works on history for instance the chronicle of martin bielski penetrated into russia this movement developed first in kiev and somewhat later spread to moscow the enlightened metropolitan of kiev peter mojila transformed the famous school at kiev into a college in sixteen thirty one he himself had a humanistic conception of knowledge and education but the place became later under polish influence a centre of scholastic learning the enlightened spirit of this college was well represented by stephen Yavorsky, one of the professors who lectured there for some years before the college was transformed into a theological seminary the wise monk simeon polotsky one of the opponents of the learned apophenius slavinetsky began probably in sixteen sixty four to impart in moscow the latin learning that he had got from the kiev college and from the polish schools in vilna and other cities one of his pupils sylvester medvedev was a zealous partisan of latin learning and took a lively part in the contest which arose thus early between the zapadniki and vostochniki i e the partisans of western latin civilization and those who like the monk euthemius and the brothers lehudi maintained the eastern greek tradition these fears were not entirely unfounded men who applied themselves to latin civilization were sometimes unable to preserve the greek faith from contamination and to square with its principles all the ideas more or less intimately connected with the catholic or protestant confessions and their sects thus maxim the greek was somewhat troubled by the ideas he learned during his residence in italy sylvester medvedev was accused of having expressed latin rationalistic opinions on transubstantiation and matvyai bashkin was perhaps influenced by protestant or calvinistic ideas as regards transubstantiation and some other doctrines but the fundamental point of view from which all this knowledge acquired some unity continued to be religious the russian scholars of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries were obliged to conform to the precepts of russian orthodoxy as expounded in the profession of peter mojila and the later treatises of stephen yavorsky and theophan prokopovich though these were influenced to some extent by catholic and protestant ideas orthodoxy continued to subdue reason and to humble its independent creative power for a long time it preserved among russian scholars the dogmatic and traditional conception of science and learning and produced such a view as might be expected of natural and historical phenomena 
this point of view was conspicuous even in branches of knowledge which apparently had nothing to do with theology thus the results of arithmetical operations were considered as miraculous different positions of the signs of the zodiac were explained by movements produced by angels peculiar habits of animals were explained in accordance with christian traditions and historical facts were selected in order to exalt our past history in the spirit of orthodoxy orthodox conceptions predominated moreover at least in a speculative sense in the scheme expounded in the domostre and in political theories acknowledged by the muscovite government the tsar was regarded as the vicegerent of god and his autocratic power as coming from a divine source moscow was represented as the third rome which after the decline of the first and the second rome i e constantinople was considered to be the principal centre of the orthodox world these theories developed by the monk philotheus and joseph vilatsky were acknowledged by the tsar ivan the terrible and his successors they had some influence on our political relations with other orthodox slavonic nations this unifying orthodox conception of the world was however a dogmatic construction it suppressed the varieties of religious experience and fettered the development of russian thought this is the principal reason why the orthodox system could not endure it was crippled by the great schism raskol which embodied a protest in regard to some religious rites and it was unable to stifle the growing power of secular thought in russia two the gradual rise of secular thought in russia was due to many causes if we consider these in order of their importance which however does not always correspond to historical sequence we must notice especially the consciousness of the meaning of truth in its crudest form it manifests itself in that curiosity which men have about wonderful things and this feeling was alive in russians in the time of the first monarchs of the romanov dynasty they interested themselves in curiosities that fell within their reach together with some inventions and novelties which came from foreign lands but this curiosity could only grow into love of knowledge by reason of its practical value secular thought was particularly appreciated in its technical applications and this conception was for instance duly expounded in a book on the military art printed by order of the tsar alexey mikhailovich the practical usefulness of science and learning was really one of the essential causes of their development and the consciousness of this is conspicuous in the popular encyclopedias of the seventeenth century known as osbukovniki every man of course needed some knowledge of grammar for correct reading and writing of arithmetic for reckoning of geometry for measuring of geography for travel and foreign relations of history for politics and so on in view of these practical needs elementary manuals were composed particularly in the seventeenth century thus melitia smotsky wrote the first detailed slavonic grammar in sixteen nineteen basil bursi compiled the first russian arithmetic in sixteen forty five bogdan likov translated mercator's geography in sixteen thirty seven and some of the manuscript copies contained additional russian notes Inukin de Gisel produced in 1674 an historical survey of the quote, beginnings of the Slavonic Russian people and of the first Russian princes who reigned in Kiev. End quote. In fulfilling these practical ends, secular thought had much more liberty to display itself, and this point of view became predominant in the time of Peter the Great. He was not without curiosity and even pure love of knowledge but he appreciated chiefly the public utility of science and learning thus he used science to build fortresses or ships and organize factories he wished learning to justify his politics and to glorify his victories his reforms were to some extent facilitated by the influence that the renaissance and the subsequent movements had already exercised on russian thought particularly in the seventeenth century the humanistic and individualistic spirit of the renaissance was not quite unknown to the russians of the seventeenth century peter mojila the enlightened metropolitan of kiev had an opportunity of learning something about it 
and the monk epiphanius Slavonetsky, who came from kiev to moscow was acquainted with some of its literary productions for instance russian translations of the treatises of vesalius on anatomy and of mozhevsky on politics prove that this movement was beginning to penetrate into literary circles at moscow the confessional type of culture which predominated in europe even in the seventeenth century had also some influence on russian literature Krisanich was one of the most fervent adherents of catholic culture but this type was obliged to give way to the protestant atmosphere which found a powerful supporter in peter the great and was fairly well assimilated by one of his adherents the high-spirited theophan prokopovitch this influence promoted the development in russia of the individualistic and rationalistic spirit which permeated for instance the conceptions of one of the friends of protestant culture dmitri tveritinov he would have paid for his boldness with his life if peter the great had not hushed up the affair seventeen eleven to seventeen twenty three thus the growth of secular thought in russia was to some extent secured by the emperor himself in seventeen twenty five he founded for instance the academy of sciences in order that its members might cultivate science and learning and thus refute the opinion according to which russians were barbarians but peter the great was much more anxious to propagate technical knowledge among his subjects he entrusted at least partly this business to the academy and invited some foreign teachers for the purpose one of them called farkoshen edited manuals of geometry algebra and trigonometry seventeen nineteen and seventeen thirty and these were supplemented by elementary books on geodesy seventeen o eight mechanics seventeen twenty two and other subjects at the same time peter the great ordered translations to be made of some of the best works on geography architecture fortification and artillery shipbuilding and navigation jurisprudence history and other topics the chief authors translated were varenius vignola vauban and brown allard and manson puffendorf and stratemann the tsar printed moreover a defence of his right to dethrone his own son with quotations from hobbes and grotius and he published a pamphlet explaining the circumstances that provoked the great northern war the stream of thought produced by these somewhat artificial and in certain cases violent means continued to flow and received some new contributions in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries from german french and english sources these influences on which i cannot dwell at length were of different kinds german philosophy excited in russian coteries a growing interest in the problem of unity of thought of a systematic conception of the world of a harmonious comprehension of nature and man but it was often marked by its transcendent metaphysical character and exceeded the limits of positive science and learning which german scholars were introducing into russia in this respect german influence was supplemented by other movements french sensualism and english empiricism did much to promote the rise of secular thought and its development in russia and the culmination of french and english science which crowned the eighteenth century and inaugurated the nineteenth has contributed as much as german learning and perhaps even more to the growth of russian thought in its secular aspect these influences enriched it moreover with new and valuable contents the influence of germany on russian thought particularly during the eighteenth century and the first half of the nineteenth must be stated without hesitation the philosophical ideas of leibniz and wolf of kant herder and others penetrated into russian chiefly through the academy of sciences of petrograd and the university of moscow founded in seventeen fifty five after the philosophers of the period of enlightenment came the turn of idealism as taught by fichte and especially by schelling and hegel this had great vogue in russian coteries between eighteen thirty two and eighteen forty eight and of somewhat later date is the temporary ascendancy of morleschott's materialism and the theories of feuerbach marx and engel which were eagerly welcomed by socialistic groups various branches of science and learning were also planted on russian soil by german scholars the great mathematician euler assisted in the foundation of a russian mathematical school 
the famous historian schlitzer contributed to the formation of russian historical studies somewhat later and at different times weierstrass bunsen liebig ritter grimm savigny ranke droysen and momsen besides many others trained russian students in mathematics chemistry linguistics and folklore and in history french and english influences were less organized they made way into russia chiefly through personal intercourse and literature and were of somewhat later origin these connections grew conspicuous in the times of the french encyclopedistes voltaire diderot and others and the frenchmen drew the growing attention of russian readers to locke and hume and their followers from that time russian cultured classes became familiar with some of the ideas of montesquieu and rousseau mably and reynal helvetius and horbach and somewhat later they became aware of the theories of adam smith blackstone and bentham it is clear that german influence was relatively much more exclusive in russia in the first half of the eighteenth century than later on a comparison between two enlightened russian critics and historians of those times tatashev and sherbatov is enough to prove this tatashev borrowed much from german sources sherbatov was fairly well acquainted with french literature and had some idea even of english though he could not read it in the original by degrees french and english influences encountered the influence of germany and thus preserved russian scholars from complete subjection to german thought this is conspicuous for instance in the philosophical propositions of kotzelsky and in works of somewhat later origin many of these were conceived under the influence of french and english ideas the theories of the ideologues and particularly those of Destut de tracy had made some impression on the reformers known as the decembrists and after the second half of the sixties the ideas of comte had some vogue among russian cultured classes the views expressed by mill and spencer on the positive philosophy appeared at once in russian translations and nearly all their principal works became accessible to russian readers also modern french science and learning proved to be of great value for the development of russian thought couchet and ampere dumas and berthelot pasteur and bernard saint-simon proudhon and fourier Gisot, thierry and michelet renan Fustel de coulanges and others exercised an influence partly personal and partly literary on russian students contemporary english science and learning produced similar results the great ideas and discoveries of faraday and thomson lord kelvin of dalton and maxwell of lyell and darwin the acute investigations and liberal opinions of bentley and gibbon the brilliant narrative of macaulay and bold generalizations of buckles the suggestive inferences of tyler maine and other writers could not pass unnoticed in russia and some of these writers exercised a considerable influence on russian minds for instance darwin's investigations into the origin of species were expanded by kutorja at the university of petrograd as early as eighteen sixty and found many russian supporters and the diffusion of buckle's ideas among the cultured classes astonished one of his countrymen when travelling in russia in the seventies these combined influences did much for the development of russian thought they relaxed the authority of orthodox dogma and stimulated free thought but this state of mind produced a reaction which manifested itself in mysticism and in freemasonry first introduced into russia about eighteen thirty one of the first russian philosophers skovroda seventeen twenty two to seventeen ninety four was a mystic who declared that the invisible was the essence of the visible and must be studied by means of self-knowledge which he combined with some degree of rationalism one of the russian freemasons the well-known novikov organized the typographic company and the russian book trade in seventeen eighty two thanks to these influences the consciousness of the value of true knowledge deepened it was expressed in a somewhat clearer manner by lomonosov he declared that quote, faith and truth are own sisters they proceed from one almighty father and can never come into conflict End quote. and he supposed that the terms religious action or holy action could properly be applied in a certain sense to scientific thought but that the latter must have its own separate domain 
thus lumonosov acknowledged the absolute value of science and this conception grew clearer in subsequent writers the variety of these influences must also be noted it gave to the russian cultured classes the opportunity of selecting knowledge from different sources and favoured the development of freedom from prejudice and tradition it enlarged the sphere of their ideas and nourished in them a cosmopolitan and humanistic spirit it acquainted them with many-sided manifestations of science and learning this can be traced for instance in the works of radishev one of the most enlightened russian writers of the eighteenth century an outspoken critic of despotism and an irreconcilable foe to serfdom this variety of influences had however one serious defect it was wanting in unity and russian secular thought could attain this unity only after growing independent and in this sense national such a unifying national thought was needed in order to work out this second-hand knowledge and perfect it by discoveries of its own national spirit was already very strong in the muscovite state but being intimately connected with orthodoxy it could not actively promote secular thought in the next century this connection was relaxed and foreign predominance produced a national reaction shown for instance in the animosity which arose in the academy between lomonosov and his german colleagues he firmly believed in his own creative powers and urged his countrymen to display their merit but it was only after the wars which freed russia and other countries from the dominion of napoleon that this national spirit manifested itself in a corresponding doctrine byelinsky wrote in eighteen thirty four quote, romanticism was the principle proclaimed in the times of pushkin nationality is the alpha and omega of our own times End quote and in the name of this national spirit nadezhdin required from his countrymen appreciation of their national individuality and proper pride in themselves this doctrine was developed by the slavophiles kiryevsky homyakov and aksakov and later by danilevsky the critic of darwinism by his friend strachov and others some of the westerners also chiefly solovyev and kavelin were inclined to accept it but in a different sense and thus independence of thought was reinforced to a certain degree by national feeling this independent spirit might have grown much more quickly and continuously if it had been placed in suitable political conditions but political circumstances were not favorable to it i shall not speak of the times when moscow was a fortified camp rather than a centre of civilization but even in later periods of russian history when thought was growing up it was held under considerable restraint this occurred of course in times of reaction for instance in the last years of catherine's reign after the french revolution seventeen ninety to seventeen ninety six under alexander i after havoc had been made in the universities of petrograd and kazan and in a less degree of moscow eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty three in the times of nicholas i after the execution of the decembrists and particularly after eighteen forty eight when philosophy was practically banished from russian universities for thirteen years eighteen fifty to eighteen sixty three when science and learning were subjected to the strictest supervision when the westerners and even the slavophiles for instance herzen and homyakov were secretly watched by the police in fact only under the reign of alexander ii after the great reforms of the sixties after the abolition of serfdom the promulgation of the new code for the universities in eighteen sixty three and the foundation of many schools for both sexes the temporary lightening of the censorship in eighteen sixty five and some other amendments russian thought began to develop more rapidly and to disentangle itself from foreign leading strings thus the rise of russian secular thought produced by the causes which have been considered above began to manifest itself as early as the eighteenth century but it grew more conspicuous only when the combined action of these causes coincided with favorable circumstances and the reforms just mentioned and this occurred only in the middle of the nineteenth century since then russian thought has developed more independently and continuously and this can be confirmed in various departments of russian science and learning 
the process of development manifested itself in different domains of knowledge in russia during the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries it can be studied either from a quantitative and statistical or from a qualitative and genetic point of view general statistical accounts of the growth of science and learning and of the nationality of its chief representatives in russia hardly exist some approximate data however concerning the imperial academy of sciences are in this respect particularly characteristic during the eighteenth century the academy had one hundred and seven actual members only thirty-four of them that is thirty one point ninety eight per cent or if we exclude three members from the baltic provinces and three members from finland only twenty six point one seven per cent were russians of the foreign members sixty five per cent were germans during the nineteenth century and down to nineteen o eight out of a hundred and eighty nine members of the academy a hundred and thirty nine or seventy three point nine six per cent or if we exclude sixteen members from the baltic provinces and two members from finland sixty nine point three one per cent were russians of the foreign members most were still germans sixty four per cent thus the percentage of russian members of the academy rose during the whole period from twenty six point one seven per cent to sixty nine point three one per cent the development of russian thought in a qualitative or generic sense manifested itself in different ways in course of time it revealed much more creative power and became more continuous thanks to the formation of scientific schools institutions and other mediums of communication but this evolution can be illustrated here only by a few examples in a certain degree this process can be noticed even in theology for instance in the introduction of makarius bulgakov to the principles of orthodoxy and in an analogous treatise of filaret yumilevsky containing a criticism of german rationalism this development however is much more conspicuous in russian philosophy mathematics and various branches of knowledge concerning reality the prevalent influence of foreign and particularly german philosophy over russian thought lasted a long while but in course of time german idealism and materialism found some critics among russian scholars of the forties and sixties from this point of view sidonsky tried to connect speculation with experience and the slavophiles proved to be more original than the westerners kiryevsky and particularly homyakov refuted the rationalism of hegel whilst ryedkin and particularly shishirin remained more faithful to its principles the slavophiles had a wider conception of consciousness as a whole than the westerners and hence were not inclined to agree with the rationalistic formulas of hegelianism which failed to give a satisfactory explanation of reality but even chicherin tried to introduce some corrections in the logic of hegel and some other westerners for instance kavelin were not entirely satisfied by hegel somewhat later the materialism of moleschott feuerbach marx and others passed through a similar phase pisarev for instance turned from materialism to positivism and the anthropological principle of chernyshevsky was examined by yurkevich the positivism of comte though assimilated by virbov and propagated by Livovich, before he exchanged it for empirical criticism did not long hold the field it was attacked by the archbishop nikanor brovkovich and by one of the foremost representatives of russian mysticism v soloviev who was also much interested in epistemological problems rejected it and in agreement with him one of his intimate friends trubetskoy gave himself up to concrete idealism in modern times the critical philosophy of kant also found itself challenged by a russian philosopher karinsky he criticized not only positivism but all the systems that were based on criticism after having published some original views on inductive and deductive logic he endeavored to prove that intuitions of space and time can be considered as a priori notions but that judgments on the laws of intuition for example mathematical axioms proceed also from experience some of the ideas of karinsky were however discussed by a consistent representative of kantian philosophy yevdensky the well-known critic of the metaphysical conceptions of matter soul etc his pupil lapchin tried to prove that the laws of logic were not applicable to things in themselves 
meantime the system of kant encountered further criticism from russian intuitionists laski a pupil of koslov developed comprehensive views on the intuition of the external transsubjective world he formulated a theory concerning the original coordination between one's self and the content of this world and applied it to different parts of philosophy the gradual rise of independent research in russia can be observed even better in the evolution of mathematics natural sciences and humanistic studies mathematics have developed in a much more logical manner than other branches of knowledge for they were much more independent of exterior circumstances and had no need of expensive laboratories complicated implements etc nevertheless they turned out to be of great practical value and inspired no alarm in the government it is natural therefore that mathematics have continuously developed in russia from the times of bernoulli and euler the latter trained the first russian mathematicians who were able to use mathematical analysis particularly kotelnikov and rumovsky somewhat later guriev demanded stricter method in mathematical investigations and osipovsky tried to systematize mathematical knowledge at the same time he bestowed his attention upon the rising genius of ostrogradsky after studying in paris especially under kushi ostrogradsky wrote some noteworthy papers especially on the integration of algebraic functions and the calculus of variations together with bunyakovsky ostrogradsky was one of the founders of the russian mathematical school which gained great distinction from the work of a famous mathematician of the second half of the century chebyshev who discovered new solutions of many difficult mathematical problems chebyshev elucidated the theory of probabilities elaborated a remarkable theory of numbers wrote valuable papers on integral calculus and interpolation continued fractions and problems concerning maxima and minima etc he started moreover new problems which were further investigated by his pupils markov who studied also under the influence of korkin was particularly interested in the theory of probabilities and of algebraic numbers and continued fractions lyapunov who gave himself up to the study of theoretical mechanics guided the first steps of steklov and so on this movement in the domain of mathematics was supplemented by another produced by the genius of lobachevsky eighteen twenty six his pangeometry which revealed an entirely new and comprehensive conception of space eventually found some partisans among russian mathematicians for instance vashenko and zakharchenko during the same period the evolution of independent russian thought concerning the real world in its natural and historical aspect can also be exemplified such a knowledge supposes a theoretical conception of reality as an object of experience and experience from an epistemological and even practical point of view becomes a problem in itself the most scientific mathematical treatment of natural phenomena could however be applied only to some of them it turned out to be particularly successful in mechanics following bernoulli and euler some russian scholars contributed to this subject thus ostrogradsky wrote papers on the propagation of undulatory motion in a cylinder and on the motion of an elastic body and more recently lyapunov solved the problem of the figures of equilibrium not very different from ellipsoids exhibited by a homogeneous and liquid mass with a rotatory movement mathematics and mechanics were applied also to astronomical investigations one of the colleagues of bernoulli the frenchman de lille and rumovsky a russian pupil of euler began this work but it was organized somewhat later after the foundation of the observatory at pulkovo in eighteen thirty nine by struve and his pupils in course of time redihin a former student of the university of moscow became director of this institution he was well known for spectroscopic and other investigations on the comets and shooting stars and the recent director Backlund, very highly appreciated in scientific circles was himself aided by one of the assistants of bredehin the astrophysicist bielopolsky these various branches of knowledge received some new applications in the study of geodesy which particularly concerned russia the materials collected by delille and kirillov an amateur of russian cartography 
proved to be of some use even for the atlas of 1745. The determinations and measurements made by Vishnejevsky, Struve, and others before the foundation of the observatory of Pulkovo, and the subsequent triangulations of the military topographical department made by Stebnitsky, Tilo, and others, contributed largely to the improvement of Russian maps. The best of these were executed by Strelbitsky and his assistants mathematical treatment could not however overcome all the difficulties which such an investigation presented in respect to complicated natural phenomena particularly in the early days of russian science in the eighteenth century russian thought was still unable to state general laws and could only observe phenomena in part but in course of time experiment produced a greater knowledge of scientific law, above all in the physical and chemical sciences studied at the Imperial Academy. Before Euler published his dioptrics, Riemann had already made some experiments in electricity in which Lomonosov had a certain share. This high-spirited Russian man of science wrote also on optics and formulated some fundamental propositions concerning the mechanical theory of heat. Somewhat later, in the first half of the nineteenth century, besides Lentz and Kupfer, Petrov, one of their Russian colleagues, acquired some renown in practical physics. Theoretical physics was further elucidated by Umov and partly by Folsen, famous as well for his actinometrical studies. At the same time, the experimental spirit, further cultivated by Stolyatov and others, attained its highest point in the famous investigations of Lebedev on the pressure of light, and manifested itself in the valuable seismographic observations and inventions of Prince Golitsyn. In course of time, the physical interpretation of natural phenomena was applied also to the study of weather. Kraft and Lomonosov had been aware of the importance of systematic meteorological observations, but these were not organized till much later, particularly after the foundation of the chief physical observatory, 1849, by Kupfer and Wilde. The materials collected under their direction in different parts of the empire were studied by Veselovsky, Voyakov, Klosovsky, and others chemistry was even more fortunate conceived in a quite modern way by one of the earliest russian men of science it was subsequently studied with great success in different russian schools some years before the foundation of the university of moscow lomonosov expressed original views on this subject as a believer in the corpuscular philosophy he tried to apply quantitative analysis in studying the physical properties of bodies. He thought it necessary to ascertain their measure, weight, and proportions. He was the father of physical chemistry. In his inquiries, he implied the principles of conservation of matter and of motion. He established fairly clearly some other propositions of this new science, concerning not only the mechanical theory of heat, but also the kinetic theory of gases, the continuity of the three states of matter, etc. And thus Lomonosov formulated the conception of a new science, physical chemistry, which has grown up only in our own days. Physical chemistry, he wrote in 1752, is a science explaining theoretically and empirically, by means of physical experiments, the causes of the chemical processes which go on in compound bodies. These operations, however, could not be carried far at that period. Even Lovitz still adhered to the phlogiston theory, and only at the beginning of the nineteenth century Petrov and others tried to prove its inconsistency. Still later, after the discoveries of Kirchhoff and Hess in the domain of catalysis and thermochemistry, Russian chemists began to make further original investigations. In 1842, Sinin arrived by means of experiment at some organic basis of chemical processes, and obtained very valuable results with regard to aniline. He founded a famous school of Russian chemists. One of these, Butlerov, established a new principle of chemical constitution of matter, and had in his turn pupils who worked under his influence, Morkovnikov and Sayetsev. Beketov began his investigations also under the direction of Sinin, and developed original views on the affinity of chemical elements and on thermochemistry. Some years after the principal discovery of Sinin was made, Mendeleev, 
a most talented supporter of the theory of chemical types, discovered the periodic law of elements, and Metschutkin founded a new center of chemical inquiries. Similar investigations in other branches of natural science developed during this period, and were also made subsequently by foreign and Russian students, who began to state the laws which manifest themselves in different forms and processes of matter and life, and tried to complete their observation by experiment. This conception, however, took time to develop. The views of Lomonosov on the physical and chemical processes by means of which the origin of different minerals could be explained, e.g. rock salt, fossil coal, and amber, on the natural uniformity of crystals and on the phenomena of metamorphism, were too premature to be followed up by Russian students. Even their foreign masters had then no clear ideas on these subjects, but confined themselves mostly to observation. And their Russian pupils began to practice it with some success. An assistant of the self-denying Melon Krasheninikov, for instance, produced a substantial botanical survey of Kamchatka. Lepichin, a collaborator of the learned Pallas, the framer of Russian zoography and paleontology, published an accurate description of the natural wealth and folk roads of the northern provinces of the empire. And some years later, Osirishkovsky and Tsuev recorded valuable observations made during travels in Russia. This descriptive tendency assumed by degrees a more scientific and precise character. It is conspicuous in the first half of the nineteenth century, for instance, in the work of Severgin and Kokshirov on Russian mineralogy, of Lebedur and Turchaninov on Russian flora, and of Brunt and Kuturka on Russian fauna. In the second half of the century, some general principles were stated by Russianized or Russian men of science, and could be confirmed by experiment. And more profound and comprehensive views on nature, which gave a new direction to observation, were at this time enunciated. This movement manifested itself, for instance, in the domain of mineralogy. Godolin, who perceived very clearly the value of mathematical formulae and geometrical figures in order to express the laws which regulate the symmetry of crystals, put forward the hypothesis of a homogeneous crystalline substance enclosed in them. Godolin's work was continued and improved by Fedorov. He elaborated a vast scheme of all possible structures of crystals. Vernadsky studied not only crystallography, but some of the physico and geochemical processes in minerals, and began to describe their types in a systematic survey. Progress was made also in anatomy and physiology. Pirogov, the celebrated pupil of the Dutchman, Moyer of Dorpat, made an important contribution to the development of anatomy. He anticipated the bacteriological theory of blood putrefaction and used anesthetics in surgical operations which were further improved by Gruber. Yakubovich and somewhat later Bechterev made acute microscopical investigations concerning the anatomy of the nervous system. Meanwhile, Sayetchenov became famous for his physiological researches, particularly on the cerebrospinal reflexes, while Pavlov elaborated a lucid conception of the reciprocal action of the organs which play a part in the normal life of the body, and began his celebrated experiments on the circulation of blood, the secretory functions of the digestive glands, and the reflexes of the brain. More complicated and concrete sciences, such as botany and zoology, were also progressing during this period. Zenkovsky was one of the first to study the anatomy and physiology of plants, and contributed to the progress of bacteriological investigations. Famintsen also worked at the physiology of plants and explained the influence of light on them, and the phenomena of symbiosis. Timiryatsev, a convinced partisan of the mechanical conception of physiological processes and a strict adherent of Darwinism, studied the composition and properties of chlorophyll and other questions of vegetable life. Zoology and particularly embryology owed much also to Russian students. This new science was founded by Baer, one of the greatest embryologists. But Baer was not prepared to accept the theory of evolution in its phylogenetic sense, and this was done by Kovalevsky and Metchnikov, who contributed to further progress. 
kovalevsky made very important investigations concerning the embryogeny of invertebrates acidae amphioxus lanceolatus bunelia sagitta etc their secretory organs lymphatic glands etc metchnikoff was with kovalevsky one of the founders of the modern embryology of invertebrates he proved that their embryonic layers developed in a way similar to those of higher organisms as may be seen in scorpions and other types he signalized himself moreover by his microbiological studies on intracellular digestion and on the struggle of amoebomorphous cells phagocytes against infectious microbes in animal organisms for instance in the daphnia magna most of these russian students of nature exercised a great influence on the pupils who continued their work pirogov had many pupils sietchenov was the father of physiology in russia pavlov organized the physiological studies in the medical institute zenkovsky guided the first steps of faminsen who in his turn molded paladin borodin and others the assistance given by kovalevsky and metchnikoff to younger men working in similar fields is testified to by the famous embryologist selensky bogdanov formed a school of russian zoologists represented by shimkovich nasonov and others many of these devoted themselves to the study of more special subjects the results of these studies were applied also to more complex domains of knowledge concerning geographical and geological phenomena particularly those which had some relation to russia the geographical explorations undertaken by the academy of sciences in the eighteenth century proved very fruitful in scientific results particularly the great northern expedition of gmelin the elder and muller seventeen thirty three to seventeen forty three and the travels of Pallas in different provinces of the empire somewhat later similar expeditions were organized chiefly under the patronage of the geological society eighteen forty five for instance those of miedendorf persivalsky semenov tianchansky potanin payevtsov sievertsov and many others geographical exploration was not confined to russian asia mikluha makli for instance spent some years in new guinea among the papuans and in other places where he made valuable zoological collections and ethnographical observations in course of time these collections and observations were scientifically treated either by the travellers themselves or by independent investigators and were brought into connection with anthropological studies one of the pupils of bogdanov anuchin well known also for his geographical works began to deliver lectures on anthropology and organized the anthropological museum at the university of moscow he published his investigations on the tribe of the ainu comparing archaeological data with ethnographical observations on the bow and arrows and on the use of sledges canoes and horses in burial rites the rise of geological science in russia was of later origin messerschmitt and other travellers had gathered geological data and lomonosov had anticipated some modern views on the gradual formation of successive strata in connection with the internal heat of the earth and on the origin of subterranean minerals but even after the inauguration of the mining school in seventeen seventy four geology was not studied as a separate science until murchison made an attempt to give a general conception of the geological structure of russia and the ural mountains which had great influence on subsequent geological studies before murchison's date however helmersen began his travels he made a study of the devonian system and elaborated the first geological map of russia somewhat later karpinsky entered upon his various geological petrographical and paleontological inquiries chernyshev set to work on the paleozoic period particularly in the ural mountains and dokuchev devoted himself to the investigation of the russian soil in the fertile southern provinces the geological committee was founded in eighteen eighty two and some russian geologists earned reputation by special researches in different parts of the empire schmidt in the baltic provinces inostrantsev in the north and pavlov in the middle of russia muzhatov in turkestan the urals and the caucasus
some of these geological investigations were more or less related to prehistoric studies and the geologists themselves for instance glukinsky inostrantsev and others were inclined to promote anthropology count yuvarov was one of the first to devote himself to this special study he published a comprehensive work on the prehistoric antiquities of russia and this was supplemented by further investigations of antonovich anuchin and others in spite of this development in natural science speculative philosophy continued to control some of the moral sciences in russia thus for a long time philosophy was intimately connected with psychology in seventeen eighty three Anichkov, one of the adherents of the Wolfian doctrine, wrote papers on the immortality of the soul and on the connection between mind and body, which he explained, in the Aristotelian and scholastic spirit, by the doctrine of the inflexus physicus. This tie became weaker under the influence of the empirical psychology. Galich had become aware of its value, and some thirty years later Ushinsky had made an attempt to analyze the phenomena of feeling and will the scientific study of nature had naturally much effect on psychology sietchikov tried to solve the problem of the mind and body in this way and in his reply to kavelin's pamphlet expressed the opinion that only physiologists can attempt a solution troitsky wished to exclude metaphysics from psychology and introduced english empirical psychology to russians this movement partly supported by vladislav Lev, an adherent of Fechner, was, however, exposed to some fluctuations. Grote, at the beginning of his career, was ready to accept it from a positive point of view, but later turned to metaphysics, and terminated by applying the general law of conservation of energy to psychical processes. The metaphysical conception of psychology provoked, moreover, criticism in the modern scientific treatises of Oshansky and Lang, in the works of Chalpinov, Vedensky, and others. In course of time, further applications of physiology and psychology were made in the domain of linguistics. Here, as in other departments, description of facts preceded their explanation. General knowledge of this kind was, of course, very scarce in old Russia, but Messerschmitt and other travelers, particularly in the second half of the eighteenth century, had gathered linguistic materials bachmeister made a great collection of such data which were published in a great dictionary of all known languages under the direction of pallas the study of indo-european languages began in the same century from the time of bayer who took some interest in sanskrit and was directed especially to russian grammar lomonosov made a valuable attempt to establish the principal groups of slavonic languages he distinguished also the church slavonic and russian elements of our language elucidated its rational use and sketched its probable development and his views were adopted by barsov and other russian writers later on comparative linguistics began to be treated in a much more scientific way korsh was well versed in european and even oriental languages but neither he nor bothlink the great sanskritist was able to found new linguistic schools in russia these arose thanks to the learned activity of fortunatov in moscow and baruin de courtenay in kazan the late professor fortunatov made acute investigations concerning the comparative grammar of indo-european languages and their dialectical peculiarities in the most ancient periods the original representative of the neo-grammatical movement Baduin de Courtenay, studied the physiology and psychology of language. He discovered the laws of reduction of the stems of words in favor of their terminations, and of phonetic change, and was specially interested in the Slavonic dialects. These distinguished linguists had pupils who continued their work. Shachmatov, Ulyanov, and others represented the Moscow school. Krushevsky, Bogoroditsky, Bulich, and others, the Kazan school of linguistics. At the same time, Potepnya, a follower of Steinthal, applied psychological principles to the investigation of etymological and syntactical as well as semasiologic phenomena in the Russian language. He elucidated the relations of thought to language and studied the folklore of Little Russia, and his views were expanded by Ovsyaniko, Kulikovsky, and Sumtsov. 
while psychology was dominated by speculative philosophy it could not have much influence on the development of sociology but social science was especially at first closely related to ethnography which developed in connection with natural science and thus produced a corresponding conception of social phenomena the ethnographical study of the different nations and tribes of the russian empire was simplified by the ethnographical maps anticipated by kirillov and compiled by Köppen and Rittich. the publication of materials collected by georgi chulkov and others began in the eighteenth century in course of time this work became more specialized sakharov tereshenko dal and others were particularly interested in russian dialects and ways of thought and life the study of which was promoted by nadezhdin and enlarged by the expedition of chisbinsky klaproth kastren shjorgen radloff and somewhat later yadrintsev shmirnov and others studied the languages folklore and folk roads of the ural altaic peoples while miller uslar and others contributed to our knowledge of the ethnography of the caucasus in recent times old and new materials have been classified particularly in the ethnographical museums of petrograd and the late professor harutsen summed up the results of this work in his lectures on ethnography end of first part of lecture six second part of lecture number six the development of science and learning in russia by a s lapodanilevsky from russian realities and problems lectures delivered at cambridge in august nineteen sixteen this librivox recording is in the public domain sociological studies appeared somewhat later they were inaugurated in the sixties by lavrov a writer who at the beginning of his career was considerably influenced by hegel lavrov introduced the subjective method in sociology he arrived at the conclusion that social facts cannot be merely counted but must be weighed also this point of view was developed by mihalovsky karyev tushikov and others they maintained that the conception of human personality cannot be exclusively theoretical it must be at the same time moral and therefore not only explained but estimated and social facts being a product of the reciprocal relations of such personalities and acting on them must be appreciated later sociological studies fell however under french and english influences and chiefly that of comte's positivism and spencer's evolutionism the positive philosophy of comte became popular in russia in the second half of the sixties and lavrov took an interest in it comte's sociology was also appreciated by mihalovsky and de roberti kovalevsky studied it when he was still a student at harkov and applied some of its principles as well as those of spencer's genetic sociology in his subsequent works on this subject he tried to combine sociology with the comparative and historical study of institutions and their evolution besides many admirers spencer's sociological theory had however some critics one of these mihalovsky a believer in social psychology wrote vigorous articles on the reciprocal action of the individual and society on progress and other matters at the end of the century some russian admirers of the economic materialism of marx and engel particularly beltov struve and others criticized these conceptions and the psychological theories of ward tarde and other writers which were easily assimilated by the russian representatives of the subjective school and of genetic sociology these critics ridiculed just as their authorities did the failure of most of the previous russian sociologists to perceive that the material powers or methods and corresponding relations of production in material existence determine social political and mental evolution in general this theory contested by the subjectivists had some influence on the adherents of genetic sociology kovalevsky adopted it to some extent and attempted for instance to prove a somewhat closer connection between the family and private property but nowadays some of the russian representatives of economic materialism incline to a different conception of social life being manifestly influenced by the kantian doctrine of ethics meanwhile a more special statistical treatment of social phenomena began to develop 
its beginnings can be traced to the old books of Botero, Davity, Petty, and others, some of which were probably known in Russia. Kirillov had compiled a description of the flourishing state of the Russian Empire in 1727. Somewhat later, Schlötzer, author of a treatise on the theory of statistics, and Hermann and Storch undertook a similar task, and performed it in a more satisfactory way but even they confined themselves to mere description and this tendency was still conspicuous in the works of arseniev but in the second half of the nineteenth century jansen started a more theoretical conception of statistics as a science of social phenomena which can be studied in a great number of cases and consequently admits of exact mathematical reasoning in this scientific spirit he organized the official census and arranged many statistical data, particularly with regard to rural economy. The late Professor Chuprov also made some valuable contributions to the general study of statistics and investigated railway economics. He also contributed to the success of the statistical investigations into rural economy undertaken by the Tsemsvos the theory of statistics was further developed by jansen's pupil kaufmann and by chuprov the younger one of the modern representatives of the mathematical school of statistics while practical applications were made in several semsfos by orloff and other investigators statistics were of course closely connected particularly in previous times with economics this science developed in russia from the beginning of the nineteenth century it was expanded by schlotzer the younger and storch in the spirit of adam smith the french treatise of storch however was in a certain degree independent it contained for instance dissertations on the principle of value and labor on material and immaterial goods and on free trade after foreigners came russians one of the earliest russian economists chivilev was a pupil of the Dorpat school who learned English in order to read English economists in the original. He explained the general laws of economics in his lectures. Vernadsky, his successor in Moscow, elaborated a more comprehensive conception of political economy as a theory of labor, or a system of economic activity, and demonstrated the influence of the material prosperity of a country on its finances he also showed a turn for historical studies and a practical interest in the modern economic state of different european countries the moderate liberal views of vernadsky in the main supported by gorlov provoked criticism chernyshevsky one of the most active representatives of the socialistic movement expounded its principles and was particularly anxious to elucidate the part which the russian village community was to play in the subsequent evolution of the country he tried to prove that the tner was able to develop collectivism a conclusion which was later supported by vorontsov who expressed the conviction that capitalistic production considered in its historical aspect was not possible in russia the liberal school posnikov isaev and others were inclined to accept rather than reject these views during these controversies the historical school made further progress to a certain degree korsak manifested such a tendency in his acute investigations on the forms of industry jan Yul contributed to it in his studies on the influence of economic conditions on finance many others maintained it in more special works the evolution of the historical school was however visibly hindered by the vigorous expansion of marxism in russia in his general treatise on political economy chuprov adopted marx's theory of value although he was rather inclined to adhere to the historical school besides railway economics he studied the small farm industry and the various forms of cooperation necessary for its success wrote articles on different questions some of which concerned practical economics trained many pupils etc Vorontsov and Nikolayan agreed with Marx's attack on capitalism. Plehanov, Ilyin, and, for a time, Struve, Tugan Baranovsky, and many others became convinced adherents of Marx's doctrine and developed it to its utmost consequences. In course of time, however, a new tendency, partly anticipated by Sieber, manifested itself struve tugan baranovsky and some others began to appreciate the ethical principles of social organization and evolution 
the manual of tugan baranovsky for instance is written by an author who tries just now to apply kantian morals to the construction of a socialistic ideal the study of law and institutions in russia had a more remote origin it developed under the influence of natural law expounded for instance by pufendorf and accepted by gross one of the first members of the academy after the foundation of the university in moscow dilte began to deliver lectures there on natural law and zolonitsky published a short survey of its principles much later kunitsin examined them in an elaborate treatise written under the influence of kant meanwhile there arose a new tendency due to a more conscious appreciation of russian positive law dilte tried to apply the system of roman law to russian statutes but polyanov who had studied at strasbourg and Göttingen, and desnitsky a pupil of adam smith had a much more historical conception of jurisprudence desnitsky wrote able essays on civil law and a project for a russian constitution thereupon speransky author of a little treatise on the study of law elaborated his plan of eighteen o two also under english influences though later he turned to french models he also superintended the publication of the great collection of laws which have proved to be one of the principal sources of historical information for subsequent investigators and he encouraged some young students of law nevolin ryadkin krilov meyer etc further steps were made by russian scholars in the general knowledge of law particularly in the second half of the nineteenth century some of them for instance the hegelians nevolin Rydikin, and chicherin the positivists korkunov and Muromtsev, the psychologist petrochitsky acquired renown by their works on the general theory of law others cultivated special branches Krilov, trained by Savigny, delivered brilliant lectures on Roman law in its historical aspect. His pupil, Duvernoy, manifested a great aptitude for juridical construction, which he applied to Russian civil law. These general conceptions were somewhat neglected by Pobyet and Nadstev, and even impaired in their value by his extreme conservative principles. But he studied Russian institutions in a comparative and historical way, closely connected, as in his dissertations on landed property and succession with practical aims shershenovitch turned to more theoretical investigations breathing a liberal spirit and expounded them in his manuals this movement was supplemented by studies in a kindred domain sokolov pavlov gorchakov and others elucidated canon law the great reforms of the sixties promoted legal studies particularly those which concerned public law and institutions they were undertaken by andreevsky romanovici slavatinsky and some of their contemporaries one of the chief of these was Gradovsky. he appreciated very highly the principles of legality and liberty in political life and studied their evolution in european constitutions from this point of view he considered nationality as a basis of political development and investigated the part it had played in the formation of russian public law and organization in his famous treatise he elucidated besides these principles the role of public offices and of central and local institutions in russia gradovsky had many pupils one of these korkunov conceived the state as a juridical relation the subject of which is quote, all the capable population end quote, and the object the power of domination from this point of view he treated of russian public law and institutions some colleagues and some students of gradovsky the adherents of the classical school spazovich and tengantsev contributed largely to the study of criminal law and fonitsky expressed original views on criminality martins wrote a systematic treatise on international law conceived in a positive spirit and trained some pupils pilenko studied the subject in a dogmatical spirit and in its connection with private institutions while nolde sought to make an historical appreciation of the public and private relations at present subsisting between nations this growing independence of russian thought in the domain of natural and moral sciences was supplemented by an analogous process in historical learning the critical historical spirit began to appear in russia in the eighteenth century 
Bayer, one of the first members of the Academy, had gained a reputation by his investigations into some unsettled questions of Oriental and Russian history, particularly the origin of the Russian state and the Varyagians. Somewhat later, Schlötzer expounded a comprehensive view of the history of Northern Europe, and produced a very learned work, containing a critical interpretation of the Chronicle of Nestor. Meanwhile, Scherbatov began to study general Russian history in a pragmatic way, and Bolton formulated some scientific views of the natural factors which determined its course, particularly as to Russian manners and customs, and of the consistency which is to be desired in their development. This differentiation between universal and Russian history grew more conspicuous in course of time the critical spirit applied by some of the german historians to the study of russian history penetrated into a coterie formed by rumiantsev at the beginning of the nineteenth century he was supported by krug and other learned men the works of the eldest member of this group the metropolitan Eugenia bolshevitina were distinguished by acuteness and learning and prepared the way for later synthetic surveys of russian history the first of these Karamzin's history of the Russian state was, however, mainly a brilliant literary production, and subsequent Russian historians, while availing themselves of the wealth of information which it contained, particularly in the notes, elaborated a more scientific construction of our past. Further development of Russian historical thought manifested itself after the publication, in 1835, of the new regulations for universities since that time universal history has received much more independent treatment thanks especially to katorga in petrograd and granovsky in moscow the learned humanist katorga studied under the influence of niebuhr's criticism mainly ancient history he gave considerable credit to greek historical tradition and made some valuable investigations in the constitutional history of athens Sokolov, one of his pupils, started the study of Greek epigraphy, which was continued by Latishev and other pupils. But the main object of Katorga's investigations was not abandoned. Busikshil worked on in this direction. Meantime, Zielinski began to elucidate the spirit of classical antiquity in connection with modern culture, indicating especially the value of Sophocles, Cicero, and other writers for our own times, and his pupil Rostovstev entered upon his learned investigations on the Hellenistic Eastern origin of the Roman colonial system and on antique decorative art in South Russia. The study of medieval history was considerably promoted by Granovsky, a disciple of Ranke, Thierry, and other German and French historians he expounded his humane views in a mild social spirit and with an eloquence which charmed his audience and called forth the historical works of kurovtsev and ashevsky the attempt of granovsky to deliver public lectures on the reformation could not however be carried out for political reasons and modern history was not liberated until the second half of the century Gurier, formerly a student of medieval history, introduced sound historical method into Moscow University and was particularly interested in the history of European culture in the times of Augustine and Francis of Assisi, in Leibniz and Mably, the French Revolution, etc. Some of his pupils turned from the study of ideas to social and economic history. From this point of view, Lev Menogradov conducted learned and acute investigations into the origin and development of feudalism in Italy and England, where this process was correlated with the decay of the free village community and its subsequent enslavement and with the growth of the manor. Another pupil of Gurrier and prolific writer, Karyev, devoted himself particularly to the modern history of Europe, and besides his voluminous work, concerning the history of its civilization, wrote some original monographs on the history of rural classes in France and on the French Revolution. These historians formed in their turn new historical schools. Following Vinogradov, Petrushevsky and Savin studied social and economic history in England. Following Karyev, Onu and Butenko elucidated the history of some institutions of modern France. The history of culture was not, however, quite abandoned. 
Corelin, who was under the influence of Gurrier, devoted himself to the study of humanism in Italy. But social and economic history proved more attractive, as is shown by the scientific career of Luchitsky. After some dissertations on the religious and political relations between Catholics and Calvinists in France, he devoted his powers to investigating the history of the rural classes, particularly in France, before and during the Revolution, and the growth of their landed property. These different tendencies revealed themselves, moreover, in other special domains of historical knowledge. The development of ideas was, for instance, elucidated by Bolotov and Glubokovsky in critical works on early Christianity, by Novitsky and Prince Trubetskoy in dissertations on the history of ancient philosophy, by Bobinin and Buvnov, Stolyatov and Vernadsky in researches on medieval and modern science, by Gurier and Karyev, Petrov and Busaskol in treatises on former historical conceptions, by Korsh and particularly by Veselovsky in his noteworthy monographs on the genesis and expansion of literary subjects and on the evolution of poetical forms, by Stefani and Kondakov in monumental inquiries into the plastic arts, by Ryadkin and particularly by Shisharin in his voluminous history of political theories. The development of economics attracted the attention of those who, like Viper and Petruchevsky, were under the influence of Marxism, and was studied by other historians. Kovalevsky discussed, for instance, the growth of population, and represented the economic evolution of Europe down to the rise of capitalism. Tarle attended to the history of the working classes in its connection with industry in France during the Revolution, and to the Continental Blockade. Kaufman was interested in credit, currency, and banking, particularly in England. Kulisher attempted a general historical survey of economics in Western Europe, and so on. The history of institutions was somewhat less studied. Besides Skrodowski and others noted above, Kovalevsky explained the rise and development of political institutions in many European states, and the origins of modern democracy. Ostrogorsky cleared up the political forces or parties, which put it in motion, and Artyshev investigated the history of provincial administration in France before the Revolution. Meantime, one of the best representatives of the criticism inaugurated by Kutorga, the learned Vasilevsky, founded a critical school in Petrograd and applied its principles particularly to the study of Byzantine history and historiography he elucidated the development of the byzantine village community and its decay the tax system of the empire and its legislation particularly in the times of the iconoclasts its relations to russian affairs and barbarous tribes buvnov one of his pupils applied the critical method to the examination of medieval annals others began to study byzantine history and uspinsky produced valuable works on its sources on the religious movement and the village community in the byzantine empire and endeavored to give a general survey of its history and this last task was undertaken also by kulikovsky these investigations were of course closely connected with slavonic studies which made visible progress after the revival of letters and arts in slavonic lands Vostokov and Price contributed to this development, and with Grigorovich, an original student of Slavonic languages and literature, exerted some influence on Sreznevsky. The latter collected a quantity of materials concerning the Slavonic languages, and Russian in particular, traditional beliefs, songs, and writings, studying paleographical peculiarities, and explaining the meaning of many of them. The history of the Slavonic peoples, already studied by Bodjansky, was promoted by some former pupils of Sretnevsky. The most prominent of these, Lemansky, discussed the part that the Slavonic world had played in universal history, and had in his turn many pupils. One of them, Siegel, elaborated a comparative history of Slavonic laws, and Makushab investigated the history of South Slavonian communities. Meanwhile, Kotlyarevsky, a pupil of Bodjansky, produced a learned work on the funeral rites of the ancient Slavonians, and explained the antiquities and ancient laws of the Pomeranian and Baltic tribes, while Leontovich compared Slavonic institutions and made valuable investigations concerning the history of Lithuanian law. 
these examples prove the growing independence of russian thought in the domain of universal history and they can be of course supplemented by illustrations of what was done during the same period for the knowledge of russia's past russian scholars became aware that quote, general human knowledge cannot be realized by a nation without self-knowledge which is the chief factor of progress and many of them turned their minds to the study of russian history this idea was not easy of access to historians like Kramsin, who was much more interested in the fortunes of the Russian monarchy than in the history of the Russian nation. But it was one of the leading principles of Solovyev's great work. Solovyev at one time attended the lectures of Ritter and was a disciple of Guizot and an adherent of Ewers. But he was able to preserve his independence. He examined the geographical conditions of Russian life and gave a detailed survey of its organic development, that is, of the gradual transformation of ancient patriarchal institutions into the Russian state of the 18th century. This treatment provoked criticism from the Slavophiles. Kiryevsky, Homyakov, and Aksakov, accepting to some extent the principles of Schelling and Hegel, expressed their conviction that human and even European culture can be conceived only in connection with nationality, and that every nation represents one of its aspects. But they differed from Solovyev in their estimate of Western civilization, and insisted on its one-sidedness and want of stability. They discovered, on the contrary, original and renovating principles of completeness and progress in Russian culture based on true equity, which must be freely spoken out by the people, and they opposed to it the external justice of the state. These views were applied especially by Aksakov to Russian history. According to him, the principle of true equity is incorporated in the community and manifests itself in the mutual love and solidarity of its members these communities invited of their own free will the princes who founded the russian state with its external justice and thus land and state became the principal elements of russian history their relation was subjected however to some changes by which russian history can be characterized during the four periods of its existence consecutively centred in kiev vladimir moscow and st petersburg but this union between land and state was not broken up till the last of these periods even moscow represented it after having contributed to the unification of the state and it was only peter the great who violently introduced the declining civilization of the west into russia and thus created a growing divergence between the russian people and the cultured classes a divergence which must be removed this idealistic conception of russian history could not find favor with those westerners who supposed a general uniformity in the evolution of nations and set a high value on the influence of western civilization upon russian life under hegel's influence and savigny's direction they insisted on the part played by the state in national development and preferred to study the history of institutions fixing the main epochs of russian history in accordance with these Solovyev, although not quite indifferent to the Slavophile tendencies, belonged to the opposite school. Kavelin enlarged his predecessor scheme and introduced between his two principal periods an intermediate stage characterized by the ascendancy of civil patriarchal institutions. Shishirin showed the scarcity of information concerning patriarchal society and divided the subsequent times, like Kavelin, into two periods the period of civil union during which individual will predominated and the period of political union during which public will prevailed and organized social life this theory was accepted by sergeyevich he distinguished in russian history the two periods of chicherin almost in identical terms and expected a third period during which the opposed principles of the two former will be reconciled these conceptions were formed in the main before the scientific movement and great reforms of the sixties but they had a great influence on subsequent historical writers one of them Klyuchevsky, a pupil of solovyev and chicherin highly appreciated some of their conclusions but could not accept them entirely he elaborated his own sociological conception of russian history Klyuchevsky was not inclined to accept the theory of solovyev and particularly the modifications of it which he introduced in the later volumes of his history 
Kliachevsky attached much more importance to material than to moral forces, which he appreciated in so far as they manifested themselves in social phenomena. Besides, he could not content himself, as Shisharin had done, with the study of institutions considered merely as mechanisms which were bound to develop in a certain way. He was interested in the real social stuff of which they were made, and with the vital forces which put them in motion he investigated the social and economic evolution of different classes their enslavement and emancipation and their influence on political institutions yet agreeing to some extent with the slavophile doctrine kliachevsky insisted on the originality of russian history and explained the part that the russian nation had played particularly the great russians whom he characterized in a very vivid manner and he tried to represent in a genetic way the real historical evolution of this nation and not the dialectical scheme of a series of mental concepts only logically connected with one another according to these views kliachevsky held that the russian nation had passed through different stages of evolution he characterized ancient russia situated on the dnieper by town life and trade medieval russia settled on the middle volga by feudal principalities differing however in some respects from the western type and by free agriculture great russia formed at a later date by the national state of moscow with the tsar and the boyars at its head by military and agricultural institutions and the russian empire attaining its natural limits by the autocratic regime the ascendancy of the nobles and enslaved agriculture and industry Kliachevsky presented this scheme in a brilliant picture of our evolution down to the eighteenth century and formed a school of russian historians in a similar realistic and sociological spirit milyukov explained the evolution of russian culture arranged in a homogeneous series and with kiseveter boguslavsky and others entered upon definite investigations concerning the history of certain russian institutions this realistic conception of russia's past could not however satisfy those who like pokrovsky believed in marxism and he worked up again from a materialistic point of view the materials collected by the idealists the wide field of russian history surveyed in great deal by ikonikov was of course cultivated in many other special directions various historical problems concerning russia's past were stated and partly solved by different historical schools the history of the russian language for instance constituted one of these problems vostokov laid its foundation buslev studied it in connection with the general evolution of russian culture and shakhmatov and sobolevsky explained its evolution the critical school continued to develop itself in the works of kachanovsky and other scholars kruk had expressed his approval of the critical investigation of kachanovsky's opponent pogodin upon the annals of nestor and pogodin in his turn lent a helping hand to kunik and to Dayanov at the beginning of their scientific career when they tried to elucidate from different points of view the origin of the russian state and the norman or slavonic nationality of the first russian princes the critical school developed further in the works of bestuchev who was to some extent under the influence of pogodin and had some pupils platonov and others criticism manifested itself also in the acute investigations of golubinsky shakhmatov and others the comparative method of historical study was also used in different domains in the history of russian literature and art by busleev and tibonrovov pipin veslovsky by kondakov chinloy and others in the history of russian economics by nikitsky milyukov Struve, tugan baranovsky and others in the general history of russian law and institutions by nevolin kavelin shisharin gradovsky serkayevich and others one of these vladimirsky bunonov author of a comprehensive history of russian law applied the comparative method to the study of similar institutions of eastern and western russia showing by the way their originality in comparison with those of other european states subsequent historians Lyupevsky, lapo and others continued this comparative study of russian and lithuanian institutions in opposition to vladimirsky budinov and some other investigators 
Pavlov Silvansky insisted, from a sociological point of view, on the similarity of the medieval institutions of Russia with the corresponding feudal institutions of Western Europe, particularly in the period when the manor began to subjugate the ancient village community. Many scholars were or still are working in the same field. Some of them, particularly about 1861, were strongly impressed by the idea of nationality or even of the different nationalities constituting the Russian Empire. It had an influence on Bayelin, Kostomarov, and Antonovich. Others studied the history of local government, very much improved by the great reforms, for instance, Andreevsky, Gradovsky, Luchitsky. Many took a strong interest in the emancipation of the rural classes and entered into investigations on their past, among others Bayalyov and Sokolovsky. The history of their gradual enslavement, begun by Kilyuchevsky, was continued by Diakonov and others. And those who were devoted to the people's cause and followed socialistic theories have contributed to the elucidation of these problems, particularly Semevsky in his well-known works on slavery in modern times and the social movements which determined its abolition. Meanwhile, the scientific principles and methods implied in these investigations were applied to Oriental studies. Though much less differentiated, they facilitated the understanding of the complex civilizations of the Eastern world. These inquiries were effected in Russia, at least in great part, by its intermediate position between Europe and Asia, and by practical aims. Oriental studies were inaugurated in Russia by Bayer and the Orientalist Kerr, but made little advance until the publication of the Dictionary of All Known Languages in 1786 or 1787. This work proved to be of some use for Klaproth's Asia Polyglota. Soon after, a center of Oriental study arose in Kazan, where a representative of European scholarship was invited, especially in order to promote the practical knowledge of Oriental languages. Thran was very well versed in these, but he studied specially Mohammedan coins and Arabic writers, the accounts of ancient Russia, its inhabitants and their customs, given by Ibn Fodslan and others. He made, moreover, arrangements for the further development of these branches of knowledge in Russia. The Turkish and Tartar languages and texts, to which Fran had already paid some attention, were investigated, for instance, by Kazem Beck, the self-taught enthusiast of Petrograd, Sinkovsky, next stimulated the growing interest of Russian scholars in Oriental languages and literature. Somewhat later, Hvolsan and Rosen, and their pupil Kokovtsev, continued, with growing success, the study of Hebrew and Arabic texts. The Mongolist Schmidt and the Turkish scholar Radloff made valuable contributions to the knowledge of the Mongol, Turkish, and Tartar languages and folklore, and this was increased by the works of Vilyamenov Sernov, Kovalevsky, and others. Russian study of China owed much less to foreign influence. The foundation of the Orthodox Russian mission to Pekin proved to be of some consequence in this respect. Russian Sinology was inaugurated by Bihurin and Katharov, the investigators of China's culture, and promoted by Vasiliev, who spent ten years at the mission and became one of the highest authorities on Buddhism in China. Under the influence of the lectures delivered by Vasiliev in Petrograd, Minayev, the well-known critic of the Pali theory of Buddhism, began to study the evolution of Buddhism in the original texts and observed its manifestations in Ceylon, Nepal, and Burma. The great work done by Bothelink in the domain of Indian philology was, of course, highly appreciated by Minayev, himself the author of a grammar of the Pali language but he and his pupils were more inclined to continue the investigations of Minayev on Buddhistic culture. Oldenburg studied Buddhistic legends and particularly iconography. Sherbatsky explained ancient Indian philosophical treatises in the light of modern critical thought, etc. The well-known Iranian scholar Salomon had also an influence on this movement, and Persian studies were carried on by Tukovsky in his treatise on Persian dialects and other publications. These studies were organized by Rosen and supplemented in modern times by new branches of knowledge, cultivated more or less independently by Russian scholars. 
Lem and his pupil Turiev, Gulenishev and Nikolsky promoted Egyptology and Assyriology, Brasset and Marr investigated the languages and antiquities, the literature and history of Georgia and Armenia. Tukovsky and Bartold elucidated the medieval civilization and history of Central Asia, and so on. Part three the evolution of russian thought considered in its general aspects and in its different domains can be stated then in the following terms during the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries science and learning in russia became in a certain sense russian science and learning russian thought began to play its own part in the historical development of science and learning gradually embracing all the nations of the civilized world thanks to the growth of russian thought the principle of its unity which was formerly established only from a religious and specially orthodox point of view could now be formulated afresh this tendency manifests itself more and more in russian philosophy science and learning some examples relating to modern times will clear up this growing tendency to unify our general conception of the world and our knowledge of nature and history philosophy is of course particularly called upon to fulfil such a mission and russian philosophers have endeavoured to achieve it they were indeed deeply conscious of the capital importance of such a problem but they solved it in different ways the idealists of the thirties and forties and particularly the slavophiles criticised from this point of view the western rationalism kirievsky homakov and others insisted on the wholeness of consciousness implying faith and reason reason and feeling with volition some of the westerners made similar attempts but in another spirit in a work dedicated to granovsky kovalin endeavoured for instance to reconcile idealism with realism from a somewhat psychological point of view a different conception was formed by the materialists of the sixties Pisarev, Antonovich, and others. They also deliberated, in a materialistic sense, on the quote, unity of the physical and moral cosmos. End quote. In modern times, this has been done not only in a monistic, but later on in a critical spirit. Modern Russian monistic systems had also spiritualistic or materialistic character. They can be noted here only in their general aspect spiritualistic monism was very clearly formulated in the main from a religious point of view by one of its most convinced partisans v Solovyev criticized in this spirit the one-sidedness of comte's conception of the three stages of evolution the russian writer could not agree with a theory which excluded theology and metaphysics from a general conception of the world and restricted itself to positive science he formulated the postulates of his own system as follows the quote, creative principles which are needed for the transformation of general facts or laws into a harmonious scientific edifice cannot be deduced from these materials just as the plan of a building cannot be deduced from the bricks employed to construct it End quote. these creative principles must be found by means of a higher kind of knowledge the knowledge of absolute principles and causes expounded in theology and metaphysics and only in this connection of theology and metaphysics with positive science can this whole obtain a decisive influence on life this epistemological theory implied corresponding views of the universe solovyev worshipped the spirit of god in the universe he perceived a general and positive unity in the entity of the world and in the creative power and the evolutionary process comprising its phenomena nature and man from this transcendent point of view solovyev affirmed that the world must be united with god through the medium of man and transposed the centre of man's existence into a supernatural and superpersonal sphere which reveals its creative power in the collective mind of humanity and contains the leading principles of human life quote, in union with god end quote. man has to realize truth good and beauty in the world and in fulfilling this mission he contributes to progress similar conceptions were enunciated by trubetskoy and other writers materialistic monism was an offshoot of marxism 
one of its most rigid partisans platonov has expressed it in the following well-known formula quote, matter thinks end quote, and has deduced from it a materialistic conception of the world and of social life quote, as soon as you have admitted he wrote some years ago that the relations of production on which men enter independently of their will are reflected in their heads in the form of different economic categories in the form of prices money capital and so on you must acknowledge that on a certain economic basis there must grow a corresponding ideological superstructure one of the adherents of this doctrine Elian, lenin stood forth recently in its defense against those marxists who try to combine empirical criticism with marxism these dogmatical constructions could not satisfy the critical spirit of those who were conscious of the epistemological problems implied in them the doctrine of kant could not establish itself before the sixties or even later and only towards the end of the century after Videnski began to lecture at the University of Petrograd, the critical philosophy was accepted by some Russian thinkers. From that time, however, Kantian doctrine was supplemented by neo-Kantian interpretations, and some modern Russian philosophers began to deliberate on the problem of the unity of knowledge which underlies the Unitarian conception of the world. Karinsky, well known as a critic of Kant, adhered, however, to Kant's views on self-consciousness and its unity and identity, without which knowledge is not possible, and criticized only his theory concerning the role which self-consciousness is playing, according to its own principles, in the construction of the external world. Meanwhile, science and learning tried, in their turn, to solve this problem, at least in some of their domains, and Russian scientific and learned men contributed to this movement. Great Russian mathematicians, for instance, tried to give more logical unity to their science. Lobachevsky elaborated a more comprehensive conception of space, and considered the geometry of Euclid as one of the possible cases of it. Chebyshev in one of his treatises on averages, proved that a general theorem underlies the different problems of the theory of probabilities, and implies the famous theorem of Bernoulli as a special case of it. This unifying tendency acquired a different character in the knowledge of the external world. In natural science, besides the doctrine of conservation of force or transformation of energy, this movement manifested itself particularly in the conception of matter as a system of elements and in the doctrine of consensus and evolution as a unifying process of life at the end of the sixties mendeleev published his famous treatise on the periodic system of elements founded on the fact that with increasing atomic or combining weights their physical and chemical properties change according to this regular arrangement of the elements by their weights expressed in numbers the same properties such as density fusibility optical and electric qualities formation of oxides etc recur in periods which are at least approximately fixed this theoretical scheme could not at that time be absolutely proved by experiment but it was supplemented by the zero series of indifferent gases and the vacant places made it possible to predict the subsequent discovery of the missing numbers some of them were really made and confirmed the unifying value of this brilliant generalization thus the periodic law of the elements established systematic order in our conceptions of them similar attempts were made in other domains of natural science in mineralogy, for instance, Gadolin tried to deduce all the crystallographic systems and their subdivisions from one general principle, and Federoff constructed a vast scheme of all the parallelohedrons which were theoretically possible, and undertook the task of decomposing them into stereohedrons. In biology, this principle of unity was conceived in different ways. The doctrine of a kind of consensus existing between the phenomena of organic life preceded the theory of evolution bayer had been desirous to establish a connection between all natural objects and supposed that quote, mutual relations of organized bodies end quote, can be elucidated by the ontogenesis or the development of the individual 
and more recently pavlov formulated the leading idea of his physiological investigations when he said that only by considering the organic body as a whole in its quote, living course end quote, and as a correlation of its parts can we study with some success the total importance of the functions of each one of them for this whole the doctrine of evolution performed a similar role in respect to our conception of organic processes darwinism found many able adherents in russia darwin himself had a very high opinion of the paleontological studies of vlad kovalevsky and appreciated the zoological investigations of his brother alex kovalevsky on the lowest vertebrates and invertebrates and on their genetical relationship his works as well as the works of metchnikoff were in the main directed to establish unity of organization in animals the theory of evolution was however eventually modified by the subsequent doctrine of heterogenesis formulated by the late kurzinski he stated that among numerous homogeneous posterity born from normal parents there appear suddenly separate individuals with very marked peculiarities these variations are probably due to some internal changes occurring in the cell of the ovum and come after a certain period of accumulation of vital energy through a series of generations the rare individuals subjected to them are able to transmit them in favorable circumstances to their descendants forming thus a new race natural selection and other factors can only strengthen these acquired characters and suppress further variations in this race the scientific conception of evolution provoked moreover some criticism in the domain of moral and historical sciences it was formulated in a transcendent way by solovyev he acknowledged an absolute cause or a creative force without which evolution is not possible but he supposed that god's thought which is absolute destiny in regard to things is only a duty for a moral being in this way he tried to solve the problem of quote, free will end quote, and of man's mission which is to realize quote, in union with god end quote, truth good and beauty in the world this can be done only in the great whole or collective being named mankind this union is impossible quote, outside god end quote, and can be attained in god only that is in the universal church incorporating the principle of this unity already manifested once in the person of christ in this sense solovyev spoke of the god man actually quote, existing on earth end quote, and gradually advancing to perfection of quote, the kingdom of god end quote, and its manifestation in organized states of nations each of which has its own importance and participates in the common life of the whole contributing thus to its progress most russian sociologists however conceived the idea of progress in a more positive way many of them discussed evolution in regard to human personality in his well-known paper on progress mihailovsky formulated for instance such a conception he arrived at the conclusion that progress is quote, a gradual approximation to the wholeness of individuals to a possibly most complete and various division of labor between man's organs and most limited division of labor between men end quote. from this unifying point of view mihailovsky considered the progressive evolution of mankind this general idea of progress included an appreciation of evolution and its results but in concrete history it was to be considered in its individual aspect karyaev applied this conception to the history of european states and this was done by other russian historians in respect to the history of their own nation besides the slavophiles such as Aksakov and others who considered it rather as an evolution of pre-established loyalties innate in the Russian people, the Westerners, Jolyovyev and others, treated it in a more positive way, as an organic development influenced by various external causes. At a later date, Klyachevsky, in spite of his sociological tendency, elaborated a much more individualized conception of Russian history he insisted on its originality and considered it as a local history 
he studied the formation of the russian nation and of its historical individuality he investigated the vital forces which moved it and produced russian history he examined the personalities and events which had an influence on its evolution on the development of russian social and economic relations and political institutions and in this spirit he exhibited in a masterly manner and vivid picturesque style the different periods of russian history the principle of unity of thought was introduced thus into russian science and learning and contributed to the elaboration of a harmonious conception of the world two this problem of unity may be raised however in respect to a more complicated whole including besides thought in a strict sense other components of human consciousness i e will and feeling the part played by russian thought in the construction of such a whole was not an exclusive one russian thought in its general aspect did not profess to despise will and feeling and russian thinkers tried to conceive this whole especially from a religious and moral point of view these attempts developed probably under political and social conditions the representatives of russian culture manifested at times a yearning for religion they were disposed moreover to invoke justice when it was violated by government and occasions for this were not wanting and serfdom which lasted till eighteen sixty one and produced at last a growing feeling of moral responsibility for such a state of things incited them to take social facts into consideration this religious and moral tendency is fairly conspicuous for instance in the systems of the older slavophiles kiryevsky homyakov and others and even in the treatises of some westerners for instance Kavalin he was particularly anxious to take account of moral feeling but considered it in a psychological way which aroused some criticism modern russian philosophers wanted to go further Solovyev, for instance firmly believed in god as an absolute principle of truth good and beauty truth being the contents of his reason good the contents of his will beauty the contents of his feeling according to this doctrine this unified whole determines the unity of the human mind which is conscious of its connection with it integral knowledge includes moreover faith and various other elements of consciousness it ascends from feeling to thought and from thought to mystical love which leads us to the cognition of the transcendent world besides this knowledge and the will to acquire it the idea of good is the principle to which our will tends and on which depend our aims and actions our life can have a meaning and become worthy of our moral nature only when it is a quote, justification of good end quote. it proceeds from a kind of moral unity able to govern individual and social life our consciousness approves these two wills directed to quote, true good end quote and thus establishes the union of truth and good truth and good however cannot realize these ideal contents in sensual forms this incarnation is reserved to art and intimately connected with artistic feeling from this pre-eminently religious point of view Solovyev considered then the problem of unity of consciousness the correlation of reason will and feeling prince trubetskoy held nearly the same religious opinions but formulated his theory from a somewhat different metaphysical and epistemological point of view in the absolute he perceived the condition of our knowledge he maintained that the absolute cannot be limited by its essence and manifests it in everlasting free activity the absolute thus produces its quote, other self end quote, and communicates with it and we freely go to meet this revelation in every act of our knowledge hence in its intimate nature existence known by our spiritual being must also be spiritual it conditions all our knowledge and can be an object of quote, faith end quote, that is of immediate impression intuition of reality and of volition and not only an object of rational and empirical knowledge 
thus trubetskoy acknowledged a unifying spiritual principle of the universe in relation to which the phenomenal world must be considered a concrete quote, subject of this universal object end quote, which reveals itself in its creative reason and will in its altruistic existence for others in its love to our quote, searching love end quote, and which cannot be conceived by mere rational and empirical knowledge this love must be realized by men in their actions these metaphysical conceptions could not satisfy the russian philosophers and sociologists who though they allotted an important role to will and feeling yet were inclined to consider this problem in a positive way the representatives of the subjective school of russian sociology lavrov mihailovsky karyev and others supposed as was stated above that the knowledge of social facts is permanently accompanied by an appreciation of them and tried to combine the objective spirit of investigation into social facts with the subjective valuation of them in his conception of a growing wholeness of the individual mihailovsky implied the notion of a being who possesses besides reason other elements of consciousness i e will and feeling and from this point of view he estimated social progress karyev shared this view and conceived historical progress as a gradual ascent of human beings from coarse reality to ideals produced by their yearning after truth and good quote, inherent in our soul end quote, by their desire to be happy without encroaching on the happiness of others it may be stated by the way that a similar conception became very prominent in modern russian aesthetics art was and still is to some extent considered in russia not only as intimately connected with emotion but as aiming at ideals or at moral ends even in music this tendency can be traced the representatives of russian music national but tinged with orientalism glinka Belakirev, Muzorgsky, Borodin, Rimsky Korsakov, and others expressed their empathy with some ideals and characteristic moral natures of the Russian people. Besides the subjective mood of Tchaikovsky and the deep lyric revelations of Skriabin, other states of mind can be traced in their productions. Belakirev, for instance, was to a certain degree imbued with original mystic sentiment rimsky korsakov manifested particularly in his latest work an inclination to quote, ethical pantheism end quote. this movement is even more conspicuous in russian painting ivanov was imbued with mysticism at least till eighteen forty eight and chose under its influence the subject of his great work representing the appearance of christ to the people kramskoy painted his christ in the wilderness quote, with his blood and tears end quote. vasnetsov executed mystical pictures on the walls of the cathedral at st vladimir Gue manifested his sympathy with the moral doctrine taught by tolstoy in his works laryapin often dealt with social and political subjects tereshagin was an apostle of peace and so on there is no need to speak in detail of modern russian literature which flourished after pushkin and lermontov gogol and goncharov and manifested independently of the literary movement represented by turgenev the moral tendencies of the age a mere mention of dostoevsky and tolstoy will be enough tolstoy's religious and ethical views on the dependent role of art were and still are debated in russia but they are very characteristic of the moralizing mood of modern russian literature just now yielding its supremacy to more formal aesthetical ideas in these russian conceptions of consciousness as a compound of thought will and feeling the religious or at least moral point of view plays a prominent role and perhaps in the main appears although not very clearly to mark out its unifying principle thus far russian thought has been considered in its general aspect apart from its connection with practical life but unity of thought studied in its process of unification must be made or worked out hence its close relation to practical life such a real unity supposes a permanent harmony between thought and action and consciousness in the sense stated above works it out and thus gives unity to our activity 
such an agreement however could not always be realized at least in the past history of russia in ancient russia thought was secluded from practice during the seventeenth century the utilitarian notion of the technical importance of learning began to develop itself and peter the great appreciated it very highly and was really conscious of its great value to the state but catherine too was more interested in education than in the practical advancement of science and learning and under nicholas too education became to some extent an instrument of conservative policy which was not always in harmony with the public good and when russian thought in spite of the constraint to which it was subject tried to manifest itself in free action and in conscious applications to practical life it often met with obstacles which were not favorable to its development this occurred not only in the roles of reaction mentioned above but even later in the years before the tragical death of alexander ii before the promulgation of the new code for the universities in eighteen eighty four and at other times but the obstacles which restrained the development of russian thought and its conscious applications to life could not stop its course and had even some positive results russian thought was obliged to struggle for its independence and to endure the severe trials to which it had been submitted it came out of them tried by misfortune and firmly conscious of the ideal ends to which it is called these reactions could not however be favorable to a permanent fecundation of thought by life this convergence between thought and life was pernicious to both of them but it must be overcome and this will be done as the russian people grows into a nation conscious of herself and acting by herself this unifying principle of self-conscious action can be realized in russia of course only under liberal political conditions in its strict sense it implies moreover a reciprocal acknowledgment of its value for every nation the russian nation must acknowledge therefore other nations just as she herself is acknowledged by them as a self-conscious cultured nation existing for the good of humanity and thus she becomes in concert with other nations a part of humanity and retains in agreement with them her right to relative independence and this right cannot be violated without trampling on the claim which humanity has on every one of its parts end of lecture six part two and end of russian realities and problems lectures delivered at cambridge in august nineteen sixteen